be the hero now. He'll need to be. G out of the line of sight and with a glance on the what? Yeah. To push them to not. Oh. for proteins. Signatures identified. Neutralize the nests. Guard the exits. They're here. The World Championship showed that North American Rainbow Six Siege needed to undergo a major overhaul to survive in the modern era. Now, after 76 games, 11 play days, and five weeks, we're seeing the new direction the region is taking to make it in this new age, and all of it comes down to one play day. One more team will qualify for the major in Manchester, and another will call themselves NAL Stage 1 champions. Welcome back to the NAL Playoffs Day 3. I'm Caliber Jacob Anderson, alongside former world champion Gabriel Laxing, Miralez, the North American savant Jesse J. Chick, and everything, gentlemen, comes down to today. I mean, yesterday was quite the doozy. We were up till 2 a.m. sending teams to Manchester and then yeah. seeing what teams were going to not make Manchester and then come here today to see if they make Manchester. Yeah, it's the dawn of the final day. We get to send one more team to the first major of the year. Already sending two yesterday. Beast Coast and M80 sitting pretty. They just get to play for first place. Some prize money, some SI points. Bragging rights. Some bragging rights crown, for sure. The glory. They could steal all of it today. All important as well, but the first game of the day, a little bit more on the line for sure. We're going to have two teams back. Battling out to try to make it to the Manchester Major. Already had seven teams qualify just a couple hours ago. It was Furia qualifying. It was Scars early this morning if you're North American. Seven teams have already locked in, but it's that third spot on this grid that will be decided today. Dark Zero and Oxygen will be playing for the final playoff qualification spot before having to result to the LCQ spot, which will be decided next week. I mean, and we also saw Jesse's favorite team of E1. 
That, that was the, that You're was really important bullish one. on E1. Uh, he he yeah. loves E1. Yeah, I mean, E1 E1's supporter. They're, they're a hype team in Brazil. They're one of those new young squads that we're seeing uh, seeing on the come up. We had a new Brazilian team just qualified today as well, Furia. Yeah. The World Championships will be at the major, so that's good for us all to see. Chance to continue that dynasty that they built up over the last year. And uh, yeah, it should be great competition in Manchester. It's now. already turning out to be the, the pillars of every region are being torn down, so to speak. It's not the same teams going already as we've seen but there's still plenty more teams left to qualify and on the road to getting to qualification we wanted to give out some awards we wanted to highlight a couple of players that so far throughout this stage in the north american league have produced some pretty exceptional results for themselves or have improved a lot from where they started this stage and no player has been better this stage than the boy wonder himself Spoit. I told you, I told you, I told you. Spoit has played better in this one stage than he did all of last year inside of North America. This looks like the Spoit that won a major all those years back on Rogue. This looks like the Wonder Kid who was supposed to be imported into North America from M80 from the very beginning. He's playing out of his mind as an individual this whole stage, start to finish. Nobody put in the impact that Spoit did uh, this stage, and that's why he's the MVP. I think the biggest reason, I'll say it. I mean, obviously, right there it shows. He he is the best player in the region, but I think what really excelled him into that position is he saw me hyping up Ashen, and he could not <laughs> let Ashen run away with that in North America and being from EU that he had to prove that coming away from EU, he can still do it here in NA, and he is doing it. The MVP, as we on the desk have voted, is Spoit for Stage 1. Our rookie of the stage had a couple different options available on the table, but the one that we went with, there was really no other competition when you broke down the stats. Diffuser from Beast Coast had one of the best rookie stages we have seen in the North American League in quite some time. Yeah, and we talked about him yesterday, and he still put up a performance yesterday, and I have no doubt he's going to put up a performance today, but Diffuser, you have to talk about this guy because he was the wild card of the four uh, veteran roster. It was curious how that was going to be. Again, they weren't finding success, and they found success, and that also went into Diffuser's play style of helping that team also find success, and that's what you want from a rookie is to see them constantly excel and to only see what that now goes looking like into the major. A lot of rookies come in and they've got insane mechanical skill, but Diffuser, what sets him apart from other rookies is his brain. It's his ability to know when to get aggressive and when he needs to hold back. Playing with the team throughout these last couple of weeks, making sure he's really finding impact on specific parts of the map to fill the gaps where he needs to. Diffuser has been a really, really intelligent player, and I think that's why he deserves that rookie of the stage spot. In a very similar vein, the most improved team of the stage. There were a couple that started in really dire straits, but one of of them managed to pull themselves out of the gutter and go from zero to hero in just a couple of weeks. Beast Coast are our most improved team of stage one. Hey, it's Diffuser again. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Listen, all of Beast Coast, I mean, from the very first week, week one, we didn't get to see them play. They had the off day. Week two, we saw them play, and it was horrendous. It was a really rough showing. Yeah. And then week three, after just taking one week to work on themselves, to look at their mistakes, to fix them, they all came together. I think you've got to give so many props to the leader of hot and cold of that team, IGLing and being the captain of that squad to be able to guide those players. We've heard them talk about it nonstop in interviews. He is the guy alongside the coaching staff that kind of build these strategies, that make the decisions. Everybody else listens to them, and it flows so perfectly. It is incredibly impressive the turnaround they made from being so far down the standings at the start of the stage. And we have to give you props. You saw this. He prophesied it. He did. Even if they weren't playing as hot as we wanted them to or what we didn't think was going to happen, you knew from day one that this was going to be the best roster that Beast Coast has ever formed. I mean, it's great players. You just cannot argue with the reputation that these guys have. You cannot argue with the history that they have as well. Beast Coast 100% phenomenal roster. I'm also told that there's a, a couple of other awards that uh, we didn't select, but we still want to throw up anyway. So let's see what we got. Uh, no idea. Best British player. <laughs> sure. Well, I guess yeah. We're, All right. We're yeah. really feeding into the non-NA traditional players on I mean, a NA I mean, team. I guess. Love that. Really given the best British player. We had three different British players in this stage, Citizen, Noodle, and Naif, and it was far and away Citizen. I mean, there was no competition. It's, it's still important to talk about Citizen. I mean, he's the best British player. He's going to go back to the UK to play yep. in Manchester. I mean, that two best case scenarios here, but I mean, Citizen has been such a phenomenal piece for this M80 roster, even into the Sonics roster back then. I mean, he's such a pivotal piece. Best Brazilian player. Good. Okay. All right. Great. Sure. Diaz Lucas BR. I mean, this is the guy that's been around North America for a long time now. Kind of crazy. We had a full five team Brazilian roster imported to North America. 
and I, they'd probably be bottom five if we ranked the Brazilians that are playing in the league thus far. And then <laughs> this one, this one is deserved. There is no French Canadian player who played better throughout this stage. Undoubtedly, spirits. There were there were Spirit only two beard. Canadians total. It was him and Canadian were the only with the only Canucks playing. And you know we don't have hard data on this, but I've never seen Troy speak French, so I think that's a great uh, a great <laughs> qualifier. I've actually, I've actually never seen that either. No, I would. Yeah, you've been around him a long time. You've never seen him speak French. I've barely even seen him talk. <laughs> no, I've definitely seen Troy talk. I've seen him yell. I've seen him scream. So he can get loud when he needs to. Oh, absolutely. But not loud in the French Canadian competition. Well, I'll tell you good, that. good job, production, really throwing us for a loop there. But there actually is one more award that we need to give out. If you've noticed, sitting directly to my left, we have had something sitting here for a long time that is the prize to whoever on the couch has produced the best overall prediction percentage throughout the stage. And today, we actually don't even need to go through the rest of the games that we have today in order to crown a definite champion. We've been at this thing for five weeks, and now I can officially announce that the winner of the North American League Predictions Champion is Davide Foxe Bucci. And we actually had a second to have him call in and give a little Oscar acceptance speech. What's going on, everybody? I was told to film this as my acceptance speech, and I want to give a huge shout out to absolutely nobody. I did it all on myself. I actually am very underwhelmed with my performance. I did a lot lower. I looked mortal amongst these humans you know i i find myself to be the smartest analyst of the three no but uh, hey, seriously i mean shout out to the guys lax and jesse that i worked against i mean it was a very fun time lax almost you know leaped ahead of us thank god he had that day where he trolled so i mean everyone was really close everything was really close together and for me personally i know in the future i'm going to be a lot smarter with my predictions usually at the next event or the next season whatever the case may be don't worry it's going to be a lot harder to catch up to me for the other analysts so hopefully you guys are ready for more competition thank you for the, jacob for the belt and love you guys nal goodbye say has now officially won the north american league predictions title none of the guys on the desk are capable of doing it fox ran away with it and had a better percentage to a point where we don't even have to play the last couple games why was he in out. the bathroom good question why was he accepting his reward from a hotel bathroom why did good place i troll my it? last week's prediction that was i was, was why did you pick i was close. literally in the lead why did you do I that i picked three teams that trolled me why did you do that wild card <laughs> trolled me los trolled me um it, ta it takes oxygen trolled me it yep. takes bold raw strength to pick teams that nobody else thought would win but i mean this is the thing like i did have that lead and i'm glad fox announced that because I didn't play it safe. I could have played it safe. I didn't play it safe. That's all you guys were doing has been playing it safe. So realistically, I may not have won the belt, but from the prediction standpoint and playing risky, I won that. Are you proud of what you've that. accomplished? I am. I am. Fair I play. Am. You guys are going to have to wait for the, the opportunity to actually like get this thing again. So you better step it up next time because Foxy had a real lead and he almost never dropped it the whole stage. So I'm just saying. Do better next time, boys. This championship is going to Fox A. He will get it as of the start of stage two. You'll be able to see it next. Here's the thing, though. We still have more games that have to be decided, and the guys can still do their predictions. Oxygen and Dark Zero is our third place matchup. And the finals, M80 and Beast Coast, it's still a damn good bracket we have to go through today. Yeah, I mean, you got to feel for Dark Zero. They had a double header yesterday. Quite the barn burners for both games. Fell short in that end game due to the simple fact that one team found success on attack. 100%. And I mean, for Dark Zero, despite starting back to back to back on defense, not being able to hold it down, there's been some discussions about the advantage of starting on defense. Wasn't enough for Dark Zero yesterday. They're going to have another chance, of course, against Oxygen. And then that's it. If you lose that game, LCQ awaits you. And that is a brutal gauntlet. Let's jump back into this one. Only one more spot for Manchester can be claimed without worrying about the cruel mistress that is the last chance qualifier. Winning today guarantees you a spot of the major, but losing means you have to go through this entire process again with other teams you haven't played in the league, which means that for both teams and the struggles that both of them have faced collectively, today is very much a do or die. Two different teams as well coming through with Dark Zero attending every single major last year. They are a staple at international events. It would be very odd to see one without them uh, present. And Oxygen, certainly a history of attending international events, not a stranger to the biggest stage, but last year, not a single major appearance from Oxygen. So they're looking to break their cold streak. They're looking to get back in it, but to do it, they'll have to beat one of North America's best. And that's what's going to be tough is, I mean, you, you give all this praise and hype to DZ because they deserve it, but then Oxygen, they fell so 
short. La well, I don't want to say they fell short. They just fell really hard the last stage, and they're yeah. at a point where we can possibly see them. But if they lose here, then it's the LCQ, and then you have to battle all the way through that. And then if you don't get there, then you were sitting for X amount of months doing the exact same thing you were doing the entire last year. Both of these guys played yesterday. One of them played two games, and we'll start with them. DZ had a very interesting road, having to play two best of threes back to back. One against LG, where they won 2-0. One against Beast Coast at the very end, where they lost 1-2. A best of three doubleheader is difficult enough as it is. And even if DZ started the day well, it didn't exactly end the way they were hoping. No, and it didn't. And again, it literally came down to one team finding success on that attack that completely changed the entire scenario of that game. And Border, I mean, I was a little skeptical of it because it really came down to Pamba having that pop pop performance LG that we just did not see going into that last game. Yeah, end of the game or end of the day yesterday, they were playing late. Now, first thing early tomorrow morning, they got to play again. So I hope they've been resting. I hope that they've got their spirits back up and their energy up. They had something good for breakfast because this is not a team that uh, can afford at this point to let their foot off the gas. And you clearly see all the wins to losses here. It's, 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 you know, it's nothing crazy. The biggest and most important ones is the Beast Coast ones. These are the ones that they needed to win, that they could have just been sitting pretty here, going to Manchester, playing for that first, second place spot there. And now they aren't. They are stuck here going against Oxygen. The nice thing is they did beat Oxygen most recently. They do have tons of film and tons of history against these guys. But again, they can't let up on the gas that they let loose yesterday. Two games against LG. Both of them are really close. They still eke out a W. But then you play that game against Beast Coast several hours later on the same day and that just presents its own set of challenges you have to overcome. Yeah, it certainly does. And I think for Dark Zero, obviously, the different players are going to handle those long days differently. Certainly through the first game, they looked quite dominant. It was a 2-0, but they were close games as well. I mean, there were a lot of rounds that certainly would have been stressful for Dark Zero against Luminosity. There were certainly moments where LG looked like they had a real chance of taking that series away, especially right at the start, nearly winning that map one. Took 15 rounds, but Dark Zero eventually got it done on the defense. So in the end, DZ, they get that 2-0. They they wait through the second series of the day, which takes them, uh, takes them some time. They close out the uh, the third one without finding too much success. So we're hoping again to see them bounce back because obviously they are not going to be happy with not qualifying for Manchester. I mean, we got to see it though. This is everything else on the table. You are, you are going to leave it on the battlefield here. If you don't show up today, if the team doesn't show up, the players don't show up, you're done. And what I've done is I've gone and I've made you a little bit of a line graph coming through. There are two games, five maps that they played yesterday. We see different players, again, adjusting and adapting to the long day of games differently. There's a few standout players I wanted to highlight. These are kills per round, by the way. So the first player is Nath, And I think Nath had what many players would experience throughout a long, brutal day of Siege. And that is a slow decline. Started off great. His best map of the day was map number one against Luminosity. But as the night got longer, as the games got tougher, Nave started to slow down. Pambazu is a player who also maybe got a little bit worse as the day got better, but he had his high, high highs and his low, low lows. Really good peaks, especially game two against Luminosity. That border match was huge, but he had the worst performance of anybody on Dark Zero when you're just looking at kills per rounds later on in that series. And then I wanted to highlight Canadian as well, because while he started off a little bit slow, he started off with some weaker matches, not as many kills against Luminosity, when his team needed him the most, when they were struggling against Beast Coast, when the pressure was the highest, that's when we saw Canadian step up. And I think that comes down to Troy Canadian getting better with age, having that experience as the night goes on, he was able to perform. So out of your leader, that's uh, super important. And if we see Dark Zero winning today, I think it's going to largely be due to Canadian stepping up and having that influence on the squad. It just goes to show none of those guys seem like they had one standard consistent performance throughout the whole thing. None of them were good the whole time. None of them were bad the whole time, but none of them stayed the same for all five maps. And was that because there was a huge like four to five hour gap in between the games they played? I don't want to say that because a lot of those players have been used to those situations even way back then when you were playing double headers throughout the day and then even throughout some of NAL stages. You were playing back-to-back -back games, so I don't really want to give, you know, any any leeway. Sure. These players are more than enough skilled, know what it takes. This is this is Siege. This is Siege in its prime. Like, you need to understand that you need to be performing in all fronts, and all these players have that experience. So I can't really write that off. I just think it was a rough day nonetheless, and Beast Coast capitalized off of them. Well, their opponents only played one series yesterday, but they were unable to make it count where it mattered. Lost against M80 by a 2-1 scoreline. Lots of questions going into that game after losing three maps straight to end the round, Robin, but they played really strong through the first 50% of the series and then fell off a cliff seemingly. 
Oxygen Esports finished top two in the group stage, meaning that they were given a promise of you've only got to win a single best of three to make it into Manchester. Now's the last chance. There will be the LCQ, but if they want to make it click quick and easy through playoffs, this is their opportunity on the side of Oxygen Esports. As you said, these last couple of games just feels like they've fallen off the gas. Feels like they're making a lot of little mistakes. Their spearheads aren't really getting that ground that they used to be. Oxygen Esports, with how many losses they've uh, suffered previously, are in big trouble. Yeah, and we put heavy emphasis on that game of the who was going to be running away with those first initial picks. And oddly enough, both sides were getting entry kills evenly, but it was just coming down to who was actually finishing out the round better, and then ended up being M80. And then especially going to that last map, I specifically said whoever was going to let off on the gas here was going to lose, and then we saw a landslide with M80 walking away with it. Now, this is an interesting statistic to look at when you yeah. when you look at Yaga we haven't talked about Yaga at all this stage Yaga during his last stage with Oxygen he was the number one rated player when you look at these stats there was no doubt question that Yaga was their best performer now you're looking at this stage he is the third lowest rated player and when you look at this this is the last day that you want to avoid LCQ that you want to make this major we need to be seeing Yaga step up here we need to be seeing the spearheads of Newers and Gomez really supporting the front line and then the back lines of Diaz and Dream but again it's really Really going to come down to Yaga having this stellar performance that we need him that we saw back in the stage. I don't want to count the most recent SI because M80 didn't really do well, Makes but sense. I want to see Yaga perform because we know the performer that he can be, and that alone will boost Oxygen's chance drastically going into this match. You need to be able to do that to do it for playoffs. You want to do it when you go to Manchester to Absolutely. have success there. So now is the time when everybody on both teams seriously needs to step up. And we talked to both of them last night after their losses to get their opinions on what it's like going into this qualification match against one another in our first game of the day. Our performance today against M80 was, it was good and bad. Uh, we started off very good. We won their map, Chalet. We proved uh, to Bubu that our Chalet is better than theirs. Something that we struggled struggled a little bit today was keeping the energy. We Our energy in the beginning was very, very good. We won first map. Then on Cafe, it was okay. And then when uh, stuff went down, we lost a uh, second map. During the third map, uh, we were a bit down. Their energy was a bit low. So I think all we got to do is just uh, to fix the, the energy and the the planning of the round. And I think we'll be fine. The the match versus Beast Coast didn't exactly go the way we anticipated, right? I think with Club being our only map, I feel like we should have won console that we just couldn't attack for anything today, like across the board. And if we had a little bit of those attacks on console, you know, it could have been a 2-0, but you know, we don't talk about the, the what ifs, right? Defensively, no matter the situation, 5v5s, 4v4s, 2vxs, 2v5s, 2v4s, whatever it may be, we were just, you know, we flow. We flow pretty well. We communicate properly, whereas it just doesn't translate into our attacks. Against DZ, our first game against him during the stage, it was consulate. We got worked 7 1, I think. Uh, it was consulate. We started attack. We couldn't attack for shit. And uh, they were structured, man. It was hard. Uh, they don't give you anything. You really got to work for it every single round. Uh, but we learned a lot from that. We kind of know how to get him now, I think. I mean, as much as I would hope that the playoffs match is very similar to the group stage match, but I don't think it will be. I think OXG would have learned from our match. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say because honestly, OXG, you know, if you lose in a series and then you rematch the team, you have the, you have the advantage because you, you lost, you learned. And the other team, oh, you know, if it's still working, you know, it should beat these guys, it'll probably beat them again. So we just gotta, you know, we have to sit and draw up ideas on the unknown, whereas OXG knows what went wrong and how to fix it. Our goal is to improve every day and obviously make the major, make every single major, make invite and just win something. Um, I'm tired of it. Me and Gomez and the team, we just, we need something. We need a chip, a major invite, whatever it is. And we're gonna work uh, hard every single day to, to achieve that. My whole philosophy is you you learn when you lose and we learn today and it's good to learn it now. And hopefully we're kind of a more buttoned up team and show that we can, you know, actually compete at a major and you know, hopefully take it. We gotta, we gotta get there first. 
Lots of learning that basically needs to be done overnight for both DZ and OXG based on those losses from yesterday. They have to enter another best of three immediately off the rip in order to qualify. And it felt like both Diaz and Bolo a little bit somber when reflecting on how that series went. But now is the time where things need to turn around because if the last chance qualifier is your only shot left, yeah. then things just get significantly harder. Bands are coming in, gentlemen. Map one is on the table, and I like this one for Dark Zero a lot, I think. Yeah, it feels bad for Oxygen. You kind of have to ban, like, Labs for sure. Cafe feels bad just because, obviously, Dark Zero historically so dominant on it, and that M80 game from Oxygen did not look great the other day. So they've got to go to Bank. Historically, one that they have perma bans. They ran it against Space Station last week at groups and didn't have a great performance. So the first map does worry me a lot for Oxygen. But then we go to Border, a map where Dark Zero has played quite a lot just yesterday, and it looked very, very chaotic. I'm sure Auction were watching that those matches. They're looking to capitalize off that, looking to shut down Pamba and make that a successful map for themselves. Yeah, I think the border, which you just touched last time, yeah, or Oxygen love border. And now you're going to a border where you've seen DZ twice play it, and really one time really came off of Pamba's backing, and then you see how their defenses were weak going against Beast Coast. And now you're looking at Consulate. This, again, you know, Bolo, Bolo reinforced what I said. When you were losing, you usually be the team that can come back into it, and you learn from it. You you end up being the team that comes out on top of that situation. So I'm glad he t hit that point. Even though I've said that, and it seems like every other team ends up still winning regardless <laughs> of that. Yeah. But again, we didn't get to see DZ's attacks. They had such a strong defensive half. Now this is going to be a situation where we might be able to see now they're going to have to be on attack and half. And what we've been seeing is their attacking sides have not been looking great. Yeah. And that could then easily look like a 6-0 for a defensive half for Oxygen. Both teams have picked defense on their opponent's map picks. Defense is just the meta for the most part, unless you are so confident in your attacks that you can really get a strong start on that first half. But in this case, OXG start defense on DZ's own pick. I, I mean, I look at this and immediately think DZ, but when we get to map two, should we also immediately think OXG? Should both teams realistically win their picks here? Yes, I, I, yeah. I think so entirely. I think DZ also is going into this plan, obviously seeing that they just played SSG most recently and lost a 7-3 to them. Yeah. So I have no doubt that DZ has all the prep that they need going into this bank. Well, a predictions championship at this point is already spoken for. This thing is going to Fox A, but at least for posterity, if you guys want to try to get your percentage up a little bit more, is everyone just going with DZ across the board here? I just can't go underneath that fifty percent. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all I'm going for at this point. I, think, I get it. I think Dark Zero make the most sense. It's yeah. gonna come down to Consulate in my mind, and Oxygen's Consulate has just been so bad ever since they started playing Consulate. Ever yeah. since it came into the pool, so I don't feel uh, good betting on that for that map three. Uh, maybe they could pull out a 2-0, maybe, but yeah, I think this is a really rough road just looking at the math for OXG. Flex. I'm going to have to go, obviously, with DZ just for that kind of reasoning as well. I don't think that last map is necessarily going to favor Oxygen, but again, yeah. we when we look at the attack sides of DZ and if it is a situation where Oxygen is going to start on defense, then I could, again, we could possibly see a 6-0 and then, you know, it, then it's a battle of who just has the stronger defense and maybe can get that one attack off. Well, it certainly looks like the ban phase is a little bit clear cut from where we stand. If it gets to consulate, maybe OXG run a bit of a hole. So they need to make sure that they power up against Dark Zero, who themselves also need to do the same. Our last spot in Manchester through the playoffs is coming up next and it's Parker McKay and Nicholas Moritzen to take us to bank. Oh, how I love hearing those words, and oh, how excited, Nick, I am for this matchup as well. Yesterday was a thrilling affair. Both of these games involving these teams went the distance, even if that final map was maybe a bit more lopsided. M80 beat Oxygen in map 3, 7-2. Beast Coast defeating DZ, 7-3. So both of them getting close, but ultimately not close enough. The desk seems to think Dark Zero has the edge with the way that they played yesterday. Do you disagree? I don't disagree at all, but I do have a worry because Dark Zero, they have not been a super consistent team this stage, and especially just looking at yesterday as a, as a sole day for them. It seems like they're a little bit reliant on somebody like Pambus who pop in off to have success on some specific maps. <coughs> Border, for example, uh, the second map here in this best of three. But I think starting off on bank is going to favor Dark Zero, get into the problem solving aspect on the attacking side, and of course, setting up problems on defense, something that Dark Zero historically has been very good at on both fronts. And for XG, we gotta look at them, how they do on the entries right now. I wanna see newers get active, I wanna see them be quicker, because when OXG played yesterday, they were struggling at controlling the pace up against the maybe. that's where they feel short. 
One time that these teams met each other in the regular season, it was played on consulate. You and I actually casted it, and DZ yes, prevailed 7-1. Those that may not remember the scoreline, Bank was not played by Dark Zero during stage one, so... It'll be intriguing to see the way that they go about this. Exactly. Border obviously played yesterday against Beast Coast, and that was an incredibly chaotic matchup. Yeah. It certainly wasn't the result that I had necessarily thought, but the bigger thing for me is not necessarily the immediate result, but uh, the scoreline. Again, it was so dominant for Beast Coast, who, I mean, Beast Coast finished first overall in stage one, and now in the playoffs have an opportunity to finish first out of all the teams that are competing in the playoffs, they will be in the next matchup against M80 in roughly about two hours or so. Let's get underway with our very first round of bank. And operator bands are locked in. Five Nothing really three. looks that abnormal with some of the most banned operators in the league being removed for this match. Yeah, this is super standard. And one thing that we're always criti critical of is that Dark Zero, they will ban Dunkabin and Asami every single map that they can. And they will never stray off that path. They want to make sure that they get a consistent game of Rainbow Six Siege by always removing those two specific operators from play. And this will be no different here on Bank because they have again banned Dunkabin and Asami. Of course, Monty Finware, it's Bank. You're banning those operators. DC, though, in very quickly. I said OHG, they struggle and they cannot control the pace. If Hemzo can walk in lobby, just get a kill here. That's DC very early controlling the rounds from the very beginning. This said the we had some listen-ins yesterday, and those comms were at oftentimes quite chaotic. Especially in the side of Dark Zero. They've got a lot of chatters on that team. Oh yeah. You add somebody like Nate specifically because you want to be able to have somebody make a call and call does. There's Nafe. Bring up the Twitch drone. There was a Twitch drone kill yesterday. I don't remember if you... I don't know if you saw that. I was casting Brazil with Gibson yesterday and... Oh. <laughs> very final kill that sent E1 to the Major was at the hands of a Twitch drone. Quite remarkable. I don't think we'll see that this time, though. It is quite likely that the first blow will come towards Yaga, who is playing on that main floor, drops through elevator back down to the bottom floor bomb site as we hit the halfway point of the round. It's a very quick start for Pembasu of DC and Lobby Cyber instead didn't want to risk progressing too far in the building. Rotate the top floor, destroy that soft floor, pop the hatch, and now we see OHT. They have fallen off that open area extension. But the timing right now is good for the attack of DC. They got 1 minute 30 seconds to work with, and all they gotta do now is pop the server hatch and attack servers, or simply go for a lobby hatch drop. But looking at the player positions and Canadian inside a dirt tunnel, they very they very likely will wanna go for a server that oriented attack. Two brow, three of those sodas canisters in pocket from newers. None spent yet, so that means that they're gonna try and use it later on in the round, maybe need the bomb set itself for a possible plan deny, or that A hatch deny, perhaps. Same with Bolo, three EMPs in pocket. They could deal with that Kite Claw, but they haven't yet. Time could very well be a problem here for DC. And there it is. Two more Soda Canisters in pocket. They cannot get this hatch opened up, most likely. will be able to bide so much time. I think you pointed that out correctly. 40 seconds left. Now closing in on 30 seconds. It's dire position. Second wall opened up next to oh. the main door of this bomb site. Pambazu the leadoff pick on Denewers traded right back with Gomez playing inside a vault over by Gold. There go the EMPs, Bees as well as Canadian attempting that plant. I don't know if the Nitro Cell was caught by Bolo. It sure looked like it though. Canadian gets the diffuser off before dying to a Nitro Cell. Bolo's job is done. It would have been nice if Troy survived, but I mean, at least you got the objective in your pocket. Easy trail in numbers. Yaga will retake above, all the way above, up to that second floor. Naif is holding down open area. Yaga now going for a rotate, oh. but they've actually reinforced the hatch. It'll work against him. Now he'll tussle over towards Square. Bolo picking off Gomez. Yaga, a nice kill. Naif is just waiting. There's no <laughs> real reason to move a muscle. They'll drop, head towards the diffuser, doubling up. OXG has Dream on the corner. Oh my! They need to now get Diaz onto it as Nave swings in and gets the last two kills. An excellent post plant for Dark Zero. All of these players in the right place at the right time. And DZ takes round number one.
That really is a team effort from Dark Zero, but I don't think the team would matter if it wasn't for one specific player in that round, Pambasu. He dropped the hatch off pace out of nowhere and took down Neurus on this, the Tuberau, which enabled DC to get the hatch opened up and actually go for a bombs and execute. So that one kill right here buys DC everything. And you also see the instantaneous reaction from Canadian, just walking that door, getting that diffuser down, while toxic babes are going, you know, fire from the Goyo as well. And they're just gambling. Hey, OXG, they're not gonna know if the planet's going down. And if they do, they're spamming those CMPs that can catch stuff midair. And Canadian, just when the bomb goes down, that's when he dies, but the job is done. They play post plant and they play it smart. Nave hiding open air, then defenders walk past him actually, drop down that hatch, and then playing post plant from above, while Bolos and Server Staircase is playing very like safely on that top wave position. Very well done. And it seemed very kind of thought out from DC from the very beginning. Sure, I know that they're gonna go for a quick round to begin things with, but then they slowed things down, and there was a three, two, one, work together, clean cut, execute. Thanks, it's directly middle of the pack in terms of pick rate in the North America League. The locker CCTV down below, that first bomb site, is not a friendly place for the defenders. Who played 26 times, now 27 technically. It's only been one below 35% of those rounds. That is a tremendously bad number. That means that when it shows up, you got a two-thirds chance of a team actually winning on it on attack. Easy picked this map. Oxygen opted to go on to defense. Open area and CEO both have significantly better numbers. We'll see if Oxygen can turn the ship around after that first round and keep the numbers close. It'll be an open area defense. Second most played bomb site on the map, sitting at almost 60% win rate for the defenders. So it's always a bit awkward playing a basement bomb set against a team like DC who are so good at executing five versus five because that's how basement bombs on a bank plays out more often than not. So playing open area, for example, is very different. You can roam early, extend out, try and get some kills like DSOs there and buy those early advantages. The similar pos position that Pambo was in before. Yaga dies, by the way, and so does Nave. Nave was the hero of the previous round. Dream roaming. Ambazoo sees one through the opening created into that teller's wall, looking all the way towards open area. Dream was in archives not too far removed. Open area defense. Not exactly looking as strong as it did just 30 seconds ago with OXG down one in numbers. The tricky. Gotta make sure they hold enough map control to slow down the attackers, but also don't overstay your welcome because all this verticality from above can be tricky to deal with. I haven't seen Canadian just yet in the ram, getting those boogie drones out. He's gotten one, but two more in pocket, of course, to go. And JR just holding down the card off rotation here on... Okay. Oh. Goodbye, Newers. It's a one tip from NGR. But also, Newers, why are you swinging that, right? I mean, okay, they're playing 3-4. They're trying to get down or get back with that man advantage. But now he's in a terrible position because two players cannot hold all the injury points towards the bomb side. So now Dream has to get creative. I can try and go for a flank or a kill. 30 seconds to go, but look at this, DC. They have the drone, they got the intel. They heard Dream's position, they get the yellow pings. Will they go for the kill or just simply ignore him? I mean, at least you're relying on two excellent support players. Well, Dream and Gomez, absolutely capable of clutching out around. There's Dream swinging, he's the last one left as Gomez is pulverizing the bomb site. Canadian with Diffuser, getting it down successfully. And now, all about ensuring Dream does not get back towards the bomb site with great safety. One kill to his name. Vault hole in. Instead, we'll opt to maybe go over towards square before thinking otherwise. Now into admin. Chasing these players from DZ. Keep maneuvering around. He'll make some noise this whole time. I'm sure Dark Zero are somewhat aware of his whereabouts. Dream firing away. Nice shot on the Canadian. Sidearm out, but oh my. Trying to hit a shot with those iron sights is a foolish endeavor more often than not. Too busy chasing shadows, Bolo situated, able to win on that final kill before Dream can get onto the diffuser, and it's a 2-0 start for Dark Zero. And it looks pretty effortless. I mean, this is just DC controlling the flow, the pacing, 
cutting off the rotations, winning their initial entries, and never really giving up anything for free on the attacking side of all things. And that's very impressive. On bank, it can be hard to get into the building initially. You're often fighting on window rappels or playing on those like long lines of sight outside the building. But DC make it look simple. They just, they get that kill, they'll trade a body, and then they'll make up for lost time by speeding up the mid rounds. And they always have people actively playing on the drones as well. We see them four versus two. A lot of teams might not think, hey, there could still be a roamer. No, let's just assume both players side, right? Not Dark Zero. They drone out Dream, despite being in a big advantage, and they have one player cut off the rotate, who then dies to Dream, but the three other attacking members of DC, they hit the bomb side, take down the side player, and get the diffuser down. And then sure, Dream's alive, but he's off the bomb side, attackers have the bomb planted. There's no way Dreams wins that retake. There's just simply 0% chance. Mags to go. Swapping mags. Attackers objective is to carousel that they're currently riding on will now end up with us in a different part of this map. And it was a good time to talk about the actual stats of these bomb sites. Third round, third bomb site for OXG. They've not been successful at all. So they'll go to CEO upstairs. It's a 50-50 win rate, by the way. Seven, seven wins on attack, seven wins for the defenders. Unsurprising to see Dark Zero start out on repel. There's a starting position that you gotta go for, but this clash could be problemsome. I'm not gonna lie to you. With two minutes and 10 seconds left in the round, or two minutes 20 rather, it's gonna be a slow start with DC. Get their repels, slow this up against the building, get those EMP downs, but let's see what Darks you have to say in this round and how they're gonna problem solve this defense from OXG. Flash is probably they're gonna probably power US too, so I'd play it very slow. I'm up okay. E3. Just like drop a little. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, E3 and quad. One's still quad, I'm holding them right now. Is, it, is that Ward and quad? Yeah, Ward and quad. Cade was E3. I can, I can, I can I think quad, we go stop. We go stop. We go stop. I can go, I can go. Fuck that. We we go for the stop one. Go for the stock wall, I'll yin, 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 ace. I'm gonna rotate off here. I think it's gonna be the wall my plane is, so yeah, make sure we, uh, you check. repel if you have to. I can, yeah. I can. Flash, flash I can burn. Maybe yeah, it's a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get some burns for the... I can't. I don't even see magnets. I don't even see magnets. Okay, all right, all right. If there's no magnets, are you ready? Let me watch my swing. I'm gonna burn one swing. Okay. Dropping on this. Go, 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 go. EMP. I need to EMP or not? Yes. So I can get it. Flash. I'm EP now, I'm EP now. I'm watching your swing. Full flash. Hey, flash hey, 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 right now. He's gonna walk up, man. I'm gonna try natural stock, man. Natural stock. Yeah, yeah. Natural Who stock. Flash hey, turn back. Hey, hey. Did we get the kill? I can go oh, printer side. I can go printer side here. He can walk up. I, I don't you know. Eyes on him? He's no, eyes? Can he kill all mate or not? He's okay. on main. He's on main. Okay, okay. Right. No, fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. We're gonna leave him? He's no, on no. main. He is on main. I think I'm that. He's in E2 right now. Shall flash back and stop. Flash back and stop. Jay, Jay, just Jay, come over. I'm going. Okay, he's no one in. Okay, that's the K main. Okay, that's the K main. Jay, Jay, come over okay. stock and then Chord, you can just flash and just push the guy Jan. Jan needs to clear. Actually, I can push the guy Jan. Can you take Hayes? Can you take Hayes? I'm here stock side. Yeah, okay, okay. I might need to get Windows here instead of K to repel it. I still stock side. I can push Strand. Flash is just gonna hold me here. Just distract him. Just distract him. Yep. Can you flash quad quick or next? It's Warden. I know, I'm gonna no, just, just zap me out here. Okay, yeah. I need the timing. Five. He's like Corbin. I'm repelling right now. Kill me, uh, Meaty, Meaty. Yeah, it's not hard. Okay, I can't do anything. Quad, Nick. Eating Quad. Got banana. Dude, this son of a bitch. I'll grab the trap. Oh man, what a, what, a, of what, a final, what a final statement. What parting words <laughs> from Bolo as he assesses his options with the clash staring right at him. We've all been there, man. There's not much you can do really as most operators in a 1v1 against a clash, especially when you're outside the building and clash is inside as well in that window vault prompt. But DC didn't really get to do what they wanted. They were very much stuck for the majority of that round. And there was one moment very early on in the very beginning of that listening that could have changed everything. And Pamusu walked into a lobby, up the red staircase. He had a slight misread in the situation. He checked elevators, thought it was clear, looked to his left, then got shot in the back. He could have very easily picked up one or two kills, created a bunch of chaos, turning all the guns from XG towards him, and then DC could have, you know, done that same execute, but with much less resistance toward them. So it really could have been an excellent plan, but I think a bit of a 
mistimed execute, if you will. It seemed that the rest of DC wasn't quite ready compared to Pambasu. But also, it seems like the game plan is unleash Panda, give him freedom. If he wants to just, like look for a gap or an opening, let him do it. And if it works, act upon it. If not, you can continue the plan as four players. DC though got the first two rounds, of course, so losing that single round, not the end of the world. They've already gotten two attacks. They're looking for a third. It's a 2 1 scoreline so far. I mean, you're still pretty happy with that one. I, I, I am a bit surprised with how much struggles Dark Zero had with just conquering a single mirror window. I mean, that completely threw off whatever execute they had. Newers just had to sit inside of, it was a conference, holding that mirror window yeah. for two minutes and didn't really have to exert much effort or have much influence on the round beyond that. But, you lose Pambazoo early, who's been excellent on entry all stage. He actually leads the league in positive entry stats. Mm. And he does quite well through the first two rounds. Obviously, without him, you might be in a bit of trouble. Spent a lot of time looking at that bag of cash on the desk. I don't know if you saw that. What do you think he's thinking? <laughs> Swapping man. Grab the money and run, you know. All this work. Just for a couple of rounds, when in a single round you can steal tons and tons of money. It's bank after all. But yeah, you're right. Pamusu being a great injured player, if you cannot be enabled and speed things up for DC, they will struggle when it comes to time or maybe creating those openings. And also, bank is a map, you have a lot of like, utility operators. For example, in this round, you have IQ, you have Maverick, you have Twitch, you have Grim. None of those operators wants to die early. You want them to survive for the majority of the round, ideally, until you reach the bomb site itself. And that's the thing about basement, like I said earlier. This often comes down to a 5v5 or a 4v4 bombs that execute. And I do think that is where Dark Seal, that they thrive. But they are a bit slower this time around, and they don't have Thatcher for those EMPs. So this Kaid pick from Gomez could very well be a problem unless the Twitch one gets in the bomb site, which is just barely did. Pop that Goya canister, but did not clean out the claw. So now instead, Canadian will have to go on that Maverick Torch duty and spend the next 30 seconds or so just. Opening up this hatch, but again, time will be quite low for DC also in this round. Very quiet round so far, though. Only 45 seconds left. You wouldn't even assume that if you'd been watching along. The utility battle, as this bottom floor bomb site tends to be. How many of those Goyo canisters have DZ opened up? Do they have safe passage on in? Spot the Kaid of Gomez still holding down Garage, but they've missed the fact that somebody from OXG has now resumed that position at the bottom of the stairs. You hadn't seen that shoulder for a second as Pambazoo did. You could have been in trouble, and there's Diaz getting very active. Not before Dream has died, though. Both teams into a 4v4. Canadian had some struggles on that Ying. Down goes Bolo amidst the smoke thrown out earlier. Canadian firing away in active desperation. He'll attempt to plant through the back of the bomb site. Nave and NJR are still alive. Does OXG know this? Yaga trying to stop it, and just like that, the round is over. Every single player of OXG trying to get active in stopping Canadian, and none of them successful. <laughs> it can be hard to figure out what is actually happening in that round if you're a defender, because when time is running very low, you're always going to think to yourself, okay, guys, let's play safe, stay alive. They're probably not going to have time to plant. And they almost didn't. I think it was like three, four odd seconds left when the Canadian got into the bomb side. So it very well could have been a position where, hey, let's just hide in corners, time runs out, we win on defense. Hey, easy. But sometimes you'll make that wrong decision. You'll play too passive and actually allow someone like Canadian to get into a plant position and then lose the round. All of a sudden, we see Yark, who was just playing keep away, has to sprint to the bomb side and try and shut down Canadian, but then dies to the cover of Nave, I believe. So it kind of falls apart. OXG, they're trying to figure out the tempo right now that DC is setting, and it's awkward when Pambasu is so extremely quick, while the rest of DC are, I would say, really, really slow in the round. It's very much a back and forth action. And OXG have been playing a lot of different operators. For example, Tubro, Kaid, Goyo, trying to play a slow round. And they try and play good guns in Valkyrie. That's not work out either. Now they're playing, I want to say, a lot of intel. Solus and the Valkyrie, bulletproof cameras. Um, two of them, in fact, and just good guns across the board. Dark with the ACOG, Frost with the ACOG, so as they can find all those drones. OXG in this round, they want to just fight Dark Zero. It's not about denying the plant, it's not about playing the bomb side. This is going to be a brawl of a round where defenders will take the fight to the attackers. 
Back on to repel, they go. Oh, at least Polo, who's got six kills to his name so far through this contest. Nafe is actually the highest rated player on this team with NJR not too far behind. Bolo trails Panbazoo, but is quite a ways ahead of Canadian. It's the hierarchy of this team right now. Nice to see Bolo competing back at this level. And he's had good games. He had that, what, he had that 0-7 game, and then he had a 12-0 and 0 game, was it? Or a 13-0 game? 0-8. 0-8, sorry. 0-8. Wouldn't want to not credit him for one of those deaths. Pamazoo dies to Newers. <laughs> this is the start that OXG needs. Shut down one of the entry players on Dark Zero. Most importantly, take that Ying off the board. It's a very good start. Also, it's Pambasu, so that's again like the spirit of DC. Now we should expect a much slower round from them unless somebody else speeds up. We've seen Canadian play Buck now two rounds and he can get quick with it. Got the Skunzuki, got the Fire Spans, can enable himself and his teammates if he has to. But again, getting in the building is the struggle right now on Bank. They had three players on the rappel. Now they're gonna start flying in those windows, but now they lag intel. So when one thing works out, another thing will be punished instead. But Nave wins the gunfight against Newers. It's back to a 4v4. They're taking no prisoners now. Canadian in as another silhouette not far removed from his reticle. He'll throw out a flash. Looked the wrong way. Dream blinded his doc. He can get himself right back Ooh. up. Canadian punched from behind. That's a nice sucker punch from Gomez. So XG now hold the numbers. Bolo and NJR working together. Dream popping up. Silenced by Bolo. Where is Diaz? That is the real question. All this action happening in the bomb site is actually down below. Teller's archives, all four sites have now shown up. What is Bolo to do? He's holding on to that diffuser. Yeah. Issue is Intel. Two drones from DC likely, you know, just like flank watch your dead drones. So they're playing this round blind. Now just play together. Three, two, one, try and organize something and get into that bomb site. And then GR might just lead the charge. We're running out of time though. Off to NJR. Both of the support players from OXG do not miss this time. It was Dream and Gomez as the last two, if you remember, on that open area defense. They had some struggles. This time around, looking far more poised, and that's two rounds in a row now won by OXG. And you saw the game plan. It was very clear. It's just fight Dark Zero, play comfortable, strong guns, and whenever they started fighting top floor, it was more and more defenders rotating up a staircase to join the fight. There was a point that round where there were nobody on the bomb set itself because, again, the bomb set wasn't the point of contact for anybody. You can't rush Akram Stilos as an attacker because it's the middle of the site with self-destruction all around you, so you have to go for a room clear. And likewise, because of that, defenders don't have to play on the bomb site, but rather around it and above it. So OXG, they really understood the mission of that bomb site. Some teams have a hard time making that work, but they found that success right there. The big issue, though, is that where else can they get a round victory? Because if OXG cannot make CEO work, they will have a 2-4 side half. Not great, you know, considering the fact that they pick defense to start things off, you would expect that they want to get, like, at least a 3-3, even half, if maybe not a lead. DC, though, last time, they struggled heavily against the Clash, so it's no surprise to us that will do the same thing again. It worked before, why not go for broke? But we do see a small counter-adjustment here in both Nave playing the Nomad and Canadian bringing out the Capital. Like, oh. Okay. I don't They're believe that was wrong. intentional. Uh, no, but it definitely worked out. That was Diaz putting down a mirror window mid animation and a smile from NGR's face there. I think you recognize that. That's a free one. Yeah, we take those. That's cheeky. I mean, he certainly knew the lineup. If not, that was the wildest random wallbang ever. You take when you you take them when you can get them. Oh yeah, All right. It's like when somebody disconnects and you say, "That's my kill." Yeah. Doesn't really work out that way. You feel a little bit better. You move on with your life. Seems to be the key for these DZ rounds, Nick, is whether or not Pam Bazoo is able to live longer than the first point of entry into the map. So far, so good. And with the fact that Dark Zero's already got that first pick, albeit maybe an unearned or undeserved pick. 
Amazu getting an entry is not as dire as it usually would be. It also allows Dark Zero to be a bit more confident with their numbers. If you're going to try to keep tally of where these OXG players are, having one fewer is a job a lot oh, easier, yeah. especially if it's a Mira. That's one of the anchors inside of a site that now no longer can cause pain to you. It also means one of the two Nitro cells off the board. Yeah, also it might mean that one Mira in the wasn't even put down, but also it means one less gun on top of the fact that you're playing a Clash. Typically with Clash and Monty, they're going to be extended, playing passive roles with their shield up. They can't really fight back or shoot back at least. So because DS falls early, there are only three guns firing back at DC now because there we go. Clash is just sapping around. So if one player from DC can distract the Clash, then it's a 4v2 elsewhere. Amazon now assessing his options. 45 seconds left. He's inside of the bomb site. Knocked over. It seemed like there was an air jab there. I'm not sure who that was that was knocked over. Pambazoo killed by Newers. The first casualty for DZ. Despite their advantage, they're having some struggles right now. It would seem Nathan Canadian on opposite sides of the map, but Canadian finds Yaga. Now it's up to Dream and Newers. Newers always a threat when he's in this position. Dream putting the shield away. The sidearm coming out. Newers now swinging. Ooh. OXG can easily win this round. All they need to do is find Canadian and Bolo. Diffuser going down, Newers. And he exploit the fact that DZ might be having their attention elsewhere. Walking in towards the A-bomb site. Dream trying to stall. Bolo manages to get away safely and on to repel, he will go. Shield comes out for Dream. That means Canadian will now be in a 1v2, but he also drops towards main lobby. Newers on the diffuser. Bolo waiting for this call. He doesn't have a line of sight. There it is. This upside down repel outside is all but impossible to deal with. And I really feel for Dream. He's not even gonna get Canadian. Canadian two kills and the diffuser. That's quite the score line for him just in one round alone. But how about an even better score line for Dark Zero? 4-2, the first half in their favor. They picked this map. OXG picked defense, but could only win two rounds. What does that mean? Both swapping sides. It certainly might mean that DC will just like, you know, take this bank, assuming they can make their defenses work. But I would say DC are typically a team that is doing better on defense than that of attack because there are struggles with the timer and with the entries. And even though the final round in the first half, the way the Pamela died is comical. He runs into a CEO breach, going to open things up, but the air jab from his teammate of Nave got caught by the mine magnet, and it gets popped after a couple seconds, knocking Pambusu on the ground, and he dies shortly after. So despite that early death really not being planned out and not intended, he still found the problem solving there, right? They had one player distract the clash, and yeah, of course, uh, Dream put back uh, away the shield rather, and got killed with a gun, but that distraction was all they needed to establish the bomb going down, Bolo jumps out the window, one point of HP, but he's on the repel, he can shut down any defuse attempt, just like he did. And we see Dark Seer, you know, they are so disciplined in the post and they don't give away anything for free, and they're gonna play a solid, stable round, they're just playing keep away. DC will start downstairs, again, they love attacking basement 5 versus 5, they also love defending it because it plays with their strengths as a team. Play the layers, play together, and have that execute where you can either deny the entries away into the building, or if you have to later on, fall back to the side and deny the plant with Echo, Smoke, and a C4. A certain level of confidence, I feel like, on those DZ entries against OXG. It was a tough day for Dark Zero yesterday because of issues on Friday. DZ did have to play those two matches, not back to back, but with very little reprieve in between them. Because of that, DZ has just a couple hours to prepare for their next match. Their adversaries, the time Beast Coast, well, that was the only match that they had to play, so they could spend the entire time watching DZ's game against LG. Counter strat them. Newers now found on square stairs, Pambazoo. Getting very brazen, and I mean, these are two extremely gifted mechanical players. Why not have them run headfirst into one another? Yaga's no slouch either, and he picks off Canadian. That was the castle roaming. It looks like he went for the jump out. There's blood <laughs> adorned on the brick wall, the exterior of the building. It's not where a defender is supposed to be, Nick. No, oh, I mean, I like the first play there from DC, lashing out, getting the pick, but the jump out is a little bit of a gamble, but of course, we can always say that if Canadian had gotten the kill instead, that's a two-for-one trade. That's phenomenal. Still 44 favorite defense, but, you know, never count out DC when Pambus is alive. He finds Dream as well, and they are stopping this room clean his tracks. 
Gomez and Diaz, last two left, the two newest additions to OXG with a little over a minute to go, and they start by finding Pambazoo. That's quite the trophy. Now Bolo as well will die. OXG turning what was a terrible situation into a very workable one. Still a Yokai drone in play. Nafe sequestered over towards Elevator, but that is the bigger issue. Fuser on the roof of the building. OXG is going to have to retrieve it, which means that Gomez will wait, will shave about 20 to 25 seconds off of the clock, if not more, just to get into position. He has opened up the hatches, so job done there. Now the translation to an execute begins. Gomez, no utility remaining. He has three flashbangs. That's really it. Nave throwing out an impact Ooh. grenade. Diaz worried that the flash did not work. It does. Now it's Nave taking damage, but finishing off Gomez. Diaz to burst forth from elevator. But nobody from DZ showing themselves at all. Diffuser in a plume of toxic gas. NJR still got one for added measure. Get on that smoke. So hard to deal with. There's also a Yokai drone up. All DZ needs to do is play keep away. No opportunity whatsoever for OXG to find either of the two remaining players. They might not have even been on the entire map as far as OXG knows. Not exactly the start OXG wanted as that's another round in the column of DZ. I think DZ playing Border yesterday gave them a, a new way to play the game because they are playing kind of atypical bank basement, also very atypical Dark Zero. They aggressed into OXG on the, on the defensive side, into the attack. And that's not what DC normally would do, right? They would fall back, play it smart, play predictable, if you will. And I very much believe that OXG were caught by complete surprise in that round. Hammer didn't go for one swing or two. He went for three separate swings. Bolo got a kill as well. Canadian jumping out a window. And while the jump out didn't work from Canadian, Bolo and Pamazu both found kills. And it forced OXG to rush down the main staircase and try and hit the bomb site directly. So... This is just throwing OHG off their A game and throwing them a bit of a curveball, making them work on the adaptation, you know, on the fly. And OHG, they have shown signs of trouble with that, not just in this game, but also throughout the state so far. This could be very much an intended way for DC to play this because it speaks into the weakness of Oxygen. It's good prep work if that's the case, and it certainly has worked out so far. DC leading 5 2 with OHG just calling their tactical timeout. This is not looking all too good, but this is DC's map. That's the big kind of positive thing to this. Oh, what do you think they could possibly have talked about during that timeout? What is what is the biggest issue that you see afflicting OXG at this point? So in the interview before the game, Diaz spoke about how they were having some issues with energy when they were playing yesterday and how they started off strong, they lose a couple of bad rounds or a bad map or they cannot figure out how to play like either defense or attack, whatever the struggle might be. And they have a really hard time getting that energy back up and like working together on the problems. And often what actually they need is like a reset. So bank right now might be a lost cause, but then they can figure it out in between map one and two and pick the pace back up on border. But the issue is while you can lose a map in the best of three, you need to be able to figure it out on the fly because if you go third map and it's going poorly for you, there's no way back into it. So energy, reset, get back into it, fight until the end. Well, we got to hear what Dark Zero was saying and I think this is a perfect opportunity with the fact that Diaz just got the leadoff kill on the Pambazoo that we take the same time and opportunity to do it with OXG as well. Uh, do you want to go below or fuck that? Yo, I think to the other bandit tricking elevator. Yeah, they are gonna, I, yeah, I just okay, heard it. I'm gonna need you're gonna, you're gonna have to nade that. Nade. I'm gonna need to well, He that. killed Wamai. He killed Wamai. Let me see if there's any. Okay, Jay, Jay. So it's probably one. Right here? Yeah, I'm coming. Yo, I'm set, coming. set up an E True drone while I'm droning this, Yag. Yep, I will. So I see I see one thing I'll, we'll need to burn. I think I could smoke that, Yag. I, that's all I could see, though. I couldn't drone the rest. For new, I think you go. Uh, okay, never mind. Okay. Grab. You just gotta hold, hold. You gotta hold hops. You gotta hold hops while I grab okay? Yo, I kinda yeah, wanna okay, get I, I, I'm gonna get the castle. I can need these bandits, but I need. Okay. I have one burn. What castle? What castle? Did you get already? I don't see it. Uh, the banana one, banana one. I burned it. Okay. Yo, listen, listen. Yo, he's in Trump right now. But listen, I, I, Diaz, I, I need don't you think to... so. Don't worry about it, bro. Diaz, I, I need you to get E3 wall. wall. I can need, I can need the Utah off. We're going right now. I'm going right now. Yes, uh, yo, they may be right there for no reason. Let me know when you nade. Okay. I can nade whenever. You guys ready? 
I'm going off of you. I'm going off of you. Get the ether all as soon as my first nade goes off, alright? Okay, yeah. Count it down, yeah, count it down. Alright, three, two, one, I'm nading. I'm gonna nade again. Nading again. Good ant. I didn't see him. He's on ping, looking at he might be he might know you're on repel. There's two trump, there's two trump. There's one there, there's one front under the windows. Are windows peeking, peek, peek, they're peeking, they're peeking. I'm getting off, I got off, I got off, I got off. We should go to the right, other side then. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go top of the Is this guy in E3? Wait, wait, I can fire this guy from retard. I can just fire him from retard, no? This whole machine's new. Are we, we ready? Fire the E3 guy? No, no, I'm firing um, Trump. Here, I'm holding it, I'm holding it, I'm holding it. Everyone ready? Yeah, I'm holding it. Oh, I'm dying, I'm dying. I can't do it here, I can't do it. We gotta swap, we gotta swap. We're gonna have to do a windows take six We just gotta do something, yes. Can we just go together? Can we just repel in the windows and go together? I'm gonna drop marble. Yeah, I can flame, I can flame. Where do you die from here? He nice shot all the way from top red. Okay, that's unfortunate. You guys ready? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just smoked it. I just smoked it. Three. Is, is there guy any three guys? Do we know? Oh no, no, no. Jump marble. I'm repelling in. Jump, 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 jump. Jump, jump dead, jump dead. The oh, janitor, janitor, one janitor. Yes. I can plant. I'm, 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 I'm gonna plant. I'm gonna plant. I'm gonna plant. I'm gonna plant. Five seconds remaining. Hey, wallbang, wallbang me. What? Wow, dude, just tragic. It's tragic indeed, a great way of putting it. A round that seemed like it was all but tied up and delivered straight to OXG headquarters. And yet, with two players watching Dream with Diffuser in hand and knowing that the last player of DZ's and Janitor, they are unable to stop Naif, who gets the kill onto the Diffuse planter and it gives DZ the victory that round. Instead of it being 5-3 and being far more winnable, it's now a 6-2 score line, and the climb back for OXG has just gotten so much harder. Oh yeah, that's definitely a mental chalker, that is for sure. And one thing that I like to do during these listenings is close my eyes for like half of it and try and see if I can figure out what is actually happening from the attacking side, just purely off voice comms. And I made a note that said, I don't really know what's happening. Like, I don't know how they are supposed to problem solve this round. I open my eyes, a couple seconds goes by, and they're in the side in that 3v2 getting another diffuser. I didn't really feel like that's what happened when I listened to the communication. I heard them having a very hard time opening that the first wall towards, um, it's called Kanto spot typically, the elevator double wall from outside. And then it was like, okay, I'm dying, is stream calling. But then they get in the building, they get those guns fired up, but they planned in arguably the wrong position that doesn't have any cover for a wall bank, and it all goes south. OXG, if the energy was bad before their tactical timeout, I am sure that this feels terrible right now because they should have won a round, but they didn't. And as Jason put it, Bolo, in his play interview before this matchup, he said, we cannot live in the what ifs. You have to play it round by round and not worry about what could have happened, what should have happened, but rather what did in fact happen, learn from it and do better next time. OXG certainly gotta learn from that position because you gotta make sure you close it out when you're in a 3v1 trying to get down that diffuser. Plenty of utility from OXG to take care of the problems that have been thrown their way from Dark Zero. I am a little disappointed with how little OXG has been able to stand up to DZ's firepower. Only two rounds on attack? Or two rounds on defense, rather, no rounds on attack so far for OXG. I will say the saving grace is the fact that this is DZ's map. Yeah. So, I mean, if this was OXG's pick and DZ's got their next map up, yeah, there's probably trouble in the water. It's been a long, long time since OXG has competed at an international event. They looked like up until the second last day of the NA League, like they were going to finish first overall. Now they might not even make it in one of the three spots, and then they'll go down to the last chance qualifiers. Don't really want to get ahead of ourselves because we've still got another map to go. But this is certainly not the beginning that OXG envisioned. You have to ensure that you don't have an ending that you didn't envision either. Tough Ready, round. Ready. Yeah, you're down on match point. That's an obvious, you know, thing to figure out, but problem solving this, the probably was shielding their face. 
No real soft destruction. I mean, you got uncookable nades on Yawk and you got DS on the forest, but they're progressing very slowly here. I just be smokes and fights and go miss like straight in and try and gamble those two to But then it starts up the toxic babe. DC are stalling out OXG. They're just gonna go for it. Pamazoo and NJR greets them. OXG falling by the wayside. Gomez the only one on the board so far. Down goes Nathan Canadian. Deployable shield position inside of this break room will be a big challenge. There's really nothing Gomez can do to take care of it. He has his no Flores drones either. There's no explosives here. As long as DZ do not put themselves in harm's way. Oh my goodness, they should be okay. Solo to retake, but he's shut down by Gomez. That looked like a great start for DZ. But they just couldn't stick the landing. OXG winning all of those last three engagements without any utility whatsoever. Impressive stuff. Very surprising stuff as well because, I mean, with the openings going there, they did them like, okay, they were completely locked out. The first push didn't work out. They lost a lot of utility. But then again, OXG, when they're hitting their shots, when they're believing the system and working together, they can get those aggressive entries working for them. It's just the consistency issues. It happens maybe twice, three times in an entire, you know, map. Whereas OXG, in a perfect world, they could make that work maybe twice that. We're gonna five or six times on the attack, which is the majority of the rounds. It has been, as you said, like, oh, she started off very strong in the NAL this stage. Kind of fell off towards the last week or play day or so. And there is one notice that OXG, you know, they maybe started having some issues. That's a fair point to make. But also, the other teams that have made roster changes or figured out their footing, for example, a team like Beast Coast, that what lost their first three games, looked like a completely lost team, that, okay, they're not gonna make it very far. Then they figure That's things out. So a mixture of you stagnating as a team, other teams improving, you know, that can make a very big divide all of a sudden. If you look at Dark Zero, at the Six Sensationals just in February, you would think, okay, DC, they are more like most likely to finish first or second in an AL because they look so good at the Invitationals. And then they have a very rough start to their season. It's hard to be consistent in Rainbow Six Siege, especially when new operators come out or a map shelf in, pro in professional play or meta changes. Like the game has been slowed down about 15% between SI and now. You zoom in slower with your weapon. There are now new ACOG scopes on defense and attacks. Things have changed and adjustments take time. It seems to figure out the fastest. We'll get ahead, of course. Amasu, are you going to jump out of match point? Sacrifice the Solis. So are you going to stick this very unsafe corner if he gets droned out he might be stuck and all it takes is one nade to take him out but i think he's looking for a jump out and he nails it does he get back alive that's the real question oh no 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 dream gets credited with the kill it looked like for a moment there he might have actually gone away pambazi was so close following gomez tie they both die trading it out Look at the score lines of the remaining players on the right side of your screen. Diaz with nine kills, Dream with six, Newers with eight. The only really Yaga that struggled in the offense department is Gomez is in the ground, but he has 11 kills to his name. Oxygen doing a far better job ultimately of being carried by top players, whereas with DZ, it's far more spread out. Bolo is the only player on the side of DZ to have broken double digits. He's at 11. Next closest, Naif at seven. Defense has a pretty clear ring condition right now. You gotta go plant the eye. Toxic babes, impact grenades, and of course those Joker drones from Nave on the Echo. But likewise on the attack, you got IQ up alive. So both teams can very comfortably pl still play to what I think they wanted to originally in the five versus five. Attackers can go for a plant, defenders can go for a plant the eye, and they can both counter one another. And it's three versus three. It's like a perfectly even balanced situation where defenders can cover every single hatch drop or entry path, but also attackers also don't, you know, cannot overflow the bomb side because it's an even man count. It's anyone's round. It's still, of course, match point. DC 6 3, but it's OXG. They gotta start this push. They gotta show us they don't have plan to go for kills, but most importantly, they have to work together and not isolate themselves in those gunfights. Again, limited utility. Down goes Canadian to Diaz. Dream was close by enough where he could have potentially got this last kill. Snape and NJR, same as before. The two support players. Dream goes for the vault, taking an awful lot of damage. And now finished off by the impact from Nave, who looks as casual as can be. He has the last one for OXG, running out of time. He gets one kill, still five seconds to try and find Nave, who now just needs to play keep away, but gets the kill anyway. 
Easy, take map one. Impressive stuff. Severe good start from them. I mean, DC looking much more alive from the server. I was saying, okay, if they have a slow start today, that could be the end, you know, for their playoffs run so far. They have a quick start. Looking like a good team today. Certainly had good rest after yesterday's performance. At least one more map. See if DZ qualifies for Manchester. Will they get it done or do OXG strike back on their own map pick? We'll find out in a couple minutes. In a world where everybody would have been expecting Zark Zero to pick Shell A, they throw a curveball at us and go bank instead, and it turns out to be exactly what the doctor ordered. They win their own map pick in our last Manchester qualifier game of this playoffs, and now OXG are in a bit of a hole, not just because they lost, because they lost and didn't really have a response in map number one to carry with them into map two. DZ looked great. No, DZ looked phenomenal. I, I mean, I, this isn't really surprising to me. I don't think it's probably going to be surprising to you either. They definitely look like they 
knew how they wanted to approach this map. It, there were some areas that even just watching from a player point of view, they weren't even clearing necessarily with a drone because of the prep and the VOD reviews that they had from their most previous game against SSG with uh, OXG, D, uh, OXG and SSG. Yeah. And you could just see that they had the initial strat of how they want to do it. That was a beautiful wall bang, by the way. But no, DZ had this clinically down to a T of how they wanted to approach this map and take this map overall. Oh, 100%. I think for Dark Zero, a lot of their executes were the classic DZ style where they're going slow with very little time, but they've got the man counts. They know exactly what they want to do, and they're able to execute that even though the clock is at its lowest. Dark Zero are so, so good at using every little bit of that clock. I thought there were a couple of times where Pamba was dying kind of needlessly in the yep. early round, especially solo without really any um, chance of getting the trade. But other than that, super clean game from Dark Zero. Loved their basement defenses, combining the best worlds of both really strong roamers coming up with Bolo and Pamba having great impact, stalling and getting kills in the early round, and then super strong anchors, smoke, echo down below so that they can win on time when they need to. Clearly really well thought out from Dark Zero from start to finish. In the series they played yesterday, sometimes they had man count and it fell by the wayside real quick. Sometimes they had man count and converted. If they had man count here, they converted, it seemed like, basically every time. And in cases where they were down, like that Naif 1v3 that we noticed up top, moments like that for DZ showing that they really have an understanding of where they were lacking from yesterday and translate it into bank. And so far, it's worked great, especially because those attacks looked so dialed in. Yeah, and again, I think the attacks were really Dark Zero style attacks. The way that they were able to push in seemed very, very efficient. It really felt like Dark Zero were in their elements on this map. And I don't know if Border is going to be much of the same. Uh, looks like we have the round, yeah. So round four is one of these where we have uh, a super low time. And watch these Toxic Babes being utilized by Yaga. He had two in his pocket at the start of this clip about 10 seconds ago. He's used both of them. And Canadian's able to use that fact to just sneak out of this elevator with perfect timing. And again, every little moment of that clock is being utilized well. Canadian, nine seconds, he's aware of it. You know what? I have time to check for somebody near gold. Nope, nobody in the rotate. And then he still has time to go get that plant down. The coverage from both Nafe and NG are to position themselves is perfect. They clean up those last couple of players who were all pushing in. You didn't see it to the end, but they managed to get all three of those kills with beautiful plant coverage. That is a classic Dark Zero execute. Again, you look at the stat line for DZ, they all look relatively close. Obviously, you got Bolo and Nave carrying that, but uh, for down the list, everyone's is relatively close. It was a team effort, a 7-3. That's a team effort in the end of it. Now you look on the auction inside, Still, I mean, that does look like a team effort across the board, but I did talk about Yaga in the beginning of this, that yeah. he needs to be performing. And here again, we're seeing a two in 10 performance from him. Yikes. And again, this isn't me going at Yaga, saying he's a bad player, because we all know Yaga and the potential that he has. We just need to be seeing it here going into these matches and finishing out the rest of this, and especially going into this border. Yeah, I feel like Yaga sometimes wasn't really playing the right operators for the job. That yeah. last round sticks out of my mind where he's on Repel, on the Grim, and there's no Claymore, Absolutely. so Pamba just jumps on out. And it's like Grim is an execute operator. You're really struggling with the roam clear against this Dark Zero setup. It's the exact same setup as the last time you played it. You didn't have answers for it. Feels like sometimes maybe auction just need to go back to the drawing board to set their players up for success. We move into map two, and Border was a map that was played by Dark Zero twice yesterday. One win, one loss. Last time we saw OXG play, it was back when Beast Coast didn't really have their stuff figured out quite yet. It was a very quick 7-3. OXG liked the pick probably because they trounced Beast Coast so heavily early on and because they have two maps of DZ playing it from yesterday with pretty mixed results. So if there was a time for OXU to bounce back, can they do it here? Yeah, and I love that you say that. They do have two VODs to watch exactly what DZ did in the beginning and what they did in the end. So they can really try to calculate and how they want to approach that. My only issue is, and Pangu touched up on it, is the energy. When you went to their player camps, even in the beginning, they didn't look super hyped. Typically, pretty somber, when we yeah. saw OXG in the beginning, Newers was smiling, Diaz was smiling. Even in losing rounds, they were laughing and we weren't yeah. seeing that. So the energy definitely needs to be picked up. But if this is going to be the map that is going to set them up going into that third map, this will be at 100%. Yeah, I, I expect to see a consulate on the board here. I think for, for Dark Zero's play style, again, they like to go for these late yep. pushes with as many players alive as possible, that's just not possible on border, right? Auction are going to be able to control the pace and have these, these rounds move a lot faster. We saw both of these, these opponents able to do that yesterday. And while Dark Zero were fighting back at some times, often it was big hero plays from guys like Pamba, which really enabled them to do that. So if 
that's not happening today. If Oxygen can watch for that aggressive play from Pambazoo, just like what we yep. saw coming through in Dark Zero's second game of the day, then I really think they should be, uh, be able to find success here on border. But my big question for Oxygen, this is going to be two street maps where it basically has to be counter stratic against the way that DZ played border yesterday twice, again, two VODs, against the way that they played DZ on Consulate if they need to go to Consulate. Remember, that was a 7-1. That was over before it even really started. So now it means OXG have to dial in for two maps straight in order to even have a chance to get to Manchester. The biggest thing is with counter striking that is the initial prep going into the round. The biggest thing is going to be the adapting. And obviously, starting on attack here on Oxygen, that's not great. Yep. You can understand what they're going to do. But DZ, I have no doubt, is going to try to switch up or maybe do something a little different. I think Pamba still going to be playing top east and maybe fighting for that pretty aggressively. But this comes down to a game of adapting. And that's what Oxygen is 100% going to have to be doing here. On top of, you know, we did talk about Yaga. This is a map that forces a lot more teamwork than Bank being really spread out. Well, let's see whether or not Dark Zero can finish this thing out in two maps straight or whether we get what everybody here was hoping for and get a much closer closer series. Consulate may be on the books, but we have to go through border first. It's Parker and Pengu with the call to see if Dark Zero can make Manchester right now. DZ might only be seven rounds away from punching their ticket to the UK, though. Given that this is not their map, and given what we saw at Border yesterday, I think seven might be a little too ambitious. If Dark Zero does come out ahead here on Border, Nick, I think it'll be a grueling contest. What's more likely in my eyes, the so OXG wins and we need a third and final map to determine which of these teams does make it. But who knows? Things have been completely up in the air with not just the NA League, but all the regions. Just look at the teams that will be representing Brazil as a good indication of that. Border on the docket and operator bands will come in. Do you think we're going to see anything abnormal with who they remove from play? Maybe from OXG, but not from Darkseer, because I can tell you right now, they've already shown it, though it could be an Asami. Oh. OXG, they removed Ying so far, so again, nothing out of the norm. The big question is Defender, Intel, Paul, Solace, Valkyrie, Fenrir. Okay, so things will stay again very similar. OXG start an attack, it makes sense. Ban out Defender, make the engines a bit easier for you to achieve, and then Asami. Ooh. DC, when they played Border yesterday, I don't know how you will counter strat that. I don't know how you will prepare for it, except for just prepare for aggression from Pambasu. That's the one big takeaway. But I think if you're Dark Zero, it's very easy to change up how you played Bori yesterday because of how chaotic it was. Like a, a lot of it didn't like make sense from like a top-down perspective. And without having the communication from Dark Zero every single round, I was like, I have no idea what they're trying to do. And it sort of worked and sort of didn't. So I'm very curious how Border will play out. I'm curious what OXG will do as like their counter prep work looking at yesterday's game. But there's always this kind of downside where when you have a lot of information as to how a team played Border or any map in the past, if you prepare too much for that and expect certain things to happen and then they don't, and Laxon touched on this very well, it comes down to mid-round adaptation. And I think that's been the big struggle for OXG in this stage, in that previous map, and in general. So we have ZOXG, again, energy up, feel better about the rounds that they win, and ignore the rounds that they lose, but most importantly, problem solve, problem solve, problem solve. This first opening round for DC, we're seeing the same thing that OXG did on bank. Good guns. DC, they want to fight, they want to give freedom. Paris was an Oryx. What better Orbiter than just like, go for gunfights than Oryx? Then you have Bolo on Dark. If Pembazoo wins a gunfight, but takes a lot of damage, guess what? Those Dark Stims brings him back up to full HP. And a good old stable, Canadian, on Solus, to deny information on those drones to make sure that they know exactly where that insult is coming from. Well, if you saw the matchup yesterday, you know how messy this can get and will almost certainly get. Dark Zero had that dog in them yesterday, even if it they didn't did. end up being the right result. <laughs> I did this. I mean, I'm not against them. I mean, DC normally play like what we call like slow or predictable, or some people call it boring. I find it quite interesting how they play. I like how they're playing more methodical and slow paced, but that was not what happened on border. So prepare yourselves, as always, if you're a DC fan, for a heart attack potential here. Over time, crazy rounds, you know, you, you know the gist if you're a long term DC fan. For OXG, hope for consistency. That's all I can say. It's a slow start though, Nomad and Brava and Twitch all being in action, or not Brava, 
No matter force and twitch being action means that Oshi gotta use her gadgets first, then start shooting her guns later. So this first half of the round has flown by, nothing has happened, but now Nurus is inside the building looking for a potential first engagement. Selma's tossed down, only one remaining in pocket for Dream is a very familiar spot, not far removed from customs. He loves to play that when he's on Maestro, whether he will opt for that operator in the same part of the map when they go to defense is anybody's guess. For now it's Canadian on the solos. He was playing a bit more sheltered on defense previously, but now will likely be more active. He's got to see that drone, right? That's <laughs> on top of the skylight overlooking lobby, like surely. Not so sure. Looks like oh, she might go for a horizontal take here. Just like go straight for the side because they're not the buff. Yeah, they're just straight in the bomb site. Hello, DC, wake up. All five players at DZ and not a single one. Currently situated. Nope, there down goes Gomez. Where is Nave? Newers' direction is somewhere else. They knew that this was going to happen. They box Dream into this position, and now Canadian will side to engage. That's the barrel of the gun. He's not doing any damage. What? He takes down Dream and can now hop on that diffuser for the counter disable. Newers might have a window of opportunity here, but Dark Zero is picking apart OXG. What? The only one left is Yaga. He gets a single kill, but the round goes to DZ either way. Okay, there are two ways we can break this down. We can go DC, they baited in OXG perfectly and had the counterplay and the retake and they won the round almost flawlessly despite the bomb going down in a 5v5. That's one story. The other story is OXG found the perfect gap against Dark Zero, got the bombs at 5 versus 5, got down the diffuser, but did not have the cover. Newers was inside a blue slash customs double door, and despite that, Canadian crossed right in front of him to take down Dream and to start counter defusing. And then Newers got distracted afterwards with the rumors of DC. I'm not sure which one is the real story, but one of those surely will be. So DC get the first round, and OXG again, they struggle with problem solving arguably in that round. They are very slow to the punch, and they don't necessarily fight back against DC. A 5v5 plan on border going down that's not a side rush is very uncommon to see. It normally just means that attackers are very unaware of what they want to do in that round, or at the very least, unable to find enemies. That's the kind of start you want to have if you're Dark Zero, just as we saw. Oh, yeah. Just as we saw in the previous map, DZ picked bank, OXG gets the starting side. They thought basement was the better side to go on, and well, they weren't wrong. They won two rounds when they were defending and were only able to win a single round on attack. As for border, DZ gets to pick the favorable side. They've already started off well, winning their very first round. And they did it on a bomb site that sees a fair bit of play. Border's an interesting one because it's the third least played map, technically tied for second least played map in NA with Cafe, so we actually don't have a lot of data on how NA likes to play this map. But tellers and bathrooms is really a bit of an anomaly. 91% win rate for the defenders. That is Ooh. an absurd win rate. By far and away, the most defender-sided bombsite that has more than just a handful of plays. You've obviously got Kitchen Barbecue on Skyscraper that it's at 100%, but it's only been played five times. The fact that Teller's Bathrooms is the second most played bombsite in this map, and you see those numbers being what they are, that's excellent. I don't know why Canadian re-aggressed, but almost takes down Newers. Newers reduced to a single point of HP. A stellar player for Oxygen. You need him if you're going to be outdoing these players on DZ, even though everybody else from OXG stepped it up today. One of those plays where, again, like, OXG is starting to get into the building problem solving, so Canadian going for the swing makes it easier for them. Now they go office, trying to isolate Pembasu instead. He's an Oryx, but again, Bolon ducks, stims him back to full HP. Now he is the anchor point. Everyone's playing around Pembasu on defense, and all the attackers are trying to take him down. Oh, he gets one, almost two. Well, I say almost. He actually didn't do a single point of damage to Dream, but the crosshairs were certainly close enough. That's a brief reset. Bolo holding on to two stim pistols. At any point, he can use those to get himself back up. Or his teammates, if somebody takes any form of damage. Right now, nobody from DZ has suffered a scratch. This could be tough. 
That's a very deep angle, caught the entire bomb set in half. There is one saving grace though. If Orcs steer too slow and start going for a plant, Nave is playing Echo once again, just like on Bank, and, and can shut it down immediately. They got five bees left on Grim. One more summer charge in pocket as well. So they can just do steer until go to that bomb side. And again, 30 seconds. This Yokai drone shouldn't stop the plant because OG, they have enough time. Dream just needs to wait for the go ahead. Gomez to watch from the door. NJR oh. picking up Yaga down below. Yaga's having a really rough day. I think he finished that first matchup with only two or three kills. Dream attempting the plant, Diaz and Gomez now to cover. The two new players will be looking in this direction. Oh. NJR down below, and the oh. extra cell will connect. Now it's Gomez's turn, lined up. There's still a Yokai drone on the board. Everybody's getting fed to the DZ show. That was an unpredictable end to the round, but DZ goes up 2 nothing. I'm looking at these rounds, and DC are actually playing very similar to what they did yesterday on Border, so... Assuming that Oshi watched those games and prepared for it, I don't feel like they have the best counter prep in front of them right now, at least showing us. How that round started out was Nurus and the Buck going into Passport and trying to, you know, clear Canadian from below, just breaking a small portion of the, of the floor itself. That doesn't work out. They spend half the round doing that. Then we saw Nurus walk towards bottom east and kills Canadian. But only because Canadian double swung Nurus. So Canadian didn't want that gunfight, could have walked back and just taken that little bit of a damage trade and get healed back by the dog of Polo, and that's it. So Canadian swings out, he goes down, makes it easy for RXT. Next up in line is Pambasu, but guess what? Pambasu only dies because Pambasu swings out, kills one, gets traded by the second. Every single time OHG progressed forward in that round, it's thanks to DC making a play into the attack. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because you have to be ready for aggression, and they were. But the reason why I do think that it's bad is that OHG are not really doing anything to make the round go in their favor, unless they're being helped by DC making that first move. It seems like they're just not entering the building, and nobody besides Nurus is making an active effort to get into a gunfight. And this is border. This is just like that old school like coastline. You have to fight it out. You have to brawl it throughout every single inch of that map because it comes down to gunplay. The only real exception, bombs that rushes. The glass, the blitz, the yings, the line, whatever. But that's not what Oaks are doing. They're not going for fast pushes. They're going for conventional across the map roam clears without really seeking gunfights. Gunfights are inarguably slower. But teams are adapting, and once again, we are starting to see things speed up. This is not the defender stranglehold on the meta that we had just a couple months ago. Mind you, gunfights were still fast then, but now changes to defenders have obviously made it so you can attack a little bit easier. Ambus, you learned that lesson the hard way in that round, and now Canadian will as well. As both have been picked off, though Canadian hasn't been finished yet. Might be retrievable. No dock on the board for DZ, so there's no way long range to pick him back up. Polo will be playing the same weapon, which is that MP5 with an ACOG. We'll be far enough back, but on Malusi this time. Down goes Canadian, finished off by Newers. So he's no longer available. Polo taking some damage as well. They're hunting him down. OXG far more formidable on this entry, Nick, as they've dispatched three DZ players and we're only halfway through the round. They're actually in the building. They're seeking engagements. They're playing aggressive. And they're just having one guy drone, one guy follow drone, get kill after kill after kill. This is how you play border. This is what we've been missing from OXG. And they might make this round flawless. No, they don't. Nave gets one kill. Looking for a second. Gets the injury, actually. He could save the round. He could. Now you need NJR to be the superhero as Dream is retrievable. And we picked up Lickety Split on that break room door. NJR yet to have a death, but... I'd imagine that that streak will come to a crashing halt in just a matter of minutes. Four players from OXG, all of them having a good day numbers-wise. Maybe not yet, though we're only three rounds into action. And JR is miles away from where this diffuser is going to be planted. And he'll get a call to head back to the bomb site, but he has absolutely zero intel. Find his first target, lose most of his HP in the process, and then dream after popping off that diffuser. We'll seal that round up and give OXG their first round win in quite a while, and only their fourth round win today. 
But that's the I think that might be the best round we've seen from OXG, both across bank and border, I would, I would even say. Like, I, would, I would go that far. They looked like they had a very simple game plan, and they all bought into that simple plan, and it worked out. Sure, Nave almost, you know, got a play there, got one kill and an injure, but also, again, immediately, OXG, they don't sit back, they don't rejoin the area, they go straight for the kill with multiple players together, and again, that is how you gotta approach these border rounds. Thing is, Bombs that rotation, that's the first three rounds being played out. So now DC can go for that same bombs that reset. Go back to where things started off on tellers. And now she gotta show us they can do this on the other bomb sites. The big benefit I would say is once you figure out border attacks, it's gonna work pretty much across the entire board. Because you usually do the same thing despite what bombs that you're playing against. You wanna take east stairs, you're gonna take security, you take top floor, and you go first floor. Or even if you go for a bit of more, like, different kind of take, less common, like with Sophomore XD, a horizontal Tellus attack, where you just, like, work the primary floor, again, you'll just walk in together in customs, work together throughout the map, and get those skills. So apply that same play style from XD into this round, and they might find more success than previously. David will find himself in a very familiar position. Silver top lobby playing on that Solus that was spotted at the very beginning of round number one. I don't know how long he's going to play in that position for, though. He was critical in shutting down Dream, was it? He was getting the diffuser down. He did so successfully when we were a bit stunned at the fact that not a single Dark Zero player was near or in the bomb site. Despite that, DZ still ended up winning the round and a beautiful retake. OXG finds themselves inside of the site alone this time. I suspect they will not pull the trigger on getting that diffuser down quite as quickly as they did because they know that DZ will be playing for the retake. Mm. Maybe we'll listen in and hear exactly what OXG is doing with this round. Another break, she went 90, 90. So let's 90. I heard. Can we, can, let's kill both. Let's kill both and CC. Heard? I opened up the mess. Okay. Keep playing the mess. I, I one plane armory. One plane armory. Shit on me. Shit on me. Get on my Bravo cam? Yeah, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it. I hear one I armory, armory. I hear one armory. armory. Yeah, he is, he is. He's by the door. He's... He killed me as soon as I got RPL. He's, he's going small, in small, Juice. I'm, I'm gonna go below again. I think it dropped. I think it, I think it dropped, Juice. Oh no, he's still armory, still armory somewhere. Still armory. Running out? Uh, ran, ran back to armory, right? Two armory, yep. Yeah. Yep, two armory. What do you guys want to do here? There's I think I just cleared CC. I'm pretty sure I just, yeah, they reinforced back archives. Sandwich? Or back fountain, I mean. I killed uh, Pamba, Pamba dead. Doc was sandwich, one was small, Diaz. Third, I'm holding this guy. Or I'm not putting up back fountain. Yeah, hey, there's, there's two armor right now, guys. Yo, one, I, I just heard one job. Do you guys have CC? You should play the walk in armor. I do have CC. Small, small. Nice. Doc ran small, Doc ran small. small. Nothing small, triple? He docked himself small. Yo, small fountain's clear, Diaz. fountain's clear. Swinging small. Right, no, no, no. Buck should have me, Buck should have me small. They have a Valkyrie on me. Yeah, he's still small, he's still small. Yo, get him camp two, camp two. Okay, heard, on it. Where'd he go? He I think he jumped he's back still, in. He's still in there. He's still in there. Hundred percent small. We're gonna, we're gonna kill this guy. Kill this guy. Hey, he's still in there. He's still in there. On the door. On the door. Shock him. Shock him. Drop. 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 He dropped. He dropped. Drop. 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 three. Yeah, I gotta go faster. Just kill the guy. We're yep. fast. Oh, we're gonna make You guys don't drop the hatch. Smokes too. You can bank smokes for the for the side draft. They're gonna be in tellers. You can bank yeah. smoke. I think you go quarter center, please. I think you're gonna have, yeah. Uh, maybe we kill the, yo, kill the tellers guy. I think that needs to be the goal. I, I'm, I'm just gonna wait, drop the head. We flood tellers, flood tellers, flood the tellers guy. I'm dropping with you. Black quick trap. You wanna trap plenty? I, uh, I have to, I guess. Yeah, he's gonna be in tellers though. I'm gonna get banked. Yep. Camba crashed. And his cam is frozen. Excellent. F. Excellently done by DZ. Pambazoo crashed, by the way, and his cam is frozen. We've lost Pambazoo. Breaking news. <laughs> Pambazoo has been summoned to the nether realm. You get, to, you get to put those comms together. I will say this. I, having no actual experience in-game at a competitive level, mm. tell you right now that... I can understand those comms, but to me, while they're intriguing, I don't get the same value out of them as I'm sure you do. In that round in particular, what was 
the main focus from OXG and where did it ultimately fall apart? I mean, it fell apart in the first five seconds of the listening because there was a quote, hey, let's go kill Bolo inside a CCTV, dot, dot, then you get headshotted from Bolo inside a CCTV, and that was really like the, the big stone that fell, or the first point rather that fell apart from the attack inside. But after Bolo gets the kill and then falls back to Armory, I hear a lot of callouts about there's a player here, there's a player there. I don't hear a lot of action from OXG. The first thing that happened when they went quiet, somebody said, what do you guys want to do? And there's nothing wrong with that phrase, but the fact that there's not somebody immediately saying, guys, this is the new game plan, this is plan B, that worries me a little bit. Because when you listen to a team like Dark Zero, when you historically go back into a team like G2, for example, there's always like, guys, this is the plan now. This is going to be the adaptation. So if you have plan A, hey, let's go clear security. Okay, you lose one or two players. Then we got to hear, okay, guys, let's fish for kills. Guys, let's go into armory. Guys, let's drop down and just like look for something else. There has to be some sort of action that leads you somewhere next. And that's what I was missing that round. I want to see the comms were bad because I thought they were quite good. But again, it didn't really have a clear roadmap to this is going to be what they want to achieve. And the round played out very similarly. They got to the bomb side, but they couldn't do anything with it. They didn't have man advantage, couldn't get down their plant. And we heard Jimmy himself say, guys, I know they're going to play Taylor's. They're going to wallbang me. We're going to lose. So that doesn't seem like a decisive, you know, we know what we got to get done and we know how to get there kind of round. It was a, we're going to try and figure it out, but it's probably not going to work. I am quite impressed that they know the players so quickly as to who's who and where they are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they knew they know that Bolo is going to be playing inside security they, or near break. You know, Pamazoo is yeah. going to be playing inside of office. Pamazoo, by the way, has returned. Woo! Breaking news, Pamba's back. Off that for him. I don't know if he had a hiccup sound. or not. His internet or maybe his PC crashed. I'm not sure. But What's the win condition for Dark Zero here on border? 3-1. I mean, They've picked up three rounds on defense. Obviously, I know you're going to say 4-2 first half for DZ. That's a no-brainer. But what's the win condition when they swap sides? So one thing that did very well yesterday was actually playing the Monty. That's something that we can start seeing where that can be a way forward into border. But if not the Monty, then I think it's just, again, you need to have it's just a game plan. I very much believe that Borders is a map where having five guys follow a bad plan is a lot better than just not having a solid plan at all. And again, we always gotta show or like talk about Canadian's leadership. There's always gonna be a plan. There's also gonna be a goal Cabin or purpose with the round. So I'm not too worried for DC on the attack inside in that regard. But of course, the guns have to hit their shots. And yesterday, Dark Zero depended quite heavily on Pambasu when they were playing Borders specifically. Pambasu has had an okay time so far. I think all players in the server has had an okay time so far, but no one's popping off. Dark Zero 3 and 1. I wouldn't even say that we should see DC go 4 2 because I don't think Border should be defender sided in the current meta in the game, by my standards, but in my opinion. Of course, this is region dependent, this is team dependent, operator band dependent, but I think going 3 3 if you're starting defense is perfectly okay. So the fact that DC are already up 3-1, it's like they can ride this out, lose the next two rounds, and it's still fine for them. It's up to OHC to really step up now and try and claw some of these rounds back and show us some signs of life. Because again, the energy levels, not looking great on bank when they started struggling. And this could be the same issue we could see from them going into, as we get deeper into this border, despite this being their map, they've not had the side that they wanted. NJR unsuccessful with both those impacts to keep that jail door, while well, jail wall in this case, open up, but now will function as an open door. That's very good value from the very first exothermic charge used by Dream. OXG's droning has been very good on border. They haven't had the same struggles that they did on bank, but again, as we say, just because you know where your opponents are does not necessarily mean that you're going to get a kill. Also, I've noticed watching these matches, a lot of people are asking, is Newer's standing? And it sure looks like it. Have we ever had a proper answer confirming whether he is or is not <laughs> seated? That's a good question, actually. Surely he's not standing playing footing, right? That would be... That's kind of look like it, though. <laughs> I don't know. 
That's a good question. He does look like he's standing. I don't see a chair behind him. The way he's leaning forward seems very unnatural. Also, good posture for sitting down, I guess. I don't know. We need to be straight back. Not quite game of posture. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain. Nobody's died yet. We're halfway through the round. Well, I might have spoken too soon. Newer's looking for one kill. Creeping up. Gets Canadian asserting himself. Inside a break room. Holds the way through the soft walls. The one thing for DZ is they've been very good at getting a pick or two, but then they collapse after that, and OXG can keep those numbers close. Only a single kill to be had, and OXG are back on the same footing as Dark Zero. One thing DZ did recently is that they played Hammer Suicide Security before, but then Bolo joined the server, or the team rather, and now they swap positions. Pammy plays more free rows out of office, Bolo plays easy TV. You watch Bolo's YouTube videos, a montage on Border, way back in the day, you know he loves this spot. He's playing here the entire round. He's 1v3 like, right now, he's still sticking around, he's not falling back. He has so much experience in this spot, and some spots in this map requires sheer hours to play them perfectly. Bolo is that kind of guy. Holding this pixel angle, lighting up Diaz. Down goes Naif, and no, Ooh. there's no she grabbing the lead. What did I say? A 5v3 lead that Dark Zero has established a few times in this matchup has really not worked out for them when it comes to keeping that advantage in their pocket. Well, she will now run against the time. They've got the advantage in numbers, but what about the objective itself? NJR in a position that hasn't gone droned. It's Diaz now to trudge his way towards the site, slowed down by one of those Banshees, and unable to even get close enough to pick up the Diffuser, let alone think about planting it. 4-1 for Dark Zero. They've won the first half. What happens in this sixth and final defense for DZ? Or even a better question, what happens in that sixth and final round for OHT on the attack? Because remember, attackers, they gotta make all the first punches, or at the very least, they're expected to. We've not seen OHT go for a rush, or like one of those like plant rush plays with like chaos effect, unpredictability, off pace, nothing. It's been very standard, expected kind of rounds from the attack inside. And every single team, they need a good anchor player to be a team that is like top class. And I think a player that gets kind of overshined a lot is NGR. We all know he's a good player, but he's just kind of there. It's Panda, it's Troy, it's Bolo, and even when Nave joined for invite, it's Nave, right? But I think NGR is the pillar of Dark Zero in so many ways, especially on defense. Because him being such a strong anchor player, an anchor player, what I mean by that, you play on the bomb side, you lock down the angles, you make sure nobody sneaks in, and in the late rounds, like we just saw on that Custom's bomb side, you just sit in that corner, holding the hatch, having sound and Thor, pick up two kills, and play keep away. You win the round for your team. And because you have a stable, consistent play in NGR that can do that kind of thing, it enables the aggression for everybody else. Because he is very often the sole player on this side on majority of maps. It's just a little bit of praise for NGR, okay? Not only is he six months scoreline, but he finds value every single round by making sure the bombs that stay safe. It is unrushable. Unless, of course, that is a strategy from the very beginning. Or she. This can change, but they are hovering glass right now. I want to see... It's gone. I want to see something like say that. say it, man. Just let it go. Just like... No, I, it I, out. I, I, I... Say it, and just, it's like they know, and then they change it. Spill it into existence. You said no one's died, then someone died. I'm... Okay, maybe I should do the opposite. I'm not seeing any glass, guys. Maybe go on it. I don't know. But I want to see or she just change it up. They've done the same thing five rounds in a row. This might be the six, and it clearly hasn't really been working out. And if you're if you're struggling like this, go for a cheese round. Go for a cheese play. A rush. Something that's impossible to predict, maybe. I don't know. Because otherwise, what's the point? Like you might lose regardless. Risk it all. DC could get a 5-1 half on border starting defense. That would be absurd given how attacker fit border has been in the past, even if it isn't right now. Nurus is playing the IQ primarily for the gun. You think there's more to it than that? Um, is there more to it than that? ADS speed, baby. That's what it is. So he is. It's just, a, it's just an entry operator. Gadgetry is not particularly crucial. It's for the weapons that are brought. Yeah. I'd imagine so. 
Still around here. I mean, they're in. So that, now they know the setup. They see the vertical angles. They're in at 148. Bog below is great, but... Okay, I guess they're gonna go on the break room door. CC window. Bog the floor. Force movement. Take off the roaming players from DC that are gonna be making too much movement. But it's Jason Bolo. Locking down that spot. Canadian falls first, though. Fighting Yawk downstairs. Yawk are having a significant improvement here on map two. Compared to map number one. Four kills to his name, roughly doubling his total from the previous map. Polo was unable to save Canadian from that spot, so we can use one of those stim shots from his pistol selfishly. Aflev have the cross. If there's a jump in, he's holding this angle, playing on the warden. But OXG don't want right now to attack from that armory side of the map. Instead, they're going to go through break room. They're going to punish over towards office. They're in danger of stalling out because they've got four of the five players not even in the building. The last one was Yaga that was last spotted downstairs. Now he's dead to Bolo, who's dropped. If OXG cannot get in the building, then this round might as well be over, Nick. That's what I mean. They get opening pig very early on. They do nothing with it. Okay, now they're going to side out of nowhere. Okay, I guess they're in. Bolo might have relied on NJR to get that kill. Nave sloppiness, oh. Dream dropped. It's box. technically a 2v2, NJR and Pambazoo, still upright, Dream. Probably not gonna be retrieved, but it's entirely possible. NJR has only died one back. time. He and Pambazoo will approach from similar areas. Pambazoo not going towards 90, instead will go through security. NJR has to wait out all these flashbangs, Newer's taking damage. Fuser will go down successfully, Diaz dies. The loop around, but somebody's prone on the ground. Pambazoo doesn't know this. He has no information and no nitro cell either. If only he knew it's a soft wall. Oh. Look down, go for the shot. He gets what? the read on it, kills him dead to rights. Newer's now the next one up. Oh. Oh. is sensational. Dark Zero take the first half, 5-1. How did he know? They had no cameras, no intel, the perfect read and the rotation as well. And again, we gotta say it, anger play. NGR, my man, locking it down once again, enabling the team. But OXG, again, opening pick. They get it done quickly. They build that early advantage. They do nothing with it. And then we saw them. They're so capable. They out of nowhere rush Armory Bombsite. They could have done it a minute earlier, 60 seconds. And they could have done it many, many rounds ago. I don't know if they lack the confidence or they feel locked up by DC, but whatever is happening, it's not good if you're an OXG fan. You got a 5 1 half on border, it's phenomenal for DC. It's been two weeks since OXG has won a series against a team here in the North America League. Now, it is worth noting that those first couple, uh, those, the first eight nine games were all best of one so it's a single map that you need to win on since march 29th oxg has only been able to muster a single map where they won chalet 7-4 against m80 just yesterday now on their own map they have a tremendously difficult task of going 5-1 and one to go to overtime. Now, it's possible OXG wins 6-0 on this second half and ultimately takes the series, or takes this map, 7-5, sending us to the third map in the series. But I don't know with the way that they've played today if OXG is a team that can win even four rounds on this second side. They only won three rounds on DZ's map. On their own map, they actually had a worse first half. Yeah. That is really not something that I expected. I think I speak for most people. When we say that OXG just have not shown up. The last week of the NA League, they lost to M80 8-7. The week before that, a loss to, or the, the match before that. SSG beat them 7-3. Before that, DZ beat them 7-1. Yesterday, they win Chalet and then lose the next two maps, 5-7 and 2-7. Now DZ could, in theory, 2-0 them. This round's already off to a good start, though, for Oxygen. They can take a bit of a deep breath. What? <laughs> it's Canadian. I thought you might have had a free kill. Doc now being harassed in this position. Gomez dies to Pambazoo. Canadian continuing to march towards Armory. Is there anybody there to deal with him? The answer right now is no. 
an equal 4v4 as Pambazoo looking for another mark. The Lion Scan goes out, Canadian being antagonized, taking matters into his own hands until Pambazoo is there for support. Flash go out, Diffuser going down, Canadians found the perfect spot. Diaz on the board for OXG this round, Newers dies. Pambazoo still covering, he's still got two of those death marks remaining. Canadian felled by the Nitro Cell. It was a very quick entry for DZ, and now the timer at the top is for the Diffuser, not for the round. Amazon Bolo, last two standing. Diaz taking a lot of damage. Oh, he blows himself up! Why did he do that? No! That's a huge blunder! Oh. with one onto Bolo. Now needs to find the second onto Pambazoo. He can try to long arm this one. Grenade tossed in by Pan, but Dream in a safe position, he thinks, but that's match point. Series point for DZ. Oh my, oh my, oh my. What is happening to Oxygen? That right there is how you control the pace and the tempo when you play border attack. And all it took for Dark Zero was a singular round. Now, you asked me, Parker, about three rounds ago, what I think DC should do when they go on the attack inside. I said Monty and Canadian, he saw that same opportunity. Because if you're a team who is methodically very slow paced, which DC they very much are, one thing that can really speed things up is the Monty. It allows you to just like extend the shield, walk in, and you have a very experienced in-game leader like Canadian as well. You can extend that shield and, and, and put 100% of your processing power into problem solving, decision making, and communication. And from the very beginning, there was a very clear, defined strategy approach in that round. It was a gun behind the Monty, smoke off the cross, and isolate the player security and get that opening kill. The moment they kill security player, they go straight to Armory. No slowing down, just like keep that speed up. DC definitely looking improved from yesterday and i'm sure playing two bo3s in that same time even though it's not exactly back to back took a toll on them as it would with any team but they had some rest it went over what went wrong and they certainly have learned from their mistakes that combined with osg not really showing off all that much individually or as a team has led us to this moment right now with these here up 6-1 Far from where we thought we would be. And DZ looking for a breakneck pace. We're 20 seconds into the round and they've already found a way into the map. This is in stark contrast to OXG just a couple rounds ago, waiting until the final 15 seconds to feel that there was some level of safety they could themselves enter. Amazu just narrowly missing out on a kill. He was 2-2 at some point on this map, now sitting at 8-4. He's just continuing to heat up and is the highest rated player on DZ for good reason. Or was, it might have jostled around. Maybe Nate's back in first. I'm not entirely sure. Certainly a good pace though. The entire team working very efficiently. Nate from the IQ spot out those Valkyrie cams. One gets shut down, one gets hit by Canadian. Default cam as well. So yeah, DZ in terms of like the map progress, they're not moving a whole lot right now, but they're taking care of the late round steps early in the round. So when the new stop moving forward, they've already dealt with the things that are in front of them. They still got one minute, 35 seconds to work as well. Outside the bumps at window, they have first floor control. The only blind spot right now for the attack is upstairs. So they might try and go for a straight bumps at take, similar to that of OHD. If they do go for it though, they have to make sure they got the right drones to the flank and the right guns watching those crosses so that nobody can retake from OHG. Nave is searching for something. They can't find anything just yet. Bolo close in hand through the smoke. There goes an impact. Down goes Diaz. Yaga Gomez. Could this be it for OXG's chances? They fought so hard, they look like the best team in North America for much of the stage. They fell off at the wrong time. Peaked too early, maybe you could even say. Mm. The round is far from over. Well, maybe not. Naif decides it is. And of course, it's the Brits sending Dark Zero to Britain. Dark Zero, Manchester bound. They don't even look excited. No real oh, celebration, man. nothing. <sighs> there was a tough path here. I mean, they didn't, I don't think they qualified the way they wanted to. 
wanted a cleaner cut to get there. And I gotta say, I thought for a moment yesterday that DC might not make the major after looking so good at the Sixmentational just in February. But then sometimes when things go the wrong way and you learn from your losses and you have those hard, uh, hard conversations rather as a team, that's where you can find the magic and get back on the same track and perform together. Oh, absolutely. OXG uh, are a cautionary tale for these teams at the top of the North American League because DZ looked like they weren't even going to make it into the top six. They were constantly trailing the big dogs of North America. And then all of a sudden, DZ squeaks in on the final play day. And now, here they are, one of the top three teams. I will say this about Dark Zero. They look downright dreadful a lot of days. But when they look good, they look great. And today, this is a DZ team that can genuinely make a deep run at Manchester. But of course, we say that not knowing all of the teams that will actually be present. North America will still send one more representative, just as Brazil will, just as Europe will. But these representatives will come through the last chance qualifiers. OXG will have to battle it out with Space Station, with Luminosity, with all the other teams down in T2, not Los. It's, it is a tragic result for OXG, but they come really close. But ultimately, the team with tons of experience, Dark Zero, ends up making it as the third and final team here in the playoffs. I know the Desker won't want to break that one down, and obviously we have the battle for NA with M80 and Beast Coast to fight as to who gets first in this region. Let's not slow down the show. We've been quite quick, and DZ set us ahead of schedule. We'll be right, bra we'll be right back after this break with more of the NA League.
I kind of hate to do it, but using one of the old adages right now really seems like it makes sense. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Even if the teams that qualified for Manchester ahead of Dark Zero are way different than anything else the North American League has seen, sometimes you just can't keep some orgs down when they're on a real hot streak. Dark Zero have now officially qualified for the Manchester Major. It happened really, really quickly in this series because OXG just didn't seem like they had very much fight to give, especially after we transitioned to the back. Yeah, I mean, you got to give it to Dark Zero. They showed up today. They were hungry. They were the ones who left their foot on the gas, where Oxygen, on the other hand, and again, I don't want to discredit Dark Zero's play, but Oxygen just did not look like the team that we were falling in love with at the beginning of this stage. Yeah, really disappointing from Oxygen. Obviously, wanted to see them come out here, win some more of those opening gunfights. There were a lot of power positions Dark Zero were holding down on border, where it really does just come down to winning your ones, and Oxygen struggled in that for sure earlier today. So that's seven of the last eight now for OXG. Five win streak, five maps, straight, looked phenomenal, made history. Now suddenly, seven of their last eight. This org is cursed. What the hell happened to this team? They fell apart in this series. I, I think it came into what I was talking about with Beast Coast before. It's kind of that, you know, you're, you're falling in love with the team. It's the honeymoon phase. You're having all this success early on. You made this roster change. You got Fox out. You're playing this new play style of Siege and you're starting out great and now you run into the problems. Now these problems are showing up. You don't know how to identify where you need to fix these mistakes. You don't know how to properly address the mistakes. And then it's just this endless cycle of mistake after mistake or misplay after misplay. And then, or the lack of energy for that matter that we just did not see here going into this matchup. Yeah, I don't even know if it's like oxygen regressing as much as it is like the start of the stage. They played a lot of the lower tier teams and even the teams that they played that did end up finishing quite highly. Well, they all maybe started kind of slow themselves and really improved. I think throughout this stage every single team in the north american league has gotten better has worked on themselves except for oxygen it feels like they've kind of stayed at the same level consistently having these problems where they're not able to adapt they're not able to win some of these opening fights they're not able to get a real hold on the game and it's frustrating to see for them and their fans i mean uh, i'm sure they feel it this 7-1 on their own map pick feels like kind of the real nail in the coffin like it doesn't get more of a statement loss than this. Yeah, and you can't just blame one person on no. Oxygen by any means. Losing a 7-1 in this series in general, that is a team problem, that is a team dynamic issue, whether that's comms, whether that's just not knowing the fundamentals, the adaptations that you were talking about, that is a team loss at the end of the day. Round one also felt like it kind of epitomized everything. It was the round that started the map and then completely set OXG up for a landslide. It was DZ thriving in chaos and OXG kind of not knowing what to do with an execute. Yeah, it was interesting here because you get Dream in here, great, you get the bomb, plant down but Canadian right here reads this and wants to go for this kill he ends up getting this kill here and then there's no one else on OXG that can help with the coverage here he's getting blocked by that that wall and then then they're trying to collapse on here and the rest of these is just shutting oxygen all around the map but no one else from oxygen is there to cover dream on that plant or even uh, even even when he dies like there's just no one in range to possibly assist there and it's just small things like that that could easily transition into a round one but again the energy from oxygen today just was simply not there yeah it's tough right because newers was in blue try to get the angle on it uh, to stop the disabled but he was fighting 10 different people at once to had absolutely no help it was a rough one coming through from oxygen and that definitely did set the pace for dark zero set them up for this beautiful 7-1 everybody on dz who may have had a bit of an off map one showed up on map Map two, so it means everyone on Dark Zero feels like they even out for the most part. And when we highlighted Panba, he woke up in both, or all three of these playoff series for the most part, maybe with the exception of the loss to Beast Coast, but everything really came together in the end. I mean, Panba on border, you just got to avoid him on border. If you know that he's on east or you know where he is on the map, maybe just take the entire team and go a different direction and then yeah. meet him, you know, in a possible 1v4. And even then, that's a scary situation because he's really showing it's Panba party time. And they just clenched Manchester. Panba party time. <laughs> Absolutely going to be partying in the UK. Absolutely. That's for sure. Let's talk to Troy Canadian real quick about this one. Dude, again, congratulations. You're going to yet another another major. I got to do a double check on how many you qualified for at this point because it just doesn't feel like another tier one land without you there. But walk me through this map band phase out of curiosity. You take Chalet out, you go for Bank instead. It's not a map that you've played very much over the past three months. And allowing Border to slip through everything. Walk me through what that mentality was through bands real quick. Uh, I mean, uh, we've been, obviously, uh, we've been banning Oregon um, against just about everyone. And then uh, we've kind of messed with the, the other ban that we've dropped in there. Uh, our last showing on Chalet was not the best. And uh, I feel like a lot of teams right now are looking kind of comfy on Chalet. Uh, yesterday, OXG honestly beat 
uh, M80 pretty cleanly on Chalet, and I consider M80 a pretty good Chalet team. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of said something, and I figured, well, they're going to probably pick between Border and Chalet, uh, whatever we leave up. So we decided want to leave Border up. We felt comfortable with it. Uh, we didn't think our showing against Beast Coast yesterday meant that much. It was kind of, you know, it was fifth map in a 10-hour day. Yeah. Right. So uh wasn't reading too much into that i think we made some very tired 2 a.m mistakes and that's just kind of the way it goes well i mean i think the 7-1 yeah. speaks for itself so for you troy i talked about you guys throughout this stage you guys were obviously having a very rough stage and i can accommodate that to being best of ones and not going into the best three but it looked like you guys really just kind of changed the fundamentals of how you guys wanted to approach these maps like what was the biggest hurdle for you guys uh yeah we definitely we definitely didn't come in playing how we wanted to play i think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and and we almost got crippled by like fear of making mistakes yeah. and fear to do something um and basically we just started playing confident simple as that um i think we still had some issues with it on attack uh that kind of came in yesterday but uh again i think partially uh, i don't know Yesterday was a ridiculous day. <laughs> well, this is going to be another. That's what I'm going to say. This is going to be another. Yesterday was a ridiculous day. So that, and then, uh, yeah, I think our defenses have been, like, insane. And your your uh, defenses so. have been, yeah, there's yeah. no doubt about that. I mean, just, I, no, confidence. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask. Explain with confidence. For sure. I was going to ask a follow-up <laughs> question there is, with the attacks, obviously, that's where you guys were really excelling at SI. You guys were finding those attack win rates and success. What's been the biggest struggle now regionally? Uh... I mean, like I said, I think the start of the stage was just like we weren't playing confidence, yeah. so that was like we were just stinkers all around. Um, and then later on, I mean, we didn't honestly we didn't even get that much opportunity to attack. Like our later games, we were actually mm -hmm. we were just smoking people. So it's true. Uh, I I I, th I think we're confident. We know how to pull pull through a couple. Obviously, on some maps more than others, but. I think uh, I think we're on the right track, and I think we've made some realizations of kind of what we need to do to to pull out, you know, the the few rounds that we need. At the end of the day, it's sure. super defender side of game right now, so you only need a few attacks, and we have some ideas of of how we want to kind of pull those out. So Canadian, you as a five man roster on Dark Zero are now heading to your second international event after going to Sao Paulo earlier this year. What's the thing you're most looking forward to? Other than winning the major, I'm sure that's gonna be priority number one. <laughs> but other than that, what are you looking forward to most about going to your second LAN event as a full five squad? Uh, I mean, just excited to compete again. Uh, excited to be together with the guys again. I think we have a, we have a lot of fun together. Uh, some great banter on the team and, and a lot of personality. We have a lot of fun together, so I think that'll be good. But I think we just all enjoy competing, so uh, we're excited to get there again. Uh, we had a great time at SI. We did boot camp before, too. We were there for like a month almost, uh, and we had a great time. Um, you know, it, it just kind of flies by when you're when you're kind of in it like that and playing against good teams constantly and improving constantly and all focused on, on the same kind of thing. So just excited to get back at that. Uh, you know, coming back online and playing a, a best of one stage, it kind of throws you out of the swing of things. Um, we kind of had to have a little bit of a wake up call to get back into it. So yeah, excited to just be just be in that zone. All right, you ready to feel old for a split second? I did, a, I did a double check on how many S tier land events you've been to since 2016. You ready for what the, what the number is? Sure. 21. No this is going to be wow. your 21st international is land. Is that number one? Ah, uh, I think that might be the most of anybody yet. It's yeah. gotta be. It's, it's gotta be. Like, the, like maybe Cameraman or Astro sneaks in there at some yeah. point, but even then, they probably are behind you by a little bit, because Brazil didn't get at it until later. So, I think you're number one in that regard, for sure. It's curious why, it's curious how people still don't think we're gonna make events. It's curious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's almost like you've done it two, huh. three, twenty times before or something. That's weird. Yeah. Why do I keep going? I mean, it's crazy that you guys haven't gotten medical bills from you guys' fans. <laughs> That's even more crazy. Very true, very true. Too very many people true. going in cardiac arrest. It didn't happen today, obviously. Much cleaner sweep. Congratulations on that. Is there anything else you want to say before we let you go, dude? Um, just thank you to the fans. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the people that continue to believe in us. Um, uh, I'll, I, won't, I won't say anything to the others. We'll let them rock. <laughs> um, but yeah, see you guys in Manchester. Excited to play, excited to compete. Uh, but yeah. Take care, guys. Good stuff to you. Congratulations. We'll see you in Manchester. Thank you. See you there. Dark Zero finally do it.
God, I was scared at the beginning of this stage. I didn't know if they'd actually be able to pull themselves out of the hole, but they did. Kudos to them for pulling that off. Sometimes it's just that simple that you're in your own head, you're scared to make a mistake, which is a very real thing. I'm, I'll tell you, it's a very real thing, but sometimes you just got to come in there with confidence and just play to the best of your ability, and then it gets you a title event in Manchester. Yeah, and that speaks to the experience of Dark Zero, right? He, we said it uh, on the interview. He's done it one, two, 20 times before. I like that, and now, <laughs> now they'll do it again. Um, good to see them pulling the back of the stage. Obviously, it wasn't the start they wanted, but they finish out so, so dominantly against Oxygen. You see the score lines there. 7-3 into a 7-1. Full control over this series. Absolutely put OXG in their place. Well done to Dark Zero. I think they are going to be a astounding force in Manchester. Oh. The big thing is third seed no longer falls down to a different stage in the majors because of the way that everything is now shaped up differently. And for Oxygen, it's a lot different because now they fall into a last chance qualifier bracket that is absolutely stacked. Sonics are already down there, Wildcard is there, Space Station and LG are both going to meet them after they play their match for fifth place that's coming up later. Everything about this for OXG says, man, we got to go through another three best of threes to qualify for something again. It's the same case for OXG. They start a stage hot, they can't finish a stage well. It's just the same story again and again. It's a tough situation to find yourself in, but at the end of the day, if you want to make this event, it doesn't matter where you end it at the end of it. You have to finish strong and make that make that run for Manchester. Oxygen have lost in back-to-back -back major LCQ semifinals so far all through last year. That's as far as they got, so we'll see if the curse can continues in a couple of weeks. I really got to hope that uh, Sonic's re-signing Grixer is not about to be their Achilles heel. We'll see how the LCQ goes coming up next week. But we're not totally done with our day yet. Number one seed from North America is about to be decided who walks away with even more guts, glory, and the crown of North America stage one champion between Beast Coast and M80 coming up next. sleep good you're just it, it's chalked it, if you don't sleep sleep well it, it's chalked simple as that no matter what i always wake up at 8 30 all the time always on game i don't care what time the game is always 8 30 take a shower eat breakfast because most of the days i don't eat breakfast but for that day i make sure i eat breakfast and I have a G Fuel that day. I never drink G Fuel, I only drink G Fuel on game days, that's it. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a habit, but I think I just watch a lot of other regions, like EU, Brazil, that kind of stuff. I do enjoy working out a lot. I feel like it helps me with my mental clarity, and it's kind of my yoga time, if you put it that way. It's kind of like, it's peaceful from my head. Just like physical health, like going to the gym, helps me um, kind of just reset every day, and it's good stress relief for me. Meditation, and just kind of going through and calming myself down, really digging deep, just calms you down before the game. So I would say meditation and the gym are probably the biggest two.
It's time to fight for the crown. The king is yet to be decided in North America. Our last match of the day is about to remedy that problem. Two teams who have already qualified for the Manchester Major looking to see who can claim the top spot, mostly because they've done everything to this point to prove that they are the best. And now it's about to be decided. Welcome back to the final game of North American League Stage 1. I'm Jacob. He's Laxing. He's Jesse. Just as a reminder, the last two times, the last time these teams played, this was Beast Coast 7-1 over M80 on Oregon, and now we're about to see them go into a best of three context. So one-sided landslide, or is this one going to be close? Uh, I want to say this one's going to be close, but this is a little bit of bragging rights, right? You get first in NA, you get some more prize money, but most importantly, those SI points. 100%. I mean, these are two squads who have obviously been at the top of their game. Lots on the line in terms of SI points and prize money for sure, but they're both going to Manchester, so they don't have the same pressure yeah. that Auction and Dark Zero had coming into their game earlier today. I think they're both going to be fighting as hard as they can for this one, but if they lose, it's not like that crushing devastation, which is probably what Oxygen are feeling right now. They're not playing for that much of a SI point difference. They're fighting for five. Because 95 for second, 100 for first. That, that's that the main matter, difference. Jacob. Definitely make a difference. <laughs> Sometimes. You never know what it's going to come down to end of the year. It's the prize pool increase that really matters the most because first is $62,000. Third place ah, is only $30,000. at the wrong time. I was going to say, dude, what's wrong with you, man? Honestly, I couldn't even get that. I got last place. Dude, you, so. left, you left at the wrong time because, dude, the game is so much better these days. Why'd you quit when you did? Yeah. Because he wanted to be with us on the desk, I Jacob. I you guys. And now life That's is so much better as a result. Let's jump into this matchup. It's M80 and Beast Coast, which is nuts already to think that Beast Coast are the number one team in the league, but that is where we stand. They defeated Dark Zero at the back end of yesterday, 2-1. to one one to claim the second overall spot for North America in Manchester. And again, I'm still reeling and really proud of these guys for going that far. These guys just feel like they want it. I don't know, man. Gunner and Diffuser in particular have been putting up ridiculous numbers. Diffuser's always been a little bit more back lines, a little bit more passive, really good at survivability. Gunner has been the guy popping off, singing in their matches, going out of his mind to carry Beast Coast through some of these ridiculous rounds. He has been so fun to watch and so explosive for Beast Coast. The whole team just looks so, uh, so well together. They're gelling incredibly well through these last couple of matches, and they've been unstoppable through, the, through these last Last, I mean, how many games is that they've won in a row ignoring that one DZ match? I mean, they've been on fire. Yeah, I mean, this, and we talked about their map pool specifically. They have the best map pool in all of NA for a brand new team, which I think, again, that heavily favors into four veterans that came from very strong rosters. And that alone, that sets you up for a lot of success, not only in your own regional, but then going internationally now into Manchester. We're about to make a comparison that when I saw this come up, I was a bit stunned that it was these two players in particular that we wanted to talk about. Talking about Spoit is par for the course, but talking about Gunner versus Spoit. Uh, well, Lax, tell me where you're going with I mean, this. I wanted to talk about Gunner specifically because in that interview yesterday, he said people were saying that he was quote unquote shit. Right. And then we see him yesterday and he was absolutely looking like he wanted Manchester more than anyone in that lobby. Not to say that nobody wanted it, but the performance that he was putting up, the gunfights that he was taking, the confidence that he was displaying in that match throughout thick and thin would clearly indicate why they're popping up in Manchester. Wow. 
Homie's dropping a 2.0 KD mm -hmm. in pro play and beats Spoit in most stats categories. Look at that. I, obviously, I just got to say, Spoit is the best player. We did talk about this. He did get stage MVP, but Gunner is in the runner for this. I mean, at least going into this head-to-head, -head, Gunner is definitely putting up the numbers to support that. Yeah, yesterday, obviously, ridiculous performance. 2.0 KD, as you said, Jacob. He's really been popping off to aggressive players who are incredible in really tough moments in tight spots when most players will be faulting. They're the ones stepping up for their team, so I think it's an apt comparison. Well, we also need to recognize M80's accomplishments because, again, they were the team that lost the least amount of games through the round robin. Come in, storm their way to victory as the first team that was able to qualify for Manchester just last night. And, again, it's very difficult to find things to fault this team for doing wrong. Absolutely. We talked about Beast Coast being the most improved roster, but M80 has by far been the most consistent roster. This is a roster that looks like they're just improving every single day. You really can't fault them on anything. All five of these players are all standout players and all play a very pivotal role for each and every single one of these guys to be finding the success and now finding themselves at major and also a possible shot at being first place overall. Yeah, I think these guys, again, as individuals are ridiculously talented. It feels like any single player can pop off and have an insane moment, but you can't downplay their team play as well. Their uh, ability to work off each other on their own. We've seen it throughout the stage, from the early rounds, the late rounds. I really think that this team has been finding success in all aspects in terms of their defensive roams, but also on attack. It's tough for, for M80 to find all those faults, because as you said, Jacob, they've just been so consistent throughout the stage. Kudos to whoever is the general manager on M80 for having the balls to decide on the players that they brought into this stage because Noodle had a little bit of that GK experience and thought maybe he's a good fit because he's playing with Spoit, trying to bring Kino back into the fold. But I also just think that getting the guy who was third overall rated at the sixth invitational is just kind of a cheat code if you get the chance to bring him in. It really is. And Citizen powers up at these really tough moments. He's been the guy who has stepped up the most in these playoffs. He has been dropping ridiculous KDs, map after map after map. We're calling Spoit the MVP because Citizen was maybe a little bit quieter, had a few off games through the group stage, but my god, it just feels like he's playing with wall hacks on some of these rounds in Pro League, but the information is that always right being fed to him. He knows exactly where to look. His reaction time is absurd. He has been my favorite player to watch throughout these last couple of days for M80. He's been so consistently good in the early round when he needs to hunt out and trade these roamers in the late round as well. He has always been stepping up big for the squad, so you gotta shout out Citizen. He's been playing so well recently. Absolutely, and it's the intuition for me from as a player standpoint is he just always knows the right place. And I don't, I, I never get that lucky. I can never come behind three people and I flank people all the time and he can do it just walking down a main staircase that is typically watched. But again, the intuition that comes from Citizen is so important for his role and what he brings to that roster because not a lot of players have that and that's not something that you can teach. Yeah, and take a look at the stats. The difference between the group stage and the playoffs is ridiculous. 28 increase on the EPS. Wasn't bad during the group stage. Still plus seven, but the absurdity of his stats going into playoffs, just ridiculous. Love seeing that out of Citizen. Both Beast Coast and, and M80 also have this one thing that I think is super important. They understand that when their chips are, are down, their backs are against the wall, they both know how to adapt. And I think specifically for this matchup, that's probably going to be one of the focal points. We talked to both of them before this game started about who is going to take the number one matchup in the NAL. I'm happy with how everything went down in the playoffs. I mean, the last game against OC was a nail biter for sure. A lot on the line. Yeah, but just happy, you know, to that this this new project, like this team, you know, in such a short time made this made it this far into the into the bracket and playoff and everything. So yeah, he's happy, yeah. To me we played awfully. To me there's a lot to fix. Um, I am obviously elated, absolutely overjoyed that we made the major and I'm so happy that everyone worked so hard to get there, but it only shows that we have so much flaws, and I'm glad that it shows that we have so much flaws to fix uh, before going fully international. I think the team's excited to go international as a first time as a team. I think they, you know, they they, they see the potential of each other, they love each other, and they see the you know the long term progress. But for me personally, I want to show that I can be one of the best coaches in the world. I want to go out there and absolutely dominate these other coaches. I think they know the game. Our first game against Beast Coast uh, earlier in this NEL stage was quite a surprise on our end. We, I feel like we prepared too much, if that makes sense. Sometimes you just got to let the defaults, uh, you know, do its thing. You got to trust, you know, like focus more on yourself rather than the enemy team. And I think that's the trap we fell into that game. We focused too much on them rather than us. And I think it clearly showed as well in our gameplay. We were kind of, you know, kind of hectic. I think it'll be a lot tighter of a rematch. Uh, that first game, honestly, we just, we completely overtook them. We were having a great day and they were obviously having a horrible day. I think they, they were able to learn a lot from that, right? And I think they're gonna come with that absolute fire and heat. 
I would completely welcome them to try to counter shot us because we're ready for absolutely anything. Oftentimes, it's the players themselves who are talking trash, saying that they want to be the best in the world. But to hear Fett, a coach, a back-end guy, say that he wants to prove that he knows the game better than any other coach, he's made a pretty good statement because of where his team sits right now, but that's still a bold statement nonetheless. I, I was going to say, that's the first time I've ever seen a coach get that aggressive on an interview. It kind of yeah. made me think like Fett was in the lobby playing for one of these guys the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. But, I mean, that's the competitive spirit you want from your coach. Sure. Everybody all in on uh, getting to win. And... I mean, interesting what Fett's decisions have been through this map band phase. They're actually going to go through and uh, let Clubhouse be picked by M80. I'm a little bit surprised by that. Just with the fact that this on paper is uh, Beast Coast's worst map. They've lost it twice, 0-2 so far. M80 the flip side, 2-0 through the stage. A little bit surprised they let that one go through. I'd expect it to be banned out alongside Skyscraper, which tends to be their perma ban. Um, but they go for the cons ban instead, and then they can go and pick up Labs. Yeah, looking at Labs is also interesting for me. Obviously, both these yeah. teams have VODs on each other. But what's interesting for M80 to let this through specifically is I don't think Oxygen really put up the performance that we wanted them to against M80. So it kind of sure. gives that false confidence that you feel your Night Haven is a lot stronger than what it actually is and make it exploited like how they did versus Sonics. I will say, though, I mean, new team, but even old M80 was great at Night Haven Labs. True. They're undefeated in organization history on that map. So it should be exciting for them to have two pretty strong ones coming up right off the bat. And then, of course, we end on Shelley, a classic of the North American League, one of my favorite maps to watch. M80 loved that map. We saw them play just yesterday. I think this map favors both teams going into that decider. I think it's really going to come down. I think both teams can possibly maybe win each other's picks or sure, you're going to yeah. win on each other's picks. Obviously, that goes without say. But I do feel more very confident that we are going to see a third map between these two teams. This goes will be starting on defense on both of the first two guaranteed maps that we play in this series. Gentlemen, one final time, just because you might want to get that percentage up just by a tad bit more. Who takes this bad boy? Who is the number one team in the NAL going into Manchester? Uh, I just, uh, honestly, like, I just got to, I'm looking at the 51% realistically. If here, that drops gotta, any more, yeah, you're got, out. Yeah, I got to stay high. Um, <laughs> I've gone with Beast Coast so many times that this time I'm just going to have to say M80. I'll switch it up. I think Beast Coast got it. I think they could come through here and get the upset. I think M80 certainly looked good in that map band phase. Yeah. I really like those maps for them. But, you know, I think we need some spice in the death. Let's go for Beast Coast. <laughs> Make things even harder for production to be like, yo, whoa, what are we doing? You said something before. At this point, the belt's gone. It no the longer matters. Gone. The belt is already going to Fox A. But as far as we're concerned, we don't know who's going to Manchester as the number one team. Beast Coast and M80 fighting for the NAL Stage 1 Championship. And it's Parker and Pengu to take us through it. Well, thank you very much. And the kings of NA, dare we say the best of the West, are in front of us. A team that didn't even exist four months ago is suddenly going up against an organization that was in the league, but another team that didn't even exist four months ago. Not even two months ago, frankly. M80 didn't like their results at SI in Sao Paulo. So they blew up the roster and they imported players from all over the world. Beast Coast decided to go with a more domestic approach. It is a little bit funny, and this was pointed out on social media, Nick, that a great deal of these Beast Coast players were dropped from teams that are yeah. not going to the major. Gunner dropped from SQ. Gunner's going to the major now. Hot and Cold dropped from Space Station. He's going to the major now. If DZ had failed to qualify, Gavin would have been going to the major when Dark Zero wouldn't. So these players might not have been integral to their teams at the time, but a team is more than just the sum of its parts. And when you move those parts around to other teams, good things can happen as you see with Beast Coast. Despite that, despite the fact that they're the number one seed coming into this match, the community says with 69%. Nice. That it's going to be M80 taking it. Who will be the best team in North America? We've got two, maybe three maps. To determine this, we'll start on M80's pick of Clubhouse. The big surprise, of course, is Beast Coast. We saw them the first goal play this, and I was thinking, you know what? What is this roster? They're not performing very well. This is never gonna work. And then, I think it's like their fourth game or something like that. They were basically the best team in North America, and they have not slowed down ever since. And legitimately, they could beat M80. This is not like, a, oh, you know, they made it this far, but now they're gonna lose. No, 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 no. Beast Coast could take it all. And I think this is a great map to start things off on. I love Clubhouse. It's one of my 
It actually may be my favorite map currently in the game. So I love seeing it. I love seeing a high level of clubhouse. It comes down to your strategical approach, executes, but also I think it tests pretty much everything from a team. Oregon is like your core fundamentals. You know, the very basics, droning, get in the building, crossfires. But clubhouse tests that, plus your strats, plus your executes, plus your adaptations, and counter stratting. It's a very strategy oriented map. East Coast starts in the basement, but looking at the lineup, looking at their play positions, they might have a bit of a roam going on. The Mute and Castle of the Solace, they signify that they're going to get active. They're going to play across all three floors, top floor, primary floor, and then of course the basement bombs at itself. And maybe they have to counter. They're going to have two options, either contest the roam clear, go upstairs, pick them apart, or hit the bomb site directly. That's pretty much the gist of it. Maybe they're going to play all those power operators. For a second, it was going to be the Capital, but last moment there, Kino goes with Jackal with spot on demos. So this very much is an anti roam clear from them. It really will be fascinating to see Beast Coast at an international event. You and I weren't casting yesterday, so we didn't get to see, or rather, we got to see it. I watched the match, but we didn't get to cast East Coast making it. There's a part of me as a caster where most of the time I don't really care what I cast. I, I'm, I know you are oh, in the same care? mindset. Oh. What? oh, yeah. Oh, no, I get you mean. It's I'll cast whatever match. I'm not picky. I'm not going to go out of my way to request a certain matchup. But getting to see a new team slash yeah. new org, even though Beast Coast's been around for a while, when you see them qualify, well, that would have been something that would have been special. And I kind of wish my voice had been associated with it. But in this case, my voice and your voice, because I'm not just trying to make everything about myself, Nick. Mm -hmm. It's going to go towards this matchup in particular. So while we don't get to send them to the major, we at least get to know which team is the best in the region. And I'm immensely proud of M80, who have been playing here in Toronto, just down the street from me. Hometown boys, I like to call them. Gutter died early, by the way. He had a great day yesterday. A rough start to this matchup. Same with Cameraman. The yeah, exothermic charges will be no more. The Thermite, dead at the hands of Beast Coast. It makes it one for one trade. No team comes out ahead. It's still a four versus four, but I really like how Mady got that opening pick. In case you didn't see it, it was two players on the office hatch in the roof. One person proning, holding the office door. The other person, of course, popping that hatch open. And it's just a very small, clean, mini execute, if you will. And I think it's a Mady they excel at. They're very good at doing these very small things together to put themselves in strong positions. Also worth noting, they dropped the diffuser on the roof. So even if Cameron died in the entry, defenders didn't know they had the diffuser case in control. And yes, it does mean that Kino had to rotate a little bit, waste 10 seconds to go to the roof to pick it up again, but it just ensures that the defenders they can only go back towards the bomb site. That's what Beast Coast, Coast did. It's gonna be playing out 4v4. Citizen, pop it open those hatches. Wow, Got Kino and Jackal can scan out one defending position. And you have Spoiled on Deimos, who can track a second defender as well. So very quickly, maybe they could find out two of the four exact player locations and then go for a 3-2-1 bombs at execute with Intel. Application of Deimos is something that I always like to try to make mention of because teams approach this operator very differently, whether you use one of those death marks earlier instead use it at the tail end of the round. Oh, Spoit's gonna just barnstorm on in. He's lost Kino. What? Attempting to turn around towards Blue. Now through the fire, Noodle will trudge. Almost retrievable, but he can't get his teammate up in time. No, no, hot and cold. We'll pulverize the last two players from M80 and Beast Coast takes the first round. Going to fire, it's always a big problem if you are either slow on the attack or just too many things happening in that round. And I think just that Beast Coast, they stalked the room for as long as it did, finding that one pick onto Cameraman, it really slowed down the attack. And of course, we saw the effect of it. Also, the four versus four defenders, not gonna worry all too much. They can lose one player. It's not the end of the world. But after that first round, we'll get a quick technical pause here before we will resume. But Beast Coast very much looking like they are here to play. Of course, same can be said for M80. They had a great start to that round, just not a great finish. Curious as to what tech pause is at play here, but I mean, nothing really jumped out about that round in particular. 
That's a nice entry kill from M80 answered back by Beast Coast. This is a term that we've started to introduce into our casting and that's sticky. Sticky teams are teams that always seem to trade out when you get the first or second kill and then they trade it right back. And it's very challenging to establish a lead in any given round. Great example of this would have been you. I mean, your team was probably the first team that really, I, I hate to say this word, but it's true, revolutionized trading in this game. There was a period of time in the tail end of SI through Atlantic City over the Paris Major and onwards, where it felt like every time you killed somebody on Penta slash G2, there was another player within a second to kill the player who killed you and equalize mm. those numbers. And that's very punishing to deal with. W7M roster, now known as Furio, are another team that have really excelled in that regard. They're almost always playing together. And it really did start to shine when they were playing so aggressively on defense. Yeah. I feel like Beast Coast is a team that tends to be in a similar position, but obviously they can't realize the same success with it because they are still so new. But give them enough time, and this team really does gel well. On both attack and defense, the Beast Coast roster likes to play together. For the most part, maybe Gunner is the one player who often is on his own. If you find one player on Beast Coast, you're probably going to find another very quickly. And a lot of times it's not going to be in the direction that you want that fight to go in. Yeah, and I think the, the impressive thing about both Beast Coast and MAT as, as teams is that I think the ceiling, the potential is very high as well. I'm not thinking that, oh, you know, this current Beast Coast is the best they will ever be. I mean, first of all, the team just, you know, was just created, same for MAT, but also I see so much more in the future if they play together for longer, if they stick the roster and get in like more LAN experience. Um, you know, this being the first major for them as a team, and even for the Orc of Beast Coast. But also, to go back to the point about trading, back in my day in Penta G2, we, we had this rule that was called the One Room Rule. And it meant that you could not be further than like a two or three second sprint away from your closest ally when you're going for the entry engagement. That's like the simple way to explain it. And that's what we see now that pretty much every single pro team they do. You ideally want to have one person leading the charge, that's called an entry. And you have a second player shortly behind called the second entry. And if you make a mistake and there's too big of a gap between A, like one and two, you will have somebody die and nothing comes out of it. No trade, no refrag, no you know map control is lost as well. You're in the dark. And the best teams in the world, they will have a small enough gap but you will not die to the same bullet by your opponent, but you'll be close enough to actually do something about your teammate's death shortly after. And that's the kind of rule that we implemented back in like 2017, 2018, and it's an iteration, an adaptation that we see that every single team they use today, because we've all learned, we've all gotten better with time. The one conversation that also tends to happen around whether or not, you know, that Penta G2 roster is the greatest team to ever play, or if you want to make an argument that this new Furia roster is, I mean, I, I don't think it's a controversial thing to say that the quality of matches that were occurring in 2016, 2017, 2018, when you and your team was at its heyday... 2019 as well. No, sorry? 2019 as well. You forgot 2019. Uh, yeah, of course. You won SI and then did nothing for the rest of the year. My bad. You right. SI is a pretty big deal, man. What happened at Milan? Uh, we, I didn't even watch it because I was so angry that I, we failed to qualify. Mm. <laughs> I actually don't know what happened in Milan. Right, what happened at Tokonami? Uh, same story, didn't watch it because I was too mad I didn't qualify. What happened at SI the next year? We got invited out of pity because we failed to qualify. And then what happened? We got slaughtered by Fnatic, which was a joke of a team because they were APAC back then, even though they're actually pretty decent. And in IP, we should talk all year, then send us home. It was karma. Okay, so we're going to forget 2020. Yeah, we're just going to yes. talk about 2019. Thank, yeah. you, thank you so much for... Or sorry, we're going we're gonna to forget 2019. We're going to talk about 2018 because in 2019... No, don't take it away from me! No, I'm taking it away from you. Okay, can we go back to Milan? To that the quality of those matches, though, to get back to my point, are okay. far worse than the quality of the matches we have now, right? Teams have improved. Teams, the, me the mechanical skill of players. You know, I remember back in the day when people were like, Jonas, the best mechanical player to ever touch this game. Yeah. And now it's like, there's a Jonas on every team. Yeah. If not, if not more multiple. Than yeah. <laughs> so when you look at where we are as a game and you talk about that Furia team, 
It's important to note that even the worst... I was going to say even the worst players are better than some of the better players back then, but, I mean, that was a head-scratching altercation with Gavin and Kino. Yeah, 2017 Penta would have not died to that angle, just saying. 2017? And 18, and 16. 19 might have. 2020 definitely would have. <laughs> definitely. Definitely would have lost to that angle. Oh, that's, that is a un very unfortunate first player to lose. Because when you look at a Capital, application for Capital, you're going to put those fire arrows up on the rafters. You're going to use those secondary hard breach gadgets to put some presents in the garage. None of that is going to happen now. Oh, yeah. That's the issue. You got to pivot. You have to go for a master bedroom jacuzzi site, roam clear into construction take. But the issue is we see there's a setup on the roam there. Mirror windows, two roamers from Beast Coast. They are very much prepared and ready for that take as well. There's a loose, loose situation for Medi. They got to just like go in there, adapt and get those gun kills because they got no strategic approach to this. Boyd's just gonna run Wait, right what? in. Gavin looking the wrong way. Still in the same position from where he killed Kino earlier on. Gunner will be the fail safe right now. Lying prone on the floor of the stairs. On cold dies, Diffuser trades it right back. And what did I say about Beast Coast being this sticky team? Diffuser. As Diffuser, he's been drawn out of this position. He's turned his back to the breach. Hammerman dies to spirits. This could have been a pick on a Diffuser. But those evil eye cams position so well. The maestro or whomever on defense can watch this. Spoits the last one standing. Being watched quite so intently and good gunners on the side of Beast Coast. You need to fear them no matter what, but when you give them intel, they're going to punish you with that information just as Gunner does. It was a bit of a lengthy delay between the rounds, but Beast Coast have not cooled off one bit. No, they've not. The thing about Beast Coast is that they got, they got good players and, and like individual skill, gun plays, decision making, but also strategically, they have shown so much, again, depth and potential very early on. They play CCTV, and unlike most teams, they don't just commit to, let's just hold garage and then let them attack master bedroom side. No, no, they hold catwalk garage, and they also extend to master bedroom. Now, the extension itself didn't do all that much. They got picked apart very quickly, to my surprise, but the gunplay and the trade game afterwards very much favored the defense. Because the attackers, they might get one kill. Guess what, Beast Coast, they get two. Attackers get more one kill. Well, you just get two more. There's nobody attackers there. Round is over. Like, it's it's really that simple. Beast Coast now, looking at that perfect bomb site rotation for three in a row. Started downstairs basement, CCTV, both successful. Now going to gym bedroom, and would you look at that? They are, surprise, surprise, extending once more, fighting for map control, going to slow down a midi, but also, again, make them problem solve every step of the way. The more problems you put into your attacker's path, the more decisions they have to make, the more options there are for a potential error or a gap to be exploited. And they're gonna go one step further. They're actually bandit trick and CCTV extension, and then also putting Gunner on Asami on Catwalk Raptors. They're adding that another layer to this while still having the purple shield in top red, having mirror windows on the bomb side. So, no matter which direction MD will attack from, the exact bomb side direct approach or for the roam clear, it'll be met again with trouble and difficulty. Fortunate vintage Kino performance to start this map. He's had a, almost like a second life in this game with the changes that M80 made. Kino is looking far more comfortable on the squad. He's on hard breach duty for the moment, so it's imperative that he survives late enough into the round to get that hard breach gadgetry deployed. Boyd entered the day as the number one rated player in North America, Citizen in fourth place. Spoit at an eye-watering 152 kills. The next closest, Citizen at 129 kills. The next closest after that, 112 in the hands of Naif. So quite a drop off. After that, it drops down to the, the hundreds. It's like flat out 100, it's like 107, which is Ashen. So Spoit is a full mm. like 50 kills above the player in fifth. When you look at somebody like Kino though, would it surprise you to know that he's actually middle of the pack? He's the third highest rated player oh. on this team. And while his numbers aren't positive, he's been playing utility roles 
and he's been killing enough that he's close enough to even. He strikes first in this round, taking out Hot and Cold, who has looked very good himself. That's a big loss for Beast Coast. They get the kill back. Again, this stickiness. Kino dies. Down goes Spoip to Gavin. East Coast still holding for the time being this cash portion, but Citizen will trade it right back. Both of these teams very well positioned to keep these numbers close. Cash wall has not been penetrated just yet, and boy, oh boy, Diffuser, who's having a great debut in the NA League, just continues to apply as much pain as humanly possible. Mandela goes off, Diffuser in the corner, and he somehow what? wins it either way. Unpredictable gunfight breaking in his favor. Hammerman still stopped in this position. Diffuser is holding Pat. Hammerman has no information, walking right in. He's the last one standing from M80. It was spoiled before, but now Cameraman will search for his first kill. Five seconds left. Running out of time. Will he even find it? Yes, Diffuser caught mid-rotate. But again, a trade from Beast Coast. Even when there's one second left and you've won the round on time, you still are close enough to do serious damage and get those picks. Beast Coast looking indomitable, and it does not surprise me in the slightest that M80 will call their timeout going down 0-3. I think M80, they've been suffering from being too good in this stage. What I mean by this is that in most games they've played so far, that exact attack would have worked. Just like simple, four people CTTV, brute force through a single doorway. But against the best teams in the region and the best teams in the world, you know, going to the major, for example, of Manchester, you're gonna have to do another step. Which, for example, a buck below, a little bit of verticality, or get the hot breach destruction on, you know, on the walls earlier in the round because they were stopped by a single jammer. And then they just, again, they just swung one door. Guess what? Beast Coast, they win in the individual gunfights and they rotated manpower for the crosses as well. So, and maybe you're not doing enough in these rounds on the attacking side. They're trying to simplify their approach. And again, that will go punish against better teams. And that's exactly what happened in that round. Beast Coast, they will live and they will die and fight for the extension because they don't care if time is running low. Beast Coast are defending. Time favors them. The more time they spend wasting Mady's time on the um, roam clear, so to speak, they're happy with it. And Beast Coast could have just like ran back early in the round, but no, they stick around. They fight it. They don't give Mady anything for free. So yes, I agree with you. A great time to, to take a technical timeout for Mady because you had to get a different strategic approach, got a problem solve more effectively, and just to think again, do a little bit more, have another layer to use attack in rounds, and don't oversimplify them. Five seconds left. This is map pick, by the way. For those Proof. that don't maybe have a visual indicator in front of you, if you look at the top right of your screen, you'll see the three maps that were selected. If those icons and images are a little bit too small, well, allow me to read them out for you. M80. Picked Clubhouse. Beast Coast gets to start on the side that they choose. They opt to go on defense, and for good reason so far, they're up 3-0. Even though it's not their map, they picked a comfortable side, and they seem to be doing quite a good job with it. Next up is Night Haven Labs. That's Beast Coast's choice. Beast Coast continues to roll the way they are. It could be a quick 2-0. Chalet is the decider. M80, after taking their time out, have said, you know what? If they're going to play downstairs, let's breach into this site as quickly as possible. Proximity alarm's going off. There's the sense to throw out a wall that cannot be seen through. Goodbye, citizen. Goodbye to Spoit. Goodbye, Noodle. Goodbye, the opportunity. But... Still, Kino gets the diffuser down. Cameraman miles away from the bomb site, and Kino's dead, so it's all up to Cameraman in a 1v5. Aww. This is a round that I appreciate what they were trying to do, but it just didn't work out. Beast Coast reads into it well. Gunner's looking the wrong way. Cameraman getting his second kill after taking down diffuser in the previous round, but both of Cameraman's kills will be impactless. For a team as good as M80, this has been a dreadful start. And honestly, it's not M80 playing poorly. It's Beast Coast playing the game that they've played all stage. And it's about time that we start putting some respect on that name.
and it comes down to small details. I think one very simple, very small piece of utility actually made that round so much easier for Beast Coast. A piece of barbed wire was on the dirt door. So when Kino jumps the barricade with the blitz, he is slowed down significantly. He can't sprint the barbed wire anymore. And instead of taking maybe 20% of his health by the Goya Fire, he takes about 80% of his health in Goya Fire. And the players behind him, same story. They take way too much utility damage. They can't rush the actual bomb site because there's a barbed wire there. When you go for those rush rounds, you, you know there's gonna be a Goya Canister. We all know it. That's how you play basement defense, right? That's expected. You don't expect the barbed wire necessarily though. So these very, very small details, they're not missed by Beast Coast. There's no, like, there's no oversight. Like, they, they don't miss those at all. They have the full picture, they see the small details, they make sure that they're there, and it happens. Very well done by them. They buy a completely free round off the rush room 80. And to be honest, mentally speaking, I hope they got good vibes because this can be very frustrating. Now, both teams are quite off the major, so there is that. Of course, you're fighting for the bracket match being the best team in the region. SI points, yada, yada, yada. And these are competitive players and competitive teams. You have it in you where you cannot just play for fun. You might go to the same guys, let's just have fun, but no, you wanna win. Dude runs in, he dies alone, and nobody follows whatsoever. This coast team is just. It's something to cheer for. Spirits, by the way, very quietly amassing nine kills through four rounds of action. Cotton's only got four kills, Nick, but they've all been high value. Try to instill in people that just because you have a kill or a lot of kills does not necessarily mean that they've been important, but even the scoreline being what it is, it's undeniable that Spirits' nine kills have been very high impact. What does M80 even do here? Not just in this round, but with this map, they are very quickly ending up on the wrong side of Clubhouse. Yeah, I mean... Oh, oh I okay. mean, at least you get gifted a kill from that run out. That it costs, right? Like they do lose fight now, and again, it's just like frustration. These small things are just like really not working out for Mady, and they 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 feel like every step they take is getting punished because I mean they are getting punished every step of the way. Keener now to fire one HP now, basically twenty, but one bullet, and then look at this, just get out of there. Oh no, mind the cross there. Ben had to cover. Punished now, is spirits. Attackers from Mady now get catwalk control. This puts them in that decent position now to actually fight for this round. Capitao is still up, so those fire arrows can be used on the rafter should somebody be actively holding it, but instead it's just an evil eye cam that, <laughs> you know, and it's just a smash, but that's about it. It'll still remain there. This is one of the best looks that M80's had deep into a round. You know, losing his duel to Diffuser, though, that's a bit of a head scratcher. Beast Coast in the numbers advantage. Hot and cold, though, taking some damage earlier on. He's got one toxic canister, and with 20 seconds remaining on the clock, there will be one avenue towards this bomb site that will be cut off by that gas, provided he survives, of course. Diffuser was spotted for a moment, and there's the gas huffed down by cameraman as he's got the diffuser. He'll have to just stuff right through um, it, but he's worried about dying. Citizen is off to the races. Gavin's been dropped. All of a sudden, it's hot and in a 1v2, but Gavin's nitro. What a confusing end of the round that was. All of a sudden, it's, there's two seconds left, and Citizen seemed like he knew what he was doing, and then the nitro cell and the gas goes off, and that's it for the round. All right, well, it's a scramble from M80. I will say this. He you know is somebody who never seems to be bothered by what's happening in front of him, but that did not look like a particularly enjoyable look upon his face. As M80 find themselves on the wrong side of an 05 start. And if you go all the way back to the beginning of that round, it looked like a rush from M80 where Noodle sprints in off the exothermic charge, and you're thinking, okay, the whole camera is gonna arrive at that breach, right? No. Noodle dies immediately, and everybody else were running in the other direction away from the breach. So I'm not sure if there's like miscommunication or if they just like, I don't know. They were gonna go for it, but then because of the diet, they called it off. But either way, it made him not looking like the team they did, you know, they've been looking like the entire stage right now. 
the basic fundamentals of the team play not really fully there this could of course be a map issue of just clubhouse it could be that they're saying you know what we don't care about the si points as much we want to save a bit of strats but again very competitive players very competitive teams it would surprise me if anybody can go to the server and go guys let's not care because i know that it's being a former player myself you you're gonna say i don't care about this let's just play for fun whatever hide some strats but then you play a couple of rounds you go guys we're better than this we're gonna go in there we're gonna win we're gonna show the fans we're gonna prove to ourselves we're gonna prove our opponent how good we are and get their confidence in our final game before the major starts next month either way i have a second technical pause right now i'm not sure what the issue is but we'll hopefully we'll be back shortly so beast coast can keep up their momentum and keep destroying mat was that you was that you throwing to a break because it's it sure oh. sounded like it no that was just my point Wow, I was seeing. Uh, I hope ever, it's fast. Have you ever considered being the one to handle the transitions during games? Nope, not once. Oh, okay. I work well, with Car great. I work with Carter. He takes it. Stokes. He takes it. You. You take it. It's a very easy life for me. I just sit here. Or if it's and you I and Stokes doing play by play, neither of you take it. That did happen yesterday, and Stokes was like, "You know what, ah. Nikki? I forgot to talk there because I'm a color commentator these days. Like, you know what? I got you, bro. I feel the same way sometimes. It's fine. You forget that sometimes it's your turn." I think this is a good time now that we have a technical pause. I have to speculate that the UI disappeared for a period of time. I have to wonder if that's maybe the culprit as to why we have this tech pause. Clubhouse is the most played map in North America by a country mile. 10 plays to Oregon's seven. Chalet is in third with six. Because of that, 118 rounds have been played on Clubhouse and not even one of those rounds has been on the main floor of bar stage, which means that Clubhouse is a pretty standard three bomb site rotation. Most favorable bomb site to the defenders would be that church arsenal bomb site on the bottom floor. Well, they're 5-0, so Beast Coast are 2-0 on that bomb site. Bedroom and gym is the next most played site, but it is the only one of the three that has an attacker favored win rate. But it's still very close, 46 to 54. Cash and CCTV rounded out with 52% of all of its plays being done, or 52% of all of its rounds being won by the defenders and 31 rounds in total being played, which is just a little bit behind that bedroom and gym. I am intrigued to see if we will see a bar stage pulled out at some point today. This is maybe not as high stakes of a game as the matches yesterday, nor as high stakes as DZ and OXG were to start off this match. But you gotta bet that both of these teams are playing for the SI points. They're playing for greater out of the prize pool, for better seeding, and of course, for bragging rights. You get to be the best team in North America for stage one. For both of these squads, that's quite the feather in your cap. Neither of these rosters existed two months ago. Technically, officially. Our first <laughs> official matchup was just a couple weeks ago, frankly, five weeks ago, give or take. And both of them have silenced the doubters, especially Beast Coast. I think most people looked at the roster of M80 and said this roster has some pedigree. They know, they know their way around a match. You know, you've got a major champion in Spoit. He's sensational. Citizen is great, depending on his application, depending on how you want to use him. Hammerman is a another major champion. Everybody on M80 has, has proven their worth, and, and not that Beast Coast hasn't, but there are very valid questions that can be asked about Gunner's roles and performance on Sonics. I think people look at Spirit's time through the NA League and can wonder, why he maybe all the way back on, was it Parabellum and then Altiora before that, and maybe he didn't live up to the billing? Hot and Cold obviously is a staple. He's been around NA for a long time, but the big moment always seems to elude him. Fuser's brand new. What is Beast Coast going to be like? Are they going to be a top tier team? The answer right now obviously is yes. And not only are they a top tier team, but they are two rounds away from stealing M80's map pick away from them and being you know, going to the second map in a great spot. 
Beast Coast have continued to improve game by game by game. And the fact that M80 is doing well shouldn't really surprise anybody, but Beast Coast is probably a very welcome surprise. For people who are tired of seeing the same four teams atop the NA standings. Well, with that said, I hope you enjoyed my TED Talk. Thank you so much for coming along. The tech issues, unfortunately, are persisting, so we have a break ready for you. And then we'll come back when everything is all well and good. We'll get underway with our sixth round in map one between Beast Coast and M80. Sit so tight. Welcome back, everybody. That was a shorter break than one would expect, but we are indeed back in the server. All 10 players, they rejoined quickly because they want to continue to this best of three series. In case you're wondering, East Coast dropped five to zero, starting on Clubhouse defense, and they have looked mighty fine so far on this first half. M80, I will not say that they have looked terrible, but there are certainly a couple of things they could do better in the small details, in the teamwork, and killing department on the attacking side so far. They tried three rounds going for a slow, methodical approach. That didn't work. Then in the final two attacking rounds up until this moment, they tried to go fast, but that was shot down as well. It looks like there are no gaps on the side of Beast Coast, and they are in full control right now in Clubhouse. And to make things worse, this is M80's map pick. You'd expect them to do well, but so far they have really fallen short on those expectations. I wonder how much of this downtime has been spent just uh, trying to write their own mood. Yeah. Because again, I'm, I'm not a, I am a, I'm a far cry from an expert on body language. I'm not gonna try to psychoanalyze where these teams are at. I, none of these things should shock people, but at the same time, when you look and you, you know, a team loses a couple rounds and they're still, they're still jovial and they're still joking around. Part of you is like, I mean, you should be mad that you just lost these rounds, but at least like, I'm glad you're kind of keeping in good spirits. Yeah. M80 did not look very happy in the slightest. Even Kino, who looks like his house could be demolished by an earthquake and he'd still be smiling. <laughs> Even he looked frustrated at what's been happening. And these teams are hyper competitive. Sure, the stakes might not be there when you're talking about qualifying for a LAN, but neither of these teams want to lose this matchup. Doesn't matter what's on stake. Doesn't matter what's at stake. Hot and cold attempting a bandit trick, and well, unfortunately, EMPs are just way too Ooh. strong, and he pays for it. He tries the retreat in the bathroom. <laughs> Hot and luck. Type. Luck in chat. Oh. You know you've got them when they're typing at you. 
And boy, oh boy, I'm not gonna say that Kino deserved that kill, but I'm also not gonna say that Hotten is wrong. <laughs> uh, the big bandit trick scenario there is picking the right side because if you wanna get that extra thermal charge, they were unsuccessful. So now the attacks are made, they gotta win the bomb side, and guess what? They're just gonna go for a rush. Beast Coast are losing the duels across the board. Spirits and Gunner last two alive, and it looks like M80 will finally get on the board. They've isolated Spirits. They've kept him out. He's far enough removed from the bomb site that he can't have much of an impact. Working his way through cash towards construction as Kino successfully gets the diffuser down. Eventually, the proverbial rubber was going to hit the road. And here it is for Beast Coast. Though there's one kill from Spirits. Attempting to lure one of the last two players on M80 out of their position. Coax them into a fight. Spirits has no intel, though. He's just he's shooting at every single part of this map that doesn't contain a human corpse or human body. Now it's Spirits who's the corpse. And finally, M80 gets on the board, though the first half being a 5-1 in favor of Beast Coast, it sets them up quite well. Clubhouse in NA is not a defender's paradise. It actually bucks the trend that we see in a lot of other regions, which means... It doesn't matter what side you're on, you've got a fighting chance. And Beast Coast have more than a fighting chance of winning these final two rounds and sniping the map away from their opponents. I'm glad seeing Amelia were able to like capitalize on that pick they got with the wobbing on to Hot and Cold because given how the previous five attacker rounds played out, I would understand if they were going to be a bit timid and like slow to the punch because they've lost their confidence. But no, they got the wall bank kill and about five to ten seconds later, all five attackers were inside the building by the bomb side and just using the fact that they knew they cleared out that bathroom player and there was nobody watching the entry on the breach to that mirror window. So a great read, a great follow up and all five players actually bought into the same approach or as you saw maybe previously, one person's rushing and another four people are running in the opposite direction away from the fight. Side swap though, and just like Beast Ghost, a mate will start in the basement with the wrong clear, but they're not on the same page about which barricade should go where. So the cameraman will pull it down and replace the regular barricade with a castle barricade instead because he is holding bar control. While the rest of his team, most of it at least, will play upstairs and it looks like potential spawn peaks here from Citizen. Or not. The unfortunate thing with the rehost, other than the delay itself, was that we've lost all of the stats for these players. Spirits was at nine kills. He's got two since coming back, so he's definitely above double digits. Ooh. Did not have a photographic memory. But most of the players on Beast Coast had decent KDs. I mean, that comes with the territory when you're 5-0. and oh. Kind of hard to have bad stats when you haven't lost a round, unless you're just going zero on entry every single time. On cold, though. He breaches in, Spoit dies. It's technically at the hands of Gavin, but it's a team effort. And again, Beast Coast's team play, their synergy is not worsened at all as this stage has gone on. You can't call it beginner's luck. If anything, they're becoming more cohesive the longer time goes on. Oh yeah, they are definitely uh, still, ooh, still getting better and better. C4, the Punisher Spirits takes him down as Ibana, so maybe the hatch could be problematic later on, but there is secondary hop reach on the side of Gavin on the box. Those can open us, but Hot and Cold's in the middle of the bomb site. I don't know how, but he's here. Not sure. Last time a Blitz found themselves in this position. It did not go well for M80, but they're now on the other side of the coin and things are going quite well. Gunner chasing Noodle off of his position. Where are Kino and Cameraman? Because Hot and Cold is all alone inside the bomb site with Diffuser. Smoke around him, Kino, 3-0, Nitro Cell to go out. That should net hot and cold with ease, and it will. Gunner's upstairs. Doesn't really have much. One minute to get to the bomb site, one minute to get the diffuser, or one minute to find the last three players from M80. He'll find Cameraman, but Cameraman wins the duel with the super shorty in hand. And two in a row for M80. East Coast are so close to putting this away, you know that frustration will build the longer that M80 continues to win. 
Yeah, I like the attempt though. If the quick entry, successful, but then things fall apart on the kitchen portion of the map. They don't get the hatch opened up. So hot and cold being the blitz in the middle of the bomb site gets very awkward very quickly because there's a lack of support from the rest of the team due to the failures inside our kitchen. But hey, sometimes, oh, he was outside the building even. That is unlucky. But yeah, C4 Kino finds hot and cold. Plant does not go down. Gunner, last man alive, out of the bomb site. That's not gonna go. That's not gonna go anywhere. Now we've seen both teams play bandit. And that's been a big focus point for them. Just like deny the breach for as long as possible. But M80 did ban out the two brow themselves. So you cannot, you know, pair the bandit with the two brow to freeze the wall, trick the wall, rinse repeat. A big question then when you see a bandit is. Are the attackers gonna play Maverick? Well, right now Gunner went from Finger onto Maverick because of that. This ensures you can always get the wall opened up. There is a cost though. Maverick is a little bit slower and much more prone to a C4, so you could lose a player early on if you misstep on that Maverick torch. But again, I like this. Both teams respecting the boundaries of the other. They play Bandit, they answer with Maverick, and it's gonna burn some of that flexibility on the attack inside. I should now limit it to what operators you can bring out since you have three different hop features and a Thatcher. Well, there's doubling up, and then there's tripling up, and then there's quadrupling up. Hmm. Maverick, Ace, Thermite, and then of course the Buck with those hand openers. Yeah, Beast Coast, as you pointed out, are really, they really want to get in the building, and nothing is going to slow them down. And well, who's the best friend of hard breachers in the entire game? Hatcher. Hatcher. Now, here's the greater issue, though. That single wall that leads into construction can be easily bandit tricked, and there's really nothing you can do about it unless you take Logi. That's really the only way to pressure. I suppose if you were to try to fight through construction door from, from bedroom, but it really just does allow a bandit to play in there with impunity if you're not going to put somebody in a position where bandit needs to make an active decision. Do I try to trick this wall or do I give up and try to fight the player coming at me? It's very similar to when you know there's a mm. frost map beneath a window. You yeah. have to make that judgment of whether or not you're gonna hop in and shoot the frost mat or whether you take the engagement and then ultimately get down by the frost mat. Now it's a much easier decision to make because the frost mat is no longer fatal. You can pick yourself up. This is what I was talking about. Not only can he control that single construction panel wall, but he can control the two that also lead into logistics. East Coast are in rough shape. Down goes Spirits to a nicely thrown Nitro Cell at the hands of Cameraman, Kiva Barriers will slow down the advances of Beast Coast from bedroom side. And it does look like, despite the numbers, we're looking at a very defender-sided clubhouse. I love this setup, though. It's very, like, uncommon. So Beast Coast might not have seen this before necessarily. I had the most experience against it. And they're starting to problem solve. They got the Maverick, but Gunner ain't there. The skill barriers are tough to deal with, but there it is. Hunting Cold gets one kill and jumps down that hatch. Shocking that Beast Coast came out of that engagement in a positive direction. Yeah. It seemed like almost certainty the cameraman would win it, but his aiming, it just failed him. Cotton lost a lot of HP in the process, but is actually down Citizen through the floor. Noodles dropped to Gunner. This is so winnable, but Gunner and Hot and Cold are on a sliver of HP. Kino full HP, a Nitro Cell in hand. Even the smallest shard will finish them off. It's Kino against Gunner in a 1v1 with only a couple seconds left. Kino playing keep away. He doesn't need to move a muscle, but he gets the kill either way. Did you watch the UFC fight last night? No. It was the but I saw the clip. what happened at the very final fight when he said, yep. he said it was technically it was the third last fight. He said, stand here and let me beat the hell out of you. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened. With one second left on the clock, he got a knockout. You know, with one second left, gambles in what could have been a 50-50, but he has a shotgun and he felt good about that decision and it was the right call, but it also very easily could have been the wrong call. There's a nitro cell I said earlier that was tossed out around all those Kiba barriers. Maybe have now won three rounds in a row. If they win one more, I have to imagine Beast Coast will call a timeout because they will have completely lost their grasp on this game. 
especially if we consider that the defenders are very strongly suited to win most, if not all, of their defenses. Very surprised that it became such a close round down to 1-1 because it made it look like they had full control for the vast majority of that round. And I, again, I love the setup. They play open wall, close to the bottom side, reinforce often instead, bandit trick, and they are only able to do that because Asami is up and available to provide security inside a construction. These codes didn't quite problem solve it efficiently, but they did brute force it in the end. It made it looking a lot better on their defense, also with team playing coordination. Of course, it's, it's typically easier. You have your default setups, you got the shot on paper, you know what your role is going to be every single round, and all you have to do is react to what the attackers are doing. So a little bit less adaptation is needed, and they're thriving. They're looking good, they're feeling good, and they're finally finding that scoreboard. Kino, for example, since the rejoin, rehost, 7 0. Amazing performance from him. East Coast, they're kind of slowed down their attacks right now. No more blitz, no more super fast in the building. They're giving more respect, I want to say, to the side of M80. Trying to avoid dying to C4s or pre-fires to a wall, etc. And they want to try and get to this bomb site with as many players as possible because they keep dying early. Fuser playing on red stairs now, and Buck will take up space in what is referred to as the Buck office, which is lounge over towards stock. He's tempted. Oh, by... hold on a second. This is this is a live look at Noodles player. <laughs> he wanted to join. Who was it? Was it Diaz who impacted himself in the previous round? Now it's Noodle botching the Nitro Cell. Sploit trying his damnedest inside a cache. M80 have really been working hard to stitch these rounds together. And yet, this could be the end of that, what do you want to call it, momentum, so to speak? Yeah, bomb. round win streak, yeah. Well, the win streak would certainly end, that's for sure. You know, Airman, the, hero, Kino, the last two remaining, both Brazilians playing for this team. Kino yet to die since coming back from the rehost. Oh, Airman got a good look, but he was worried about being pressured by construction, so he has to pull out of that position. But they know there's somebody at the window, which allows Kino to slow peek this. Question is, oh, where will the damage play be? He thinks that was him, but it was not. Timothy was somewhere else. <laughs> And now cameraman in a 1v3 with 30 seconds to go. Spirit's on the window with Diffuser in hand. He's a high value target. He can't die or else Beast Coast will need to send somebody else to retrieve that case. Instead, cameraman will loop around through construction, hoping to have a flank on his hands. Maverick of Gunners watching. There was a drone established in Lodgy. He knew it was there. A fight needs to be brought to him, but cameraman's still looking for another. He manages oh. to catch Gavetti looking the wrong way, but Gavin has ice in his veins, and he cools off M80. Match point on M80's map. East Coast one round away from going to their map, up 1-0. It's again way too close for comfort. Again, they had a drone in office the entire time, and then Cameron gets the flank off successfully. I don't know about that one, boys. Discipline up from South of East Coast. Again, respect your opponent. Do not count them out, even though it's a 1v3 or a 4 versus 2. Comes down to the wire again, and this does look like a very defender side of clubhouse, regardless who's on the attacking side of things. I will say, Beast Coast, they've been trying to. Do things very differently than that of M80 so far on the attacking approach. They are off red lineup, they are pacing where they're attacking from, but they are finding similar struggles on the initial entries and peeling off that extension on the defense. M80, they could go bar, they could have, would have, should have done it, they didn't. A little bit disappointing, right? We want to see all four bubbles being played out as much as possible. They're gonna go back to basement and they're gonna play a more turtle oriented defense i would say because bandit kaid asami this is more of a we care about the bomb side and making it unbreachable more than it says hey we want to roam and get proactive that doesn't mean though that you can't have any roaming presence you still typically want to have a player stop top floor kill a couple of drones try and stop a time or even in this case noodle and bandit also denying the walls Maybe playing both sides of the coin right now, but I would not be surprised if they fall back sooner rather than later. 
because the bomb set itself has to be the priority right now with this orbital lineup. Is that a botched Kiba barrier, by the way? That I think so. Right now destroys, or maybe just realizing that he doesn't want to play that angle anymore. Keep in mind, Kiba barriers do not function the way that castle barricades do. When you rip down a castle barricade, it goes right back in the pocket of castle, right? With yes. Zami, she doesn't get the Kiba barrier back. It's as good as gone. And yeah, it did look like that was a screw up because Spoid has now put it in the other direction. Unlucky. That could be that could be quite disastrous. If you lose one or two Kiba barriers through I don't know, negligence? Misfortune? Skill the Kiba barriers issue? are so crucial. They are. I mean it's, it's probably still one of, if not the strongest defender gadget so far in the game. Asami and Fenrir probably tied for first in different ways. Sol is a close second. So yeah, definitely could be impactful later on. Maybe just went out of cash. That's it. They've surrendered the rest of the Rome game. But we see the silhouettes. They are falling back downstairs. Half the round burn. That's their timer. 130. Play the bombs out. Five versus five. Beast Ghost. They're still kind of wasting time, effort, and drones and half reach utility on that top floor. I want to say this was a successful roam from the defense. And they still now got five players alive. They got two C4s with those Valkyrie cameras. They can easily find a free pick here. Oh, 100%. Airman got droned out on stairs, by the way. That little device catching him for a second right as he pulled the nitro cell. A shotgun at that close range is insta-death for any of these attackers. Is he worried that there's a Valcam in that position over towards blue? Yes, I mean, oh, he's correct. There is. there is indeed a Valcam in there, but not where Gavin was looking. All the, while the all the while the Beast Coast waits and tries to find this, the farther this objective oh. gets out of reach of them. Oh, Spot ran back. He actually had the perfect opportunity for a free kill. Fuser was with his pistol in his hand. Spot runs back though, the one to 5v5 and bleed Beast Coast here on the attack. 30 seconds left, they gotta go soon. And there might go Church Wall. Citizen swings from Church Door. Down he goes, the hands of Gunner. Gavin with two, breaking in. No holds bar, Beast Coast. Only need one more. They won't win the round flawlessly. If it were up to Noodle, they wouldn't win it at all. But Noodle doesn't get a say. He gets shut down by Beast Coast. And M80's map goes into the win column of BC. They're up 1-0, looking to cement their status as the best of the West. One more map to go, potentially, Nick. What an impressive first map. We'll be back with more in just a few minutes. Beast Coast are so good. They are good. Cameraman be the hero now. He'll need to be. G out of the line of sight and with a glance on the To push them to not.
on cold, praying to the siege deities that he can get one more map in this series and walk away with Beast Coast winning a stage championship in the North American League. That or he just really has a migraine listening to Gunner all the time, and I don't know which one is the right answer. Beast Coast take M80's map pick in this series. They are now up one. They'll go to their own map right after this. And I mean, again, it's another map that just went awry because of how dominant that first half was. I mean, to be fair, I went to the bathroom when it was 1-0 and I came out in those 30 seconds and it was 5-1 and I was like, <laughs> okay, well, yeah. this is obviously not the way that I thought Clubhouse was going to look. Yeah, a rough attacking half from M80. They definitely were running a lot of shortcuts. Felt like yes. they were getting into gunfights way before they necessarily had the information or the uh, crossfire set up. They were struggling to isolate people. I mean, rounds four and five, especially at the start of that second quarter, it just felt like they were trying to rush in through dirt or they were trying to rush into CC breach and constantly they were getting caught off guard. Beast Coast were always ready for it. I really want to highlight spirits. You can see before the rehost, nine and two. And then we rehost, we'll get the full stats later, but he continued to pop off. He was fantastic for Beast Coast on that first half. And this one, that was a lucky shot by Kino there that we saw in that thermite. Hot <laughs> cold definitely made sure uh -huh. to point that out. But yeah, it was a very kind of unorthodox play style that we were we're seeing from M80, especially yeah. when they went to this defensive round specifically. I've yeah. never seen an Azami set up like that in construction. I mean, kudos to them for winning this round. Kino plays it perfectly here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely a little interesting. This isn't quite exactly the M80 that I thought we were going to be seeing today. And you said it best that they're definitely cutting corners in many different situations where had they just not cut those corners, we maybe see this be a closer map. Certainly. And, you know, some 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 fundamental mistakes there for sure. We saw the Noodle self C4. That was, I was interesting. That's a rough one Especially for sure. when you can watch where your C4 is going. So. Yep. <laughs> yep. Everyone's got the tracker off. It happens. You know. It happens. Maybe, maybe he's playing without it now. You know, maybe we really want to test himself. He's you like, think you there's know, some pros that just decided, screw it, I don't need it, I'll just turn noodle. it off. Like, noodle, literally. <laughs> literally noodle. You want <laughs> noodle, noodle like that, that might never need yeah. the help. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, fair play. So, M80 lose their own pick. Uh, obviously not the start that you want. Took a timeout trying to center themselves after three rounds, and it didn't work out. But Spirits is the man of the day, 11 and 5. He's doing phenomenal before the rehost. And afterwards, didn't have to pop off nearly as much, because that's when Gavin stepped up to the plate a lot more. Yeah, Gavin, even diffuse. We've talked about him all the time. I mean, these these three players, Gunner, obviously, I mean, he didn't, he's not dropping the 14 like he typically is. <laughs> but nonetheless, Gavin, Spirits, Diffuser, these guys are all playing extremely well. Again, I didn't think Clubhouse was going to go this way, given how they played against Luminosity, given how they just recently played against Dark Zero. I did not think that this was going to be a 7-3 going against M80. So I'm kind of left in confusion of what Nighthaven's going to look like. Yeah, I'm worried for Nighthaven, especially because M80 chose to start on the yeah. attack for that map. That's going to be really really tough for them we just saw their attacks and well they didn't really go very well they got a single round so yeah we're looking very good for beast coast to become the north american league champions but it's a tale of night haven being a, a map that both teams dominate on it was just played yesterday for yeah. m80 they rolled oxg in map three of that series beast coast played it against sonics and had a perfect defensive half but it's because m80 chose to start attack on this map that leaves me quizzical I'm not yeah, sure what that's about. I, I it's it's questionable because this is such a tight focused map. But I will say, when they did play this on attack, I was impressed with how M80 was forcing oxygen into those tough positions. They were taking that control. So I guess when I really think about it from that aspect, it doesn't really shock me. But at the same time, like I said, it could put that false kind of thought process of that your map maybe looks a lot stronger than what it might actually be because sure. again, Oxygen, we have not seen them playing the way that we wanted them to be. Nighthaven Labs, though, was also Beast Coast's first win of the season. It's what broke their losing streak. It's what started them on this journey to become the new and improved Beast Coast after week two looked so, so rough for them. How poetic would it be if it was also their last win of the season and if they became North American League champions by playing Night Haven Labs? Kind of sounds like a perfect storybook ending if you ask me. I think the thing is, both teams are going to Manchester. If M80 come back and win, it shows resiliency. If Beast Coast dominate on two straight maps and don't let a map three happen, they go to Manchester looking relatively strong for a team that again was a virtual unknown about a month ago and definitely but both teams look strong nonetheless obviously mm -hmm. beast coast i think for bragging rights and the just the resurgence that we've saw from them like that is the better storyline in my opinion here kind of yeah. just like what we even saw back at si phase easily could have won that w7 m up win it and that was like the best storyline possible that could have ended that year on this is the kind of the same situation here we don't this mind be, ending a tournament with a storybook this, yeah ending. absolutely this would be like the best case scenario if beast coast ends up being the number one team going into man Manchester, leading NA on that forefront.
but I do want to see M80 fight back. Obviously, this is their Nighthaven lab. No cotton corners. Uh, no cotton corners on this <laughs> one, please. Let's keep the, the pushes uh, concise. Let's keep them all uh, encompassing and, and well strated out because Nighthaven Labs is not an easy map to attack on. And if they struggled on Clubhouse, Nighthaven Labs, they got to be a lot sharper. Who will be the number one contender heading to Manchester for North America? Is M80 got a little bit of fight left in him or a Beast Coast about to run away with this one in two straight maps? I do believe Intero and Pengu will be the ones to tell us that. You are correct. Very correct indeed. I am Pengu, that's Intero. That that's in tarot. That's in tarot. Pengu told me how much money he won from Rainbow Six Siege, and it is an eye-watering amount of money. It's available to see on his R6 Liquipedia page. It's, 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 it's literally public knowledge. You just do the math. I bought a house in Denmark. You should come see it. I have a giant cat. His name is Sly. I bought an apartment in Denmark, and my cat is giant, and his name is Sly. Oh, the public favored M80 at one wow. point, but how the turntables... Because now it's Beast Coast, 51 to M80's 49%. Damn. Switch Night on. Night Even Labs is an intriguing map for this thing to end off on, should this be the end. If not, it goes to Chalet. Night Haven Labs, not a very well-loved map in most regions, but in NA, that's actually not the case. It sits with four plays ahead of Border Cafe and Skyscraper. So it sees decent play, but you know what Nighthaven Labs happens to be, Nick? What? The second most defender-sided map in the map pool. The only map in North America that is more favorable to the defenders? Skyscraper, and it's only been played twice. So how much can we actually glean from that? Whereas Nighthaven Labs, 42 rounds, four plays, you're averaging about 10.5 rounds per and the defenders tend to win the lion's share of them. Well, hmm. the Beast Coast, they're actually starting on defense on their own map pick. So there's a possibility here for Beast Coast to run up the score early. That's surprising, right? Because if you pick the map, your opponent picks the starting side, I mean, they picked the tack, and we just saw what happened on Clubhouse. Of course, you pick the sides, you know, before you play the first map, you do that in the very veto phase, like an hour before the game start. So you can't usually use like what happened on Clubhouse as a reason, but still, I mean, you might regret this because their attacks on Clubhouse did not look put together all that well. The synergy, the coordination, nothing was really working out. Hopefully, it's gonna be the other M80 that shows up. You know, the team that is really good in attack, that has the firepower, that are quick in the building, that are fighting those engagements, that are trading their teammates when they fall in battle. Because if not, East Coast, they will absolutely love to fight them every inch of the map. And this first round, the upper lineup tells that same story. We're seeing Vigil being played. Vigil is the I am in your face, but you can't quite see me if you're in a drone. And I will take any gunfight that you put in my path. Then he has something like a legion as well for Intel. Solus, counter in. Tell. But then the side itself will also be fortified with something like High Claw from Hot and Cold. So Beast Coast, they got their own, but it's also hard to breach the walls or hatches leading to the bomb side. I know Jacob's a wrestling fan. I know that we have a big wrestling belt sitting next to him on the stage. So I think it's a fair point for us to say that Vigil is the John Cena of Ooh. all operators. You can't see me. Except he I does it without that. waving his hands in front of his face, and I. I'm also willing to bet that Vigil doesn't do anywhere near as many make-a-wish requests as John Cena does. Oh. Vigil tends to be on the more sinister side. Though I suppose lore-wise, not a not a ton is shown in most of the trailers and videos that Rainbow Six puts out, though we've seen Vigil from time to time. He is an operator that is uniquely positioned to deal with with some of these attackers that we see most often, one of which is Lion, with Cameraman running the Lion. Well, gonna put Gavin in an interesting spot. Could potentially do some serious damage. It's been a bit of a slow approach here. I like it, they're taking their time, not risking those early devs, but they gotta pick about this Rome. Spirits, very much up there, as is Diffuser, so was Gavin. And they're looking like very actively to jump out windows. And they're looking like almost desperate for a fight right now. Swinging the door, swinging the window. But Noodle, instead of clearing the Rome, he's approaching the side instead. And maybe they might have found a gap here. A bomb has been located. He struggled to do that for most of Clubhouse, so finding one 
this early on for M80, it'll be good. Noodles in the middle of the site. So is Kino, putting the diffuser down. Gunner attempting to go back is watched by Noodle. So oh, no utility, M80 winning immediately on this opening duel. Cameraman the only one on M80 who's died. Diffuser goes down. The other diffuser, the one on Beast Coast, still very much alive. And he finds Citizen. Now Noodle is dead as well. East Coast trading HP, getting back closer to position. M80 left to just Spoit and Kino. Avin dies, Spoit cut down, Diffuser trades. It's Kino and Diffuser now in a 1v1. A battle to the- Oh! How does Diffuser win this? Are you kidding me? A quad kill to start their own map. <laughs> East Coast pick up where they left off from Clubhouse. What do you do again? I mean, there's there's nothing to like, okay, you gotta do that differently or do this differently because they made it, they had a really good post plan. They were upside down repelling on the window outside the building. That gets figured out. They have a one foot on site with 17 seconds left. The door is still barricaded and like a hip fire, probable bullet spray finds the first bullet headshot to take down the last attacker. And there's still time to go for the counter defuse. That is ridiculous. And then things like this is happening, you're thinking as a matey, what are we supposed to be doing? How is this going so wrong? And honestly, I don't think there's a real solution. You just gotta forget about that round and go next. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, That's just tough. The... There are times where there are statement rounds and there are obviously statement kills. The fact that Diffuser just got a Jiggle Peak hip fire kill onto Kino with enough time to then hop on his own namesake and disable it is really something else. When I say there are those rounds that can really swing the outcome of a matchup, that is honestly a round that could break the proverbial backs of a lot of teams. You just lost your own map. You're already licking your wounds. You've already got a lot of work to do. Catch up to this almost unstoppable East Coast squad. And what happens in the first round? Well, seems th things seem to be going pretty well. You know, you don't have to expend a lot of utility. You walk into the bomb site. It's free for the taking. So you take it. The Beast Coast are playing far enough back that they catch you in your transition out of the post plant. And then, out of all the ways to die, that's so how Kino dies? Obviously, I'm nowhere near talented enough to be playing at this level, but I wouldn't fault somebody if they threw in the towel after that. At least they won't admit it, but hard to stay motivated after. Well, it certainly will be. And I, I just want to point out for, for this last point, like these codes were so quick in that post to figure out what they had to do, like the C4s, covering the crosses, starting the counter defuse, like no seconds wasted. This rather made he also much quicker to the punch. Noodle again, last time found the gap, this time finds the opening kill. And Mady, on their own through successful. And despite that last round not going their way, they are not slowing down. They're still in it mentally, which is a very good sign given how frustrating the last four rounds have been for them. First Selma thrown out, it comes at the halfway point. Utility work has not been the staple of M80 through this entire series. We've been finding kills left, right, and center this round. Fuser almost Ooh. goes down, but then has an ugly duel with Cameraman. East Coast in a bad spot. Now it's Gavin's turn. Through the blindness, he hops right on it. He feels like there's somebody outside. Maybe he's correct. He's out dueled nonetheless, and now Spirits is in a 1v4. This could have been a 2-0 for M80, but they're going to have to settle for one round and one round for their adversaries. Every inch counts between these two teams. I do appreciate the fact that Beast Coast are living up to the billing. They are not faltering in the face of adversity. M80 will have their hands full for all of Nighthaven Labs. I guess it shows why I made it chose attack as a starting side because they have now looked very good in the very first two rounds. Very clear plans and they've accompli accomplished their goals every single time. Two rounds, two plants, opening kill as well. No real complaints and they should have won that first round. They really absolutely should have. Beast goes. 
Not having that same defensive defensive success as on Clubhouse, but 90 minutes is a very different map. It plays out very differently, and the win conditions change too. Unlike Clubhouse as well, you don't have as much map to work with. Like, this is the bump site, right? Upstairs. If you want to extend somewhere, you can play where the fuser is playing. You've got a jungle or connector. You can play aqua fish stairs. Often where Spirit is playing on the warden. But that's really it. You can play Catwalk Raptors or Hunt and Coldest right now. Like, that's really it. So, extending across the bomb side is very close to it. When you play Clubhouse, you extend across the entire map. And you have this long portion to work with. So, a bit more limited options, I would say, with the Beast Coast. Less movement, less opportunities to go for a flank, for example. I like it though, they bring out Gavin on the Valkyrie. It gets a bit of intel to work with. They got mirror windows. They're bringing utility. There's no ash on the side of MAT. So no easy direct counterplay here on those mirror windows. You gotta just use the MPs and the hot destruction. Like they are right now. Sell me on the left. Extra damage charge on the right. EMP in case of any wall deny. I haven't the... Oh, I think the Selma charge exploded the exothermic charge on the wall. And therefore the wall is not gonna be opened up. Maybe exactly like they wanted. Unless, of course, they don't care about it because the wall is open. That's all you really want technically, but it is wasted utility. This is something that the less experienced players of this game might not immediately know, but the reality is, is that your own hard destruction gadgets can destroy your other team's destructive gadgets. Yep. You put an exothermic charge and ex-kairos next to each other and they can blow each other up and vice versa. Same applies for that Selma. Now, though, down one piece of hard breach utility. No exothermic charges available for cameraman at all. Only one Selma left in pocket for Spoit. You'll have to rely an awful lot on those hard breach gadgets that are brought by Kino's Ying. So what do you do if you're at Navy? Well, you try to get into the building on your own without the aid of that destruction. It does not work out well for Noodle. At least he'd gotten those EMPs off before finding a relatively early grave. We're just past the halfway point on Nighthaven Labs. And M80 had some issues getting into the building, though they are as close as they are going to get. And I imagine that East Coast will be all too happy to greet them once M80 does decide to rush in. They have a rotate here from M80. I think they're going to go to plan B instead. Kino in the garage window. That's okay. Mirror window, though, could be problematic. Also, note, no smokes. Okay, they just swing. No smokes on the attack to deny that mirror window's line of sight. Only flashbangs or candelas. But now with Kino dying, candelas are also gone. Impacts to go out onto the wall, but they don't find much. Gavin trades out Citizen. Nobody dying from Beast Coast just yet. We haven't actually seen a flawless round between these two teams. If Spoit dies, well, it'll make its debut. Finds the bandit though, a diffuser. A run out as well from Gavin got Spoit's attention, who had walked into IT and now has no choice but to back out. He's got access to the case. Looking at kneecap level, but it's Gunner from farther away. He wasn't the first line of defense, but I mean, you've got redundancies. Gunner, that second line of defense will give Beast Coast back the lead. Looking much stronger that round, but again, I think it really boils down to the opening duels right now. If Amelia can get that first pick and ride the momentum in that single round and get a foothold inside the building, they look like they're in full control. But the rounds where they don't get the opening pick, where a player of them dies, they stall out for like 30, 40 seconds, and then they go for a desperate play with a lack of coordination, like Kino jumping in alone, nobody there to trade him out, nobody swinging Garrett's door, and then Ying dies as well. So they lose two players all of a sudden. And with that, statistically, the round is over. M80, just like on Clubhouse, they will call a very early tactical timeout to turn this around, talk about the problem, solve the problem, and set this up for a long match, hoping for that third map. Very early timeout, no? Like this, we're three yeah. rounds in. It was three the exact same on Clubhouse. In. Yep. Back to backs. Clubhouse, they lost three rounds in a row, called their technical timeout. Here, they lost two of the three rounds, also called the technical timeout. So it's it's not too great, but again, if you choose the attack and starting side, you're gambling on getting as much success as possible because either you got the counter prep or really good feel for it, or because you fear for your own defensive side once Sideswap comes around. 
and looking at the scoreline right now with how the first round played out this should have been a 2-1 for our matey we always have to go back to that very beginning and go it made should have won that initial round but they didn't and that can go back to bite them later on if this turns out to be a very close series or at least a very close map Mady's coaching staff knows more than us. There's no way around that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But as an outside observer, watching this team play through most of the North American League and now also looking at this matchup in particular, it's like Mady lost some of that moxie. You know, we were, we're, only, a, we're only a couple days, a, a week or two removed from Spoyton Citizen wiping out every single team that seemed to run afoul of them. And they've gone up against, on paper, tougher competition. But when you're running into players like Spirits, like Gavin, like Gunner, you don't necessarily think that they immediately stack up to Sploit or Citizen or Cameraman. Yeah. And yet, here they are doing just that. And it goes to show you that individual performances aren't what really makes it work in Rainbow Six. It's teamwork that makes the dream work, baby. First pick went to M80, but Beast Coast not just struck once, but have now struck twice since then. Cameraman and Citizen are gone. You lose Gavin. That's bad. Gunner prone on the floor. Spoit also prone on the floor. He <laughs> sees Gunner. What an odd engagement. It puts M80 in the driver's seat for this round. Holding a 3v2 advantage. But Hot and Cold and Diffuser have looked so strong this entire day. Not just this day, but also the whole stage. Hotton saw one outline of M80, said, I don't want anything to do with that, and peeled off. That's, the, I think, the right move to make when you've got so much time remaining. You don't want to potentially put yourself in harm's way this early on. Oh, my. Look for the side instead. This is awkward. Defenders are above. Attackers on the side, but the red ping's coming out. Hot has the intel, finds it for a 2v2. And M80, they got a minute and 15 seconds to figure it out. They can't just plant though because it's intel on the site. Either they gotta go back upstairs or find those cameras and then try and plant later on. I mean, I think it's a brilliant idea for Gavin to die so that he can watch the cams to enable the rest of his teammates. Fuser is swung on. He's pinched by the last two remaining players of M80, one of whom, Noodle, is reduced to a flashing red bar. Otten still governs from above. The doorway that M80 will likely need to walk through is exactly where he's staring, but oh, he oh, falls off. No. You can't spend too much time in that position. It's a bit of an unwieldy set of recoil. Otten gets the down. I don't know if he's got that information. Now Kino is very vulnerable getting the diffuser down. It's read into by Hotten, but he can't seem to find the case at all. Kino will surely go and retrieve Noodle at this point because you need both players up if you want to win this round. I don't think Kino has a good idea as to where Hotten is. So really, that just cuts across the board. None of these three players know where their opponents are. Kino knows where Noodle is. Noodle knows where Kino is. That's about it. So Hotten will descend the stairs as the timer will continue to work against him. Vault on over. He sees Noodle. You might as well secure the kill, but you've only got five seconds to find Kino, who's posted up by the door. Otten will swing, and even if he'd won the fight, the timer was so low, it was an almost certainty that the round would go in M80's favor. I don't think there was any hope for Hotten there one bit. These teams very well balanced so far on Nighthaven Labs. 2-2 two -two the scoreline through four rounds. Bit of a shame there for Hot and Cold because I think he had the he had a really good read, but just not the patience, if I can say it like that. You know, he held the door for 20 seconds or so the moment he looks away. That's when they push through it. It doesn't get the full value there. He does find the injury, but again, the lack of intel. And M80 had a really good start to that round. It was a full-on rush top floor. And despite Citizen's grenade not destroying the castle barricade, slowing it down for a bit, it was again all five players of M80 playing together looking for that same objective. That is when they're the best. And when they've been playing their best level of play, they do it every single round of attack. On Clubhouse, we didn't see it whatsoever. Here at Heaven Labs, I was in the first four attacker rounds. Two of them have looked phenomenal. A third looked like good. And then they had one round that was just like, it was over very quickly, right? So really good stuff here so far. Side swap, so to speak. I think 3-3, I mean, 
great for both teams. Goes for, you know, makes for a great map or a close map for us as well as viewers and casters and fans. But if they made it choose attack starting side, I feel like they they want to aim for a four two. So they're aiming for more, and I think that's fair. Maybe gonna go through a couple different operators we've been since before. Previously on the basement bomb side, now they do it again. Citizen on a switch to find those default cameras and deny the intel from the defender to Beast Coast. Create darkness around the map so that later on for that room clear, we have a higher chance to succeed once you enter that building. Well, Kino might have had a bit of a slow start on that very first map, but he picked it up in the second half. Carried over now to map number two. Nobody really springing ahead here on M80 other than Spoit. Just pretty standard stuff. I don't think I need to reference those kills yet again, but if you were not here for map number one, Spoit is something like almost 30 kills above second place, and second place is Citizen on his team. Spoit is something like 40 kills ahead of third place which is just an absurd total. Now, it is worth noting that M80 has played a fair amount of maps up to this point, so the numbers will be higher just based on the amount of games you play. And for the teams that did not make the playoffs, yeah, their numbers are going to be low because they only got to play those, what, those nine games, and that was it? Those eight games, technically, mm. because everybody got a DQ? So the more games you play, typically the more kills you will have, but it's not just the fact that he has kills. It's... The numbers that correspond with it. Spoit's the number one rated player in the league. He is a plus 45 KD right now. Plus eight on entry. That's spectacular stuff. And Citizen's plus 31 as well. So you run across these players and they're going to kill you way more than they're going to get killed. Maybe not so much in this match. Maybe the issue is that M80's... Supporting cast is not setting up Citizen and Spoit enough for the kills, or maybe it's just that, in this case, Citizen, who sits at one and three in this round, is having an off day. Take the execute. Gonna try and force that movement from the roamers right now, looking for free picks without time is becoming a problem for them because Beast Coast did not overstep their limits right now. So M80, next time those sense wall comes out, they gotta go for broke because time is slipping away. Kino falls early, Beast Coast in the driver's seat. There's a run out from Gavin. Gunner with one as well. A nice GG there from Beast Coast. Three remain for M80. Cameraman getting the hurt put on him. Spirits as well. The more damage that's done to M80, better it is for Beast Coast. Citizen drops, thought he had a kill. He does. He manages to secure Gavin. Gunner and Diffuser put a bow on that round and send it away. Back and forth, back and forth, back, and potentially fourth. Final round of the first half, Beast Coast with the lead. Very, like, good overview from Beast Coast of the confidence in the setup. They only had one single player on the bomb side, and despite the fact that there was both a hard breach of Kino, a Ace on the breach, and Noodle on Sense throwing out those walls as well, they did not overreact to that execute. And they didn't know for sure whether it made they were planting or not, not by my looks at least. No cameras, no pings coming out. So... The plan for me was solid, fake the execute, force those roamers to like react to it, and they had the rest of the players waiting for them, holding their angles. But again, they understood what the win condition was. They were like, okay guys, they can't plan, they're not gonna go for it, just wait, nothing's happening, don't stress it. And they just sit and they wait, and then they lash out before me they can actually go for the real execute. It's genius, really. And it goes to show that these guys are good at reading the tempo of these rounds when the push is coming in. Because I feel like M80, they can play fast, they can play slow, but I don't feel like these guys are being surprised when they change the pace. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, of course, like anything else. But these guys seem to be ready for it, regardless of if, if it's the fast version or the slow version. And that is impressive, because that's very hard to do. Made in the final attack will bring a more utility-oriented lineup. Maverick, the Capital, the Ying, and of course, back up in the ace. But Gunner, again, always finding these early picks. Somebody stop this, man. Cameraman down for the count. That's Maverick, which could be a pretty big deal because the Fuser is playing Bandit. Those walls might not get opened up as easily or as quickly as you would want. 
There was a lot of chatter for the entirety of his time on Sonics about whether or not Gunner was playing too loose, getting himself killed by being sloppy or being too aggressive or just downright uh, um, in the way that he took engagements. People would repeatedly say, no, 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 it's once Gunner starts playing safe and once Gunner starts playing more with the mm. team, you'll see his potential. I mean, there was a reason why the Sonics wanted him in the first place. <laughs> I don't know what it is on Beast Coast, but Gunner's being enabled to make all of these plays on his own. Cameraman and Spoiter removed from the server. All at the hands of Gunner playing on his own. Beast Coast getting those first two picks. This lead for them is nowhere near as dangerous as it was for DZ, who, when DZ would go up 5v3 against OXG, OXG would immediately turn it around. No, Beast Coast, that stickiness again. They're so hard to trade out. Giving Beast Coast a numbers advantage is just a recipe for disaster. And it's frustrating. Like, the way that Gunner is finding these kills, super frustrating. We saw when Spot died, his facial expression, it said it all. He's like, oh, what is this guy doing that's so dumb? But it worked. And it is working consistently right now. Now we see him go for the execute, but it's a three versus five. They're down two players. It'll try to swing it back. Hold on a second. I might have spoken too soon about the DZ curse. M80 finally gets back into the lead in terms of numbers with Gavin reducing M80 to Kino and Citizen. Typically, these are two players that you can rely upon. Ouch. Hasn't exactly been the case so far, at least not maybe for Citizen's side of things, but Kino finds the fifth kill and more will now fall on the shoulders of Kino. Candel is going out, Diffuser going down, Gavin sees him. Solus will prove to be so crucial. And both Gavin and Hot and Cold coalesce around this bomb site. Kino will just continue to fall back. He's got no utility remaining, but he's got a lot of bullets. 75 bullets, a fire hose of doom awaits these Beast Coast players. On Cold needs to get up ever closer, as right now the plan is for Gavin to stall. On hops onto it, there's Kino with one. A quad kill for Kino! The disbelief on his face tells the full story. And how about a little bit of cheekiness? Multiple times throughout that round, it looked like Beast Coast would persevere, but it's the player who was maybe unceremoniously benched from M80, who made his triumphant return to bring the hurt and ensure that the first half is just as even as the first round. Neither of these teams with a lead through six rounds. We are no closer to the end of this match. And then it's such a big round. Three versus five, completely locked out of the building. And Kino, it has the best gun for the job. An LMG with more than your typical standard 31 bullet count. He can go for priest fires, he can go for sprays, and he played that near perfectly. Beast Coast, they had a good read, and I think the way they approached that two versus one was smart. One person go on the counter defuse, one person cover. When Kino starts fighting, get off the counter defuse and fight together. Kino one step ahead. Also, the initial shot onto Gunner, clean first bullet one tap on the swing. That is a one man army right there from Kino. Seven and three as well. And as expected, as predicted, of course, a 3 3 first half. But again, we'll see for the final time. The very first round should have been in Mades. They could and should have had a 4-2 half by choosing to start on the attacking side. Now we're going to see though, can they be as efficient on the defense? Because that can be a problem. You might be good on one side. That's not going to get you all the way. You got to be good on both attack and defense to lock in these maps and lock in these rounds. Otherwise, it is going to slip away. East Coast. They didn't know that they were as good an attack on Clubhouse as they were defense. And if that's going to be the same trend here, it could get problematic on Nighthaven Laps. Well, we could be far from over in this engagement. Oh no. How many times has that happened to you in ranked or even in comp play where you swing and then immediately go onto cams because you fat finger the button? <laughs> That's my speculation, by the way, as to why we saw Diaz impact himself. It's, well, it wasn't intentional. I don't think he was just trying to deny. I think it was either Bolo or NJR, whoever was in the kill position. I don't, I don't think he was trying to deny them a stat. Sometimes it happens. Reload is R for most people. Gadgets and cams can be four. That's right above each other. Hot and cold said long ago at once he hit a certain age, he was put on hard breach duty. No more Ash main. Well, he might not be playing Ash. He might be playing on a more support-oriented operator in RAM. 
Ooh. They still got access to that R4C. Gunner missing out on him. What could have been a freebie on the Citizen? Both of them just pass each other. And now the drones will go out. Cameraman being spotted multiple times, cutting through those track stingers deployed earlier by Diffuser. Halfway point of this round. Isn't it a shame for Garner? He misses in the cross twice in that round, and they're gonna stay roaming. I like this confidence from MAT. Despite losing Noodle early on, they're still gonna stick around. Spirits on the jangle finds a tremendous amount of value, but no one's really acting upon this information. East Coast relatively slow to the punch, but they're, they're working down the staircase. They might just say, you know what? We got what we wanted. We're gonna hit the bumps out instead and just worry about the upstairs portion later. Down goes Diffuser to Sploit. Diffuser has been a huge bright spot for this Beast Coast roster. Odd and Cold has found his way inside of the bomb site, so while Beast Coast might be one player less, he's still in position to get that Diffuser down. Beast Coast winning their duels. Kino and Sploit eliminated. Citizen and Cameraman, his last two standing. Cameraman firing through the wall. Spirits dies amidst the smoke. Cameraman will need to find a way closer to the bomb site. Maybe the hatch is the way to go. Now Citizen, down cargo stairs. The timer will start to run, and there will be one player from Beast Coast watching this angle. Gunner might as well have been an NPC because Citizen crushes him with limited contest. Still in this spot, but they know that there's only a single door for him to go through. No Nitro Cell to create a bigger opening. Gavin now sitting on top of the diffuser. Fire going out. Gavin evading it for the time being. That Goyo canister will continue to burn. Hot and Cold, who did most of the work that round, will take matters into his own hands at the very end. The fuser goes down, Cotton watches over it, and he says to Citizen, this is my baby, not today. East Coast back in the lead. Again, neither of these teams have won consecutive rounds on Nighthaven Labs. And also both teams finding success at getting the diffuser planted. Like, not even life can be tricky because it can, you know, you can win or lose rounds on the roam in the early stages of a round. But MAT, they got down three plants in six rounds. East Coast are one for one so far. So both teams playing that, you know, objective play. This is our goal. It's not about the roam thing, get as many kills as possible. It's about getting enough kills on the roam to get that staircase access to get to the bumps at itself. That's what they want. And then we saw Hot and Cold go for a plant, but despite being only one second away from getting it down successfully, he helps off the defuser plant attempt and they push deep throughout the bomb site because they saw on a drone or a player call out that two defenders were retaking top floor, so bomb site was going to be very weak. So they played the site, built a bigger advantage, and planted in a safer spot that couldn't be denied from above. Really good read, really good approach, both teams showing they know what it takes on the attack. At first, I thought this might have been a tack pause or a, or a tack so timeout too. that was called. And I was like, why would Beast Coast be calling their timeout as M80 used theirs after the third round? Why would it be Beast Coast using theirs when they're in an advantageous position? But instead, it's a tech issue. Unlucky. It seems like Beast Coast are... It's always like whenever they win a round, when they got some momentum, it tends to happen. Unfortunate, but it is what it is. It does give both teams a, a chance to like relax here and think about their next strategic approach. While you cannot talk to your fellow teammates while this is happening, you can still think in your own mind, okay, we could do this differently, or oh, we got this trap in our pocket with that we can use, or maybe if you did some like counter prep work, you now sit and like kind of dwell on that. And then when you get back from a technical pause, then you can share that information with your team and come out ahead. So you can still do something with this time, but it's gonna be individual thinking, not team thinking. There's a part of my brain that always goes back to a very crucial matchup at... Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Please there enlighten was, us. There was a time where the team that was in many ways considered the predecessor to M80, that was known as Xset. Mm. And they were playing against a team that was called Beast Coast. <laughs> oh no. And it is widely considered to be one of the worst matches in North American history. <laughs> it was just a downright dreadful match. There were almost no bright spots. The only bright spot 
was the why are you sprinting bio that kicks it. That's pretty much the only good thing that came of that matchup. Oh. And boy, oh boy, does that not feel like an eternity ago. Yeah, admittedly, that was almost three years ago. But at the same time, look at where these teams are now. Xset exits the scene, M80 enters. It's got similar leadership. Marco, who was a part of Xset, is now dealing with M80. Beast Coast obviously went through trials and tribulations, swapping things up, bringing in different players. And now you see the best iteration that Beast Coast and M80 have ever had. And it, it's just, it is astonishing to me how bad those teams were several years ago. And now both of them are fighting for first in the NA. And of course, one of the orgs is different, even if we do want to trace the lineage back, that old Xset roster, which I think is fair to do. M80 could yeah. inherit the Xset legacy. I'm fine with that. East Coast is still the same organization. None of these players were on their respective teams at the time, so the rosters are completely different. But it just goes to show you that changes to support staff, changes to the players, changes to attitude, can make all the difference in the world. And now here we are. Ooh. Nice toss from Citizen. We've seen this a couple times, but it's usually Maverick holes that have been opened up on the walls instead of just a nitro cell tossed out through an open mirror window that had been ejected moments before. That's not exactly the start that Beast Coast wanted. But with the way that this match has been going, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it means that this round has to be won by M80. That's what it says in the script, at least. I'm looking at it right here. I mean... Looking at how this is playing out, I mean, I think the script is uh, going to be followed to the T because they got an opening pick and now falling back, reinforcing our jungle. They still got those mirror windows, towards, like facing from the bomb side into that breach. And Beast goes, you know, plan A is, guys, let's get both walls opened up. Now they have one wall opened up and then a mirror window shattered and all popped on the other breach, but they can't get into the building with that. So what can they do? Spirits maybe go downstairs, use those Deimos trackers and go for a vertical kill with the pistol. That's a possibility. Capital Fire and Smoke could find value as well. We keep them going out, not trying to show where. But Optifish Staircase might just be the solution here, but he has to win the gunfight. You almost did it on the one tap at the top of Fish Stairs. The deployable shield in the way and he gets smoked from a pixel angle that Noodle's holding. Noodle's lined up for a second, but and hit the shots onto Gunner the way he wants. Instead, try to test it with his reflexes. Unable to do it. Cameraman dies to hot and cold. Admittedly, there wasn't much left of the bandit. It's been a really rough day for Cameraman, who had a slow first map and is having a very slow second map. Gunner and oh. hot and cold sprinting in. M80 collapsing like a house of cars, but there's one more player they haven't accounted for. Spoit and Kino are there, and it's Spoit to pop up and shut it down. The script doesn't lie. Yet another round that goes back and forth. Tied again. Really good setup there from the defense of MAT as well. They got crossfires across the entire bomb site and they had a backup fail save. Spoit from the corner, waiting for the prime opportunity to stand up and get a multi kill. Because if he does it too early, well, he's stuck in a bad corner all of a sudden. But by waiting just enough and a little bit, you know, baiting his teammates. He will set himself up to get the round victory for his team. Beast Coast, I will say though, really great attempt at problem solving that round. Playing what was a three versus five after Spirit died on Deimos on the fish staircase. It shouldn't have been that close, but it was because of really quick adaptive plays. And that's the most impressive thing I think about Beast Coast. They don't have that much time together, but they, are, they have synergy. They have problem solving skills that we don't see from other teams who have been together for multiple months or even full seasons. It's very impressive to do that so quickly in a season with players who haven't really, you know, played together that much before. So, I don't know. Also, this right here, run out the window, reinforce the hatch, and in, Spot will go afterwards. It is safe, it looks scary, but there is no chance for attackers to get there that quickly. Maybe with a Mauer, I'm actually not entirely sure, but without, there is no chance. People unfamiliar with this map, you cannot get punished from that position. It is as safe as safe can be, so there's no real downside other than 
giving away your position. They know that the hatch is now reinforced because they saw that, but I mean, I don't yeah. really think that's giving anything away. Citizen has somehow found himself downed? Not exactly sure why. Oh, he got shot retrievable Parker. at all. Also, this is a few shield, by the way. That's You're correct. That's interesting. <laughs> but I think it's I mean, a deliberate choice. Spirits yeah. likes to play shields. It's not abnormal to see him on Monty or Blitz. For a long time, Spirits was one of the most consistent shield players in the entire region. Yeah. Views shield is certainly abnormal. But yes. I trust Spirits when it comes to shield operators. I want to see what he's cooking up now inside a meeting. There goes that first cluster charge. Very infrequently are these used to get kills, Nick. They're mostly used for clearing out utility. Yeah, but there's no utility to be cleared out besides keep a barrier, so I'm curious the exact, you know, line of thinking is here. If I don't want to pick them, Citizen and Kino both low on HP, so they can prep as a cluster charge up from the fuse, pop it later on to stop the defenders from moving in towards those lines of sight. So this could be quite smart. You guys see what they can do though. East Coast, one man advantage, looking to strike the bomb side. Spirits with his shield and smoke grenades can very likely try and get down that diffuser. Citizen's been picked back up, so he's gonna sit on that low point of HP for quite a while. There comes the shield, and Kino doesn't want any of that. He's rushed out of the sight by hot and cold. Damn. Now it's with the shield on his back that Spirits will attempt the defuse plant. M80 attempting to get back in close to the bomb site. Gavin, the first casualty, but Citizen dies and trades. Diffuser down as well. <laughs> Suddenly it's back and forth. Spirits, a fuse shield kill, and Gunner clears the way after that diffuser had been planted. Here's the problem for M80. If you keep trading back and forth, it's Beast Coast who have the advantage. M80 must win two rounds in a row, or else it's Beast Coast who, just based on the way these sides go, will ultimately end up winning the matchup. Again, new roster, new team, innovation. Doing things differently, but having such a clear read understanding of what every single player needs to do and the player positions. I also want to give a massive props to the Observer for catching every single kill from both teams basically back and forth because it was a trade game one for one for one for one for one in very quick succession. And we understood exactly what was happening. And we saw the beat school spare positions on the window cutoffs, on the fuse pushing in, etc. And it's so hard to understand what's happening in such a chaotic round unless the observing is on point. So again, massive thank you. Great job. Because that could have been a what happened that round moment, but it wasn't. The fuse, so successful. Delivers the diffuser into the bomb side, smokes all flanks of sides, save the cluster charge for the execute to pop it to again stop the defenders from moving into the side for a retake. Again, spirits bringing that innovation, and as you said, Parker, known for his shield play, and while his shield play itself didn't really carry the round, the operator that he brought and the utility that he brought did. I trusted him. It's <laughs> nice to have your it's nice to have your faith in a player be rewarded. Sure. Things are far more normal this time, though. No fuse shield to be found, and not even just that the fuse was integral at opening up some of that site, take out utility, find a way in, smokes as well, and then the defuse going down, and of course, shield operators put their shields in their back when they get the defuse plant going, and it makes them relatively impervious to gunfire. Obviously, you can still shoot away at their feet. Or if you're in front of them, you can obviously shoot them from the front, but a smart team will not allow that to happen. Hard to argue against Beast Coast needing that fuse. I I mean, sure, Beast Coast could have probably won the round with a different operator lineup, but the fuse shield worked, which is something that I never really thought I was going to say. Now, right as the round ended, I said that M80 needs to win two in a row at some point to stave off defeat, because if they win this round, it's 5-5. Five, five. Then Beast Coast goes up 6-5, six, goes 6-6, six, six, goes to OT. There's only 15 rounds. It'll be an 8-7 victory for Beast Coast. Unless M80 can win two in a row. You're not going to win two in a row when surrendering an early first pick. You might not even win one. Noodle dies at the hands of Beast Coast, and M80 will trail. They get it back, though. Cameraman's third kill so far. Looking for more. He won't get it. There's some strips through Gunner, but that's all he'll get with just a little over a minute to go. M80 finds themselves down a man. Keep us safe. 
Gunner and Spirits with low on HP here. Those are the Roam King operators. No more Jackal skins left from Gunner Island. So if any roamers stick around, like Spot, for example, could be very hard to locate his exact position. And drone count, only five left to 60 seconds. Beast goes top decision up ahead of you. Do you go for Spot, hunt him down, or go straight for the bomb site? Because if you're too slow right now, that net will be closing in on you. They're gonna go for sight, they're gonna walk in, they gotta hit their shots though. And there's hot and cold, eliminating everybody. Ooh. It's only Citizen remaining. Citizen having one of the rougher games that he's had all stage, and it comes at the worst time. Beast Coast win the round. Finally, a team wins more than one before surrendering the next to their opponents. And it's Beast Coast three minutes away from being the best in the NA. Both teams fighting that early momentum on both sides of the coin. Early kill, ride the momentum, keep brute forcing throughout the entire building, and we see what maybe they're trying to do. They lose an early player, cameraman goes for a double swing. He finds one kill, then gets shut down, does a bit of damage. But then Beast goes, they do not slow down. They don't care that you're roaming. They don't care that they're getting flanked. They're just moving forward. And they're basically saying, okay, if Swan is going to be flanking us, if we go to the bomb site, he's going to be last man standing. It does not matter. The plant also being the objective every single round. I, I noted down on my on my pad that that was a successful plant attempt because like one second later, it goes down. There's no stopping it. And if we go with that, in the last four attacking rounds, three of those attacks won by Beast Coast. Three of those rounds that were won, the diffuser was planted. When they made it, they were attacking. They also planted three out of six rounds and had a fourth round where it could or should have gone down, but it didn't. This is a very plant heavy Night Haven lap, which is not always the case. But boy, oh boy, is it working out for both of these two teams on the attack. And it's also an attacker favored or equal side as well, which goes to show again the skill expression, the level of play, because attacking Night Haven lap is not easy. Going for those executes, not easy either. Every single player has to be locked in and fulfilling that job. And for Beast Coast, they are so consistent at doing that. Well, now it's even more critical that M80 wins two in a row because while it might not guarantee them victory, it certainly guarantees them a lack of defeat. M80 wins this round and then drops the next to Beast Coast. That's it, it's curtains. My oh my, what a run it's been from Beast Coast. Even if M80 wins this map, Beast Coast has still sent you to overtime at absolute worst. Winning M80's map, losing your own map in overtime for a brand new team with far less experienced players than what you see on the side of M80. That is in and of itself a huge accomplishment. None of these players in the server will tell you that's what they want. They want the glory. We've had our share of healthy skepticism. But so far this stage, East Coast has proven us wrong time and time again, and they're showing that they can absolutely live up to the billing, be the best in the region. Off in once. As down goes one, but they trade it right back. The nade follows up. Amos with a shotgun in hand, Spoid dies. Beast Coast setting a breathtaking pace. But they're losing out on these duels. Citizen and Cameraman giving the advantage to M80. For Beast Coast is all up to Gunner, and he's swatted away by Kino. That buckshot tears through him, and the round goes the way of M80. That was a quick one. You tell Beast Coast, we're doing everything in their power to overrun and topple M80. M80 had that rush strat, if you recall, on Clubhouse. It did not work out well for them. Now Beast Coast tries something similar, albeit on a different map. And the result is the same. The rushes, they just do not seem to work today. No, I mean, CC bombsite is a tough one to rush because, again, you're not really spreading that thin out across the entire map. So most defenders, if not all, will be in that you know, retradable or refrackable position near the site itself. 
Beast Goings were trying to catch Mini off guard by going for a quick play right after opening up the breach. And I think it was a smart choice because they spent half the round just getting the first wall opened up. They didn't necessarily have the time to do like a full setup across the entire map and get everybody in the right positions. And the rush essentially worked to begin. They got in the building, they got the one for one trade, they got catwalk control, but then we saw a matey sprint back towards the bottom side and they just really started hitting their shots and locking it down. Also, they keep a barrier on the door to electric to shut down any entries, really slow down one side that push enough for a matey to get in the right position. So well done for them, 6-5. Spoiling that same job, getting that hatch reinforced. There it is, and no attackers can stop him. That's just how it goes. The thing is with Beast Coast though, they've been looking like they have different approach these rounds. They can go for different entry points, different adaptations, but Cameraman, he was spawned by Gunner only a couple of rounds ago. Now he'll punish Gunner back by taking down the Finca. That's gonna stop down the attack, and that is gonna be a very likely possibility of a 6-6 overtime here if M80 can hold on to this man count lead. You know, I appreciate the way that we toss back and forth, but there is, in my mind, a small desire that you had stopped speaking about 10 seconds earlier, if only because I was actually going to segue into this round by talking about Cameraman. Oh. He, was, he was not doing well. He was two and eight, now he's six and 10. Four kills. Two deaths coming alive at the right time for his team. Eno has also been starting to put up more kills on the board. All the while, the advantage that Spoid had over the rest of this team is slowly decreased to the point where Spoid is a single death away from being an even 500. 10 kills, 10 deaths. So the rest of the team showing up, seemingly buoying the chances of M80. And you're right. I mean, taking Gunner out of the equation, no Finca. No nades, no staying power, and Gunner, who has been fearless against M80, that's one of the best targets you could possibly get to start off this round, and to do it so early on, that's a long time to be at a disadvantage. That disadvantage will grow, by the way, there's Spoit, a two-piece above. Look like he took some damage from the boogie drone. Long range, can't collect onto Gavin, Diffuser walking in. What did we say? No flawless round? Sploit ensured that it wasn't a flawless round last time, and now he's on the wrong side of it. Gavin, excited about that one. M80 will not win this one flawlessly, but they are still poised to win the whole round. Send us to overtime. Unless, of course, Gavin can pull off quite the play. 1v4 with 40 seconds left, and it doesn't look like that's the intended purpose for Gavin, because you know what Beast Coast hasn't done? They haven't called their timeout, Nick. So Gavin can just waste time for the next 40 seconds and effectively get a second timeout for when Beast Coast does inevitably call it. <laughs> All right. I mean, it, it, he wasn't. It shouldn't it was surprise. Over. He wasn't really trying there. We are either nine minutes away or less from Beast Coast winning the whole thing or we are an hour and 30 minutes away from a conclusion to this series. Right now, it's all up to Beast Coast. If M80 wins, we go to Chalet. If Beast Coast wins, they're in first place. They win the North America League. They take first seed for NA. More gold, more glory. By attackers. At Spawn Peak really did set off some slow falling dominoes. At dominoes that were unable to be stopped. East Coast will go on a defense for both of these overtime, but for both of their overtime rounds, M80 will defend once. They'll come up next. M80 starting on attack. So when you're into overtime, it sounds weird to say, but the game changed entirely because now, you know, there's more at stake. You've been playing a lot of rounds. You've been showing off a lot of your strategies and you've been playing the same bomb sides many times over. So this is where we see either teams play slower because they're scared of losing, or faster to you know, surprise their opponents, or change up their operator lineup. Hot and cold in overtime will bring out the clash. And following the trend that attackers are a bit slower because there's more to lose now with the you know, stakes being higher, playing in clash to slow the, game, slow the game down further and the Goyo as well could be a pivotal moment later on in this round. 
And even if not for speed, Flash is just a very hard operator to deal with in the current meta of the game. You don't play a lot of counter operators on an average lineup. Nomad, Capital, Sophia, Kali, for example. Yeah, Capital sees some play, but it's mostly for maps like Clubhouse to clear out garage rafters, or Cafe, for example, to clear out the window positions. Citizen either saw the clash or just wants flank watch and is playing the Nomad. That could be a good way forward for them if they can find Hunter Gold in the clash later on. But I like this. Adaptations on both sides. Playing a new kind of game now after all those previous ones. First minute burnt. Both walls on the primary breach and the jungle wall being opened up. It may be pretty quick right now in this round to get that job done. That citizen cam has been frozen for a while, by the way, and I quite enjoy it. It reminds me of the Yogg reaction when Lynx and I were casting from Copenhagen once. Where it was just Yaga's stone face the whole time. <laughs> IT opened up relatively early. We are yeah. 90 seconds into this round. We're at the halfway point. It doesn't feel like that. It's strange because the first and second overtime rounds always seem to fly by, and then the last one seems to take an eternity. Gunner plugging Work holes now as he's watched by Hot and Cold to ensure he stays safe. Yeah, the big thing here is just hot and cold rotating on the map, trying to figure out where's the push actually coming from to, you know, deny one injury path for the attackers to just make Beast Coast aware of, okay, this angle is safe, watch the other ones. But maybe they're striking from so many positions, it might be hard to figure out for hot and cold exactly where to go. Sure, it's quite frustrating for Sploit to see the shield operator, but not be able to do anything about it. Those bullets will just bounce off of the extended shield that the Clash has set up. Dude will try to take out those walls as well as the deployable shield. They don't know if he got the deployable shield. It seems like he did. There could be the first domino. Gunner goes down at the hands of Citizen, traded out by Diffuser. Stickiness of Beast Coast. Gavin's Nitro Cell connects. Down goes Kino. Ooh. Spoit fed as well to the wood chipper. Now it's Hot and Cold to be aggressed on by Noodle, who wins the engagement. Where is the coverage for Hot and Cold, though? Noodle has the sight all to himself. Cameraman will need to cover. Flash off of the wall to get swung upon. Gavin drops Noodle. Diffuser down, and Spirits' shotgun will send the round away, even though the timer had already determined that Beast Coast would win. They go on top again. M80 won two rounds in a row to provoke overtime, but right back to Beast Coast Go. So M80 now, in order to win this map, will need to win back-to-back -back rounds for just the second time in this series. That is a daunting prospect. But both of these teams are here for a reason, Nick. And M80 winning back-to-back -back rounds is always a possibility. But it's such a genius round from Beast Coast because they change up the entire like win condition for both teams. They play so much utility. The deployable shield combined with the clash having power positions in these new areas that they maybe haven't seen before. So again, you're forcing him to adapt and problem solve on the fly, which they have been known to struggle with sometimes. And it works out. Yeah, the call for Hot and Cold in the Clash, it wasn't quite there. They almost surrendered and sacrificed him on the bomb side itself, but it's worth it. They find kills elsewhere, and when that bomb starts going down, they aggress forward. They know the cover can't quite be there from Cameraman inside of Catwalk Rafters because he's throwing flashbangs. So they deny the plant, Cameraman's last alive, he can't get it done. Maybe. Looking at their operator lineup, we have seen this like three, four times before. We've seen the Aqua Shield, we've seen the Mirror Windows, we've seen the Bandit Tricking. There are no surprises right now from like a, a macro perspective, like the overall bigger picture. Sure, the micro decisions, player positions, gunfights can of course happen differently, but Beast Coast, they've seen this before. They know what to do about it, and they have made a small adjustment. Spirits on the Nook. Likely looking for a late round flank somewhere. Now, mind you, Nook did get a nerf, you know, a fair bit of the time ago, now I think nine months or so. When you enter Nook's gadget, that cloaking device, you are still invisible to cameras and such, but you no longer make less sound in terms of movement. So sneaking up a staircase in terms of sound is gonna be loud as normal, but if there is a cam watching a flank somewhere, you will still be invisible. 
It's a really hard thing to play around as a Nook player, but it might be what they're trying to go for. Two minutes to go. This first step of the round is to, of course, deny the soft breach and the hot breach. But cameraman, you said it, Parker. He's showing up when his team needs him to the most. Took down Garner previously. This round is Diffuser and Ash instead. It is one hell of a time, by the way, to bring out an operator who's only been picked something like a dozen times across all regions at this point. Yeah. Spirits is still very much alive as we ride along. Top warehouse right now, he's on rafters. He might actually get a pick here. He does indeed on the citizen. Fuser died early on, but that's surely a surprise for M80. And citizen is always a threat, no matter what the scoreline says. M80's got multiple threats, though, so he's not the only one you need to worry about. The rest of Beast Coast aligned quickly. Cameraman showing that experience. There's a reason why he was brought on to this team. Now it's Kino next up with a shotgun at close range. He can play this door frame. They know that there's a shotgun on the other side of it, so Beast Coast need to tread very carefully. All we saw from the Nook was that one kill before Spirits got eliminated. Now it's Houghton next up. He sees the head of the bandit. Cameraman is waiting. Cameraman's been the real prize here. Cameraman dies, and now it's Houghton's cold. It's time to breach in. He gets dropped. There's two downs. Gavin might not be able to get them back up. He needs to retrieve his teammates. It's Noodle in the last alive for M80 with 30 seconds left. If Gavin can bring both Gunner and Hot and Cold back to life, this becomes so much more winnable. Hot and Cold will not be retrieved. Noodle left. has two Attack kills to be found. Or that's all she wrote for M80. Ten to go. Beast Coast have gone through so many iterations. They look mighty good. M82! Oh! Beast Coast win the final round! They are the best in the West! Your North America League champions! The team that almost nobody expected! But that's what makes the surprise so sweet! East Coast first in NA! It's such a good story, it's such a big surprise, and it's not just because they have good shots, or they have crazy strats, or because they have good synergy, it's all of it. They fill out pretty much every single box from a high level of play from a team, and they do it being a new roster with very little time together, and they did it starting what 0-3 in the league looking completely lost. And then something happened, something clicked, and here they are. What a massive blow up from them. It really is unbelievable for this roster. Like, think about it, right? Houghton is dropped from Space Station. Yeah. He now goes on to a team where expectations are very low. Gunner is dropped from his team. Gavin dropped from his team. Sonics, EZ, SSG making these changes, and none of those teams were better for their changes. In fact, Sonics didn't even end up making the playoffs ultimately, and SSG got yeah. bounced on the very first day. DZ fought tooth and nail to get where they are. But all the while, these three players that were on the island of Misfit Toys suddenly have found a new home. And it's a very loving home. And honestly, a feel-good end to this stage for three players who had just been dropped. But don't overlook the fact that Spirits has been a journeyman himself, being bounced around team from team. Spirits was on this roster one time, by the way. He was on this old M80 squad long ago, if you track the lineage long enough. And then, of course, Fuser comes in and who'd have thought that he would be the best rookie of this stage? I think it's undeniable that Ashen was the best rookie of last year, and he had big shoes to fill in Diffuser. Diffuser has certainly lived up to the billing. East Coast are the best team in North America. They dispatch M80 2-0, and it's a result that I don't think anybody, even a couple weeks ago, would have ever predicted. You're right. I mean, we got, yeah, Beast Coast, phenomenal team, but let's not also undersell media, right? There was a very close series. It could have gone either way. It came down to that poor performance from Clubhouse to start things off. And maybe, good night, Haven. That Clubhouse, though, gotta, fall, that, gotta solve that. I mean, when you get blown out on your own map, it's a very, yeah. very hard climb after that. And honestly, kudos to M80. They have been an exceptionally talented team. They have all the tools that they need to do well domestically and internationally. And that, to me, is the only question mark for Beast Coast. We've seen that they can beat up the teams in North America. But how does that translate to the international stage? Because they're going to be playing teams from Korea and Brazil and Europe that they've never battled before. Will they persevere? 
Or will the lack of experience compared to some of their peers, especially their NA peers, be the difference maker and have Beast Coast go home early? That's not a question that needs to be answered today, because I'm sure there will be some celebratory soda pops on the side of the players of Beast Coast as they win 2-0. That's it for our matches. We still got one more desk. I'm sure you want to hear what they have to say? I certainly do. We'll be back in a couple minutes with the conclusion of the show. They entered Siege in 2018 with a dream to be the best. They picked up one of the most promising rosters in North America at the time, but left just a little while later as they got signed by a different org. They rejoined the scene in 2020, determined to find a way back to the top, but go through roster after roster after roster, and finally end up here with the best team in North America. For the first time in history, Beast Coast are NAL Stage champions and that is one of the best graphics we've had this entire stage. 
if I'm Grant right now, I am crying. I am on my <laughs> yeah. knees crying. He finally has a roster that is going to a major event, took first place in the regular season. Grant, I'm happy for you, none to, to say the least. An exceptional day for Beast Coast coming through now, becoming the North American League champions, a org first, of course, yes. for the team. They've never even made a major before, before as an organization. They come through a brand new roster, five new players who have never played with each other before, and they become the champions of North America. That's incredible. They become the first North American team to acquire triple-digit SI points heading into Six Invitational 2025. And Jesse Chick was right. This is the best roster Beast Coast has ever fielded. I mean, with these players, how could it not be? I think everybody could have seen, you know, I'm not special for tweeting this. Anybody could have seen at the start of the stage that this roster of these players was going to be good. Everybody knew, compared to previous Beast Coast rosters, these guys had some insane potential with how many lands they've been to in the past, with how many major accomplishments they have all achieved individually. But even myself, I don't think anybody could have thought at the beginning of the stage that they would be here today as the number one team in North America in such a short period of time. Even though I believed in this roster, I don't think anybody would have predicted that they would be here today. Absolutely not. And the team that even came close to that was the old wild card. And that was a mm -hmm. huge run, but then they fell flat getting into playoffs. But then you have this team that took it literally from the bottom and went straight to the top, straight to a major, straight to beans on toast, and then <laughs> closing it out here to solidify yourself as the best team in North America. To do it over an M80 squad that showed so much promise and was touted as being the most most consistent team in the league is a feat by itself but just thinking about the whole journey over the past several weeks having a team they have to form from the ground up after not having any experience playing with one another at all guys who are probably still maybe reeling a bit from being removed from the teams that they were on previously having to immediately refocus come into a brand new structure suck for the first three games <laughs> and then find a way to turn things around and now it means they're going to a major for the first time in org history diffusers getting his first hot and cold on the, on the flip side is getting his 13th. So this is, <laughs> it's crazy. This is just a crazy side. story. It's crazy. Said flip side. That's when he joined was back in flip side. That was yep. back in Bro. 1970. <laughs> All right, you calm down, 1970, dude. back in my day. And Hot and Cold top frag the uh, the server as well. 13 and 9. Nah, the team, not the server. Spoit's got to spoil my stat. Uh -huh. 13 and 9, still incredibly impressive. Everybody said he was a Montane one trick. Turns out if you ban his Monty, he brings guns to the server, and he starts winning some games. I mean, uh, hitting some shots. I was going to say, this this map in general, I was a little worried because we said M80 was cutting corners, and then I saw, you know, Carter even said it best in the group chat. He said, once we saw that 1v1 of Gavinny in that last round, uh -huh. he sat up and started watching the game. That's what I was like. I was like, wait, what's about to happen here? And they end up clutching it. But I mean, this game couldn't have been any more of a slugfest. And that's what I was hoping Clubhouse was going to look like. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, looking at this grand final overall, from the very start to the very end, Beast Coast went through the, the highs and the lows. Yeah. They dominated Clubhouse. They really did. 7-3, starting with a five-round victory in a row. They went so, so hard on M80. And then the, the second map wasn't so easy. Their pick, you'd expect that map to be a little bit uh, easier for them. It was definitely more difficult. When they only got three defensive rounds, I was concerned. But they got three attacking rounds as well. Really, really impressive stuff. Map one, running a train on M80. Map two, closing out in a banger overtime game. I mean, one thing I want to say, there's a, there's many things that you can say about Beast Coast to give them tons of credit. But the one thing that really sticks out to me for this being a brand new roster, all different mindsets, is how fast they came together in terms of adapting. The quick thinking, the quick plays of adjusting and how you want to do that. That is so hard for a brand new team that just comes in to be able to have that chemistry, to be able to have that synergy, to be able to move around the map like that, and to coordinate that quickly and see think that well this fast is insane. There's one guy above everybody else I wanted to talk to in this interview, and that's Matthew Hot and Cold Stevens. Dude, congratulations. You are an NAL champion. It took a couple weeks to really get everything finally to this stage. You finally did the darn thing. Talk to me specifically about the week one mentality to now. How drastic of a difference is it and how relieved do you feel? Um, I mean, mentality-wise, I don't think it really ever changed. You know, we just... We got on the team ready to put in work and I feel like everyone put in the work. Um, obviously we started off slow. I mean, we've, we've said the reasons why, but uh, I think we were better than all the teams we lost to the first three games. Um, like we showed it in scrims at least to those teams and then we just couldn't translate it to game day and then we just finally put it together. 
Hot and I'm, I'm a little concerned right now because for every team at the Major, the game plan was supposed to be play against Beast Coast, ban the Monty, and you can win. But we just saw your opponent today, they banned the Monty every map. It still didn't result in them taking you guys down. Uh, what's the key to beating you guys? How can you still play well with the Monty and without? Um, I mean, I feel like the key to beating us is just like, if we're if we're having a bad day, you know, like if we're having a bad day, comp wise, uh, aiming wise, I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of how that's kind of how siege is nowadays. Like whoever's whoever's on that day is most likely gonna win, you know. And like I, I was abusing, I was crutching the Monty, trying to abuse it as long as I could, and then DZ was kind of shutting it down. So I mean, I was ready to not play it anyways today. <laughs> ah, fair enough. I mean, I don't really even have a question. I just want to congratulate you. I mean, every... 70? Every... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, hey, I was right there with you. You know, we're, we're, we're both yeah, older. You, I was about to say, you're older than me. <laughs> Jeez, dude. Okay, well, maybe, you know, right. Immediately right. coming back to bite no, your I mean, ass. I don't really have much questions for you. Every question that I possibly had throughout this entire stage, you guys proved why you guys have made this huge comeback. And now you guys are first place. I mean, what is that? how does that feel for you? Yeah, I mean, how does that feel for you? <laughs> I mean, it feels awesome. Like, I, I mean, to be honest, I didn't expect it. You know, my my hope was just to make the major. You know, that yeah. was the main goal. Um, but it feels awesome just because, like, I mean, I was kind of questioning my own my own like self self worth as a player, uh, so to say. You know, I was I was very close to retiring this stage. You know, Beast Coast was the only team that wanted me. Only offer I like realistic offer I got. So if they didn't take me, I was. I was going to be SSG's analyst and then eventually try to coach. Um, but I mean, it's awesome just because, I mean, this team, this team just gives me the full power to do what I want. Um, you know, I'm not stuck on a role where I can't talk. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like, I, like the playing, I like playing that role, but I mean, I feel like talking, you know, and communicating with the team is my strong suit. And I feel like it's, you know, showing. No, absolutely. I mean, it's it's definitely showing. I mean, when you guys first found your first win against Sonics, Gunner specifically said you guys were having that identity crisis. Then they all looked to you as the father figure. And then sure enough, I mean, we were seeing 7-1s, 7-0s, 7-2s, and now first place, Manchester. So I think yeah, you said it best. You were able to lead this team to the success. Obviously, that falls on them also falling suit and doing that. But I mean, I think you owe yourself a big pat on the back for that. Appreciate it. Appreciate the kind words. Last question for you. Uh, I did a real quick recount just to make sure I had this right. You're going to your 14th S tier LAN event since the 2016, 2017 days. Damn. It's quite a lot. It's not. It's not as many as, as guys like Canadian and Cameraman, but for you as one of the only people from year one, season one, that's still left playing the game on an active roster at this point, that's a crazy stat. But I'm mostly curious how much you're in this for you at this particular moment because you have a team around you that's been to wait. You've been to more lands than your entire team combined at this rate. And you mentioned maybe analyst work is the future maybe coaching if playing didn't work out and now you're gonna lead a rookie to his first ever major how much right now are you playing for you versus how much you feel like you're playing for the guys you're playing with i mean i feel like everyone's always playing for themselves but at the end of the at the end of the day you know we come together as a team but you know i'm trying to get i'm trying to get a fucking win before i retire at <laughs> yeah least. You know, I'm, I'm not i'm not trying to retire on nothing but i mean if i have to i have to that's not the plan I think I still got it what it takes. Um, it's it's just all about like hitting the strides when uh, at the right time. You know, I feel like every major team besides W7M, to be honest, sure. like they just you know they just hit their peak at the right time. So hopefully we hit that peak. Matt, go grab your major championship, dude. Congratulations on being first place, and we'll see you at the major. All right, dude. Take care. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Beast Coast have climbed the mountain. They've gone from zero to hero. We can put as many idioms on this as you want, but that accomplishment is one of the more impressive things that you can get to. My question is just, was it easy because there's a couple teams that aren't doing that hot this stage, or was this really them popping off at the right time? Listen, North America can be a bit of a farmer region. We we won't deny that, but it doesn't <laughs> matter, right? Like, you've come out and you've beaten the best of the best. Maybe the bottom of North America has struggled, but the top is no easy feat. I mean, we put two teams at the top of uh, top six of the Six Invitational. This is a good region when you get to the height of the heights, and Beast Coast have beaten the heights of the heights. They couldn't go any higher. They've beaten every team inside of North America to claim that number one spot. There's no asterisks on this in my mind. There's no qualifications. This is Beast Coast, the best team in North America, and a seriously real shot of making it far in that Manchester Major, maybe even winning it. One final look at that bracket, by the way, because 
this is something that I think those Beast Coast players are probably going to be hanging on their wall. Look at how far they made it after being kicked from previous teams. That's crazy. I mean, again, with all four of these players, all questionable decisions, in my opinion. And then you find yep. them all on a team. And then again, I mean, we, we keep, we're going to keep talking about this. Yep. Terrible start. Horrible start. And then a huge resurgence and now leading North America into Manchester. Yeah, and for North America at Manchester, we've got our three represent uh, representatives so far. Beast Coast, M80, Dark Zero, 1, 2, and 3, all Phase 2. We're not done yet. I think NA deserves one more team in an international event. Then, of course, we will get that one more team. But, uh, I mean, I don't think that we could be sending better representative, uh, representatives. Based on the stuff that we saw this stage, based on how these teams played, these are the best three teams in North America, and there's no doubt in my mind about that. Let's take a look at what we've got coming up next week. It's our last chance qualifier bracket. Every team that got knocked out in playoffs and almost everybody that didn't quite make playoffs is in this bracket. Oxygen, Wildcard, and Sonics are all here, as well as SSG's main team. But there's an Academy roster in there. There's a team called Los Man goes when the hell did makers come to north america this is going to be interesting for next week yeah i'm I calling it now los mangoes <laughs> they're LCC going to fine. manchester i was i was community casting the the open qualifier playoffs earlier this week and uh, los mangoes defeated los to get that spot let's be clear they they beat the nal team los that you are you're remembering los mangoes completely different roster all yep. north americans no brazilians on that team so congratulations to them makers and all the other open qual teams that have come through that will be fighting against the uh, the North American League squads that were in the closed league and now fighting out for that final spot in Manchester. The fifth place game taking place between Luminosity and Space Station will be happening tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern. So there actually might be a chance that we get a couple people on this couch to go co-stream that sucker because of when that happens tomorrow. Gentlemen, it's been a wonderful stage. Final thoughts before we finally ride off into the sunset. This was a banger of a stage and this was a banger of a setup. Instead of yeah. being at the desk, we're on a couch. That's like best case scenario. I'm comfortable. I'm cozy. I don't got to wear a suit and tie. <laughs> you can if you want to. It. I mean, I can if I want to, but I'm a little just realistically. Saying, blazers on this set kind of kind of pop off, though. Look at that. Blazer does look good on you, but I do like the casualness to this. I mean, it, I mean, it's. I like both. I'm not gonna lie. I like both. Sure. They're both they're both unique in their own way, but it is nice to experience something like this for the first time. And again, the stage as a whole, the teams, everyone, all the storylines, it's it's been a great stage. It has. It has been a great first stage for this new year as well. 2024, stage one of the North American League here in Philadelphia, having a fantastic time. Uh, obviously took me a little bit uh, to, to get here to get into it, but I only did though I, I'm glad to be here. No, and it, it was a really great great stage of North American League The stories that we had with Beast Coast but also with M80 with yep. the, the teams that didn't maybe live up to the expectations in terms of Sonics and Lose. Space Station Los I mean we had so many different storylines come through from North American League I seriously think it was one of our best stages ever uh, and it was great work with you guys Jacob Fox or Jacob Lax <laughs> I had Fox on the brain. I was gonna say and also Damn. Fox. Oh no Right no. at the very end, you got him to leave. Whoa. In my head, I was thinking, <laughs> I can't forget about Fox because he's not here. No, and Laxic, also good at, got also good at his job. Uh, and even, you know, like Jonah, who was here for one day as well, subbing in, was, was six. So it's nice seeing everybody here working on the desk, and I think everybody did a great job. Well, thank you, you both very much for joining me. As always, it's always a pleasure working with you both. And as for us, we're almost done, but there's one last thing we need to get to. We need to thank the Philadelphia crew that got us all the way through this, this whole perpetual cycle. So if you indulge me for a second, our creative director and producer, Ferme, our director, Ian, our engineer and replay man extraordinaire, Bach, content guru, Nico, our audio overlords, Liam and Holden, Stan on graphics, Josie and Jorge on comp ops, Aaron and Ben on the back end, for Parker, Pengu, Carter, Sam, Jonah, Jay's Will Zwillinger, Jesse Chick, Gabriel Laxing, Neroles, and Davity Fox A. Bucci and, and myself. Thank you very much for joining us on the North American League. We'll see you next time.